Hey everyone, on this lesson we are going to introduce Google Collab. Collab is a Google platform that allows us to write and execute Python code through the browser. We are going to use Google Collab when programming in Python for two main reasons. The first of them is that it is a free platform, anyone can use it, and also that Google Collab allows us to visualize our results in a very easy and intuitive way. To create a new Google Collab notebook, it is very easy. We can just go to our Google Drive. In my case, I'm inside a folder called Course. So we can just go right click, we go to More and Google Collaboratory. This will create a new Collab notebook so we could just go right click google collaboratory as we can see this creates a new google collab notebook here we have the name of the notebook we can title this any name we can just say test right now the file extension as we can see is i p y n b this file extension stands for the jupyter notebook file jupyter notebook is an interactive web application used for creating and sharing computational documents for analysis using python now on a notebook we can add code and we can also add text for instance we can add a test here and let's just type this is a text this is a text we can also add a text to be a heading type with hashtag this basically means that this is going to be the title as we can see, and here we have a code window that we can just add Python code. Uh, remember that notebooks are implemented in Python. So we can just, for instance, print hello world, for instance. To run this code window, we can just press Ctrl Enter or just press this play key. So as we can see, after pressing the play button, we have run this command and we can see on the output hello world we can also print for instance a sum of two natural numbers like so and here we see that the result is eight so now we're ready to start programming in python in this notebook google collab is really very very practical and that's why we are going to use it along this course hey everyone on this lesson, we will introduce the principal component analysis, which is a very popular technique for analyzing large data sets containing a high number of dimensions or features per observation. So first of all, we need to have some background. And that is that when we have very large data sets, this big dimensionality can cause problems. First of all, this causes a computational cost for processing this data. And also, the quality of the data is reduced, since we will have a higher probability of wrong data, also noise or irrelevant features. There are two elements that define the dimensionality of the data or of the data set. One, the number of examples, right, the number of rows that we have on the data set into the number of attributes that is how many columns how many features we have in this data set now the problem of having too many examples too many rows can be easily and trivially solved using sampling now, remember that sampling is a very fundamental statistic technique that consists in the selection of a subset of all the examples, all the instances from within this data set. So we process only this subset and we estimate the characteristics of the whole data set. So it is very simple. We just select a subset of all the examples. Now, if we have a problem of too many columns, too many features, too many attributes, this can lead to a bad impact on the performance first of all a very pure scalability remember that in machine learning 
Scalability refers to scaling machine learning applications that can handle any amount of data and perform many computations in a cost-effective and time-saving way to instantly serve millions of users residing at global locations. Also, with many attributes, we will have an inability to deal with the irrelevant and noisy or redundant attributes. Having too many attributes can also lead to an overfitting, that is, we have more features than actual data. So, there are two methodologies to reduce this number of attributes. The first one is this the dimensionality reduction, the one that we will introduce on this lesson with the principal component analysis. With this methodology, we do a transformation to go to a space with less dimensions that we had originally, preserving the original information. So we have less dimensions and it is easier to compute and we also gain scalability. The other methodology is to basically remove or delete from the data set study some attributes. So here we just uh, do a feature subset selection, right? We select a subset of all the attributes of all the features we have and we only study them. So this methodology is, is very trivial. We just remove them from the data set. Now we will introduce this one that has many, many techniques and many different and interesting approaches in machine learning. The principal component analysis is a technique that we use for analyzing these very big data sets containing a very high number of attributes and dimensions. And with this technique, we can reduce the dimensionality of the data set and also visualize this new transformed data set on this new number of dimensions. So with this, we introduced the principal component analysis and why it is necessary when working in machine learning. On the following lessons, we will study how we can apply this technique how this technique works and also see some examples using this technique with large data sets in python hey everyone on this lesson we will work with the dimensionality reduction using the principal component analysis technique in python so on this lesson we are given a data set and we will apply here a dimensionality reduction this is the transformation of the data from a high dimensional space into a low dimensional space, returning the information of the data set. So we reduce the dimensions and we also retain and maintain this information. So the technique that we will use on this lesson is the principal component analysis. Also, the name of this data frame and data set is graphs. As it is a CSV file, you can download this file, grabs.csv, on the downloadable documents of this lesson. So, first of all, let's introduce this data set. Campbell studied rock crabs in the genus Leptograpsus in 1974. You can look and search for this article. There's an article that has been published by Campbell, he was a researcher that studied rock grubs. One species, the Leptograpsus variegatus, had split into two new species, previously grouped by color, orange and blue. Preserved specimens lose their color, so it was hoped and expected that the morphological differences will allow the museum material to be classified. So here is where the data set comes, uh, the data, and all the data are available on 50 specimens of its sex, of its species. So we will have 200 in total collected in Fremantle, Western Australia. And now this is very important because it is where we have the features, where we have the attributes of this data set. So here it mentions each specimen has 
measurements on first the frontal lobe width abbreviated with FL then we have the rear width abbreviated with RW the length along the midline of the carapace that is abbreviated with CO the maximum width of the carapace with CW and the depth body length with BD in millimeters also we have the color of the scrub this is also in other words the species of the grub and finally the sex of this grub very well so now let's create a new notebook in google collab to start working very well we have created this new google collab notebook we already explained on previous lessons how to create a new google collab file to start working in python so the name of this notebook is PCA in the Krebs dataset since we will apply the principal component analysis technique. So the first thing we will create here a text window where we will have here all the imports. So here let's just mention this is going to be the import of libraries that we will need to import in this notebook. And here we can just add the code window, okay, just after. And here we will start importing all the libraries. So also let's make this text a bit smaller with this header here. Uh, remember when you write a hashtag, you have title one. If you write two hashtags, we have the title two notation, three hashtags, the title three. So we want to import this CSV file. We want to import this data set. And so we will import it as a pandas data set. So the first thing that we need to do is to import the pandas library. In Python, we do it in this way, import pandas as pd, okay? Pandas is a software library written for the Python programming language for data manipulation and analysis. We will use this library a lot along this course. Now, since we want to read a CSV file, we need to be able to read files from our computer. To do so, we need to import here, first of all, the input and output library in Python. This is the I.O. library. And also, since we're working in Google Colab, we need to make an import of from the Google Colab. We will import all the files that we will update. So here we import all the files. So as we can see, here we have a files folder that if we click on it, we can see all the files that we have uh, loaded inside this notebook. Uh, we really have nothing inside. We only have the default sample data that uh, this environment for Google Collab provides, right? So we will use our own CSV. So we will create now a new code window. And inside this window, we will upload some files. So here we will say, all right, uploaded is going to be files. And we will use the method upload like so. So with this, when we run this cell, we will upload the files that we want from our computer. So in our environment, you should first download this dataset grabs.csv. You download it once you have on your computer, then you load it on the notebook, right? So here in order, let's first import all these libraries. And this cell is already executed. So now we press here the play button so we run this cell now as we can see we have an option that is choose file so we click on it then you look for this file in your computer so we just come here and we press the grabs data set this is the data set that we will use on this lesson and we just double click on it or just open and as we can see this data set grabs.csv is already saved inside or folder files in the google collab notebook so if we open this folder we can see here now we have loaded this data set grab start csv very well we will now read this csv as a pandas data frame so we just add the new code window and here we will define the name of this data set for instance grabs data you can define here any name you can just write uh, grabs okay we will use here the name and the notation grabs data so to read the csv using pandas library we just need to use here pd which is 
to access the pandas library and all the methods of uh, this library provides. Then we write the point, a period, and here we write the method read CSV. And now we pass as the argument just the name of this file. In our case, it is scraps.csv. So very important. Here you pass the name that you have inside this folder. This folder, the name of this CSV is scraps.csv. So here we pass the same name. So now we run this. And now we have inside this variable in Python, this scraps data, we have the data set. And we can verify this, uh, for instance, if we have a pandas data set or a pandas data frame, and we want to see the first rows of this data set, okay, we can just press uh, the method uh, head, okay, with this, we will visualize the first rows of this data set. So as we can see, we are able to see and observe the first five rows, the first five graphs and five instances of this data set, and we have here all the columns. We have a column for the species, the column for sex, the column for the index. Okay, this is also the identifier. Then we have these measurements. Remember that with the FL, this is the abbreviation for the frontal lobe width. This attribute and this feature RW represents the rear width. Then we have here the CL. This is the length along the midline of the carapace of the grab. We also have the attribute CW. This is the maximum width of the carapace. And this final feature BD represents the depth body length in millimeters. So very well, once we have this data set, and before applying any dimensionality reduction technique, we will transform a little this data set and the representation of the columns. So that it is easier to see and which columns we have and how we represent these columns. So, first of all, we will rename all of these columns. Instead of SP, we will have a species, for instance. Instead of FL, we will have the frontal lobe and so on. So, to do this, with the pandas data set, we just write the name of this data set. In this case, the name of this variable that represents the data set is grabs data. And now we will update this data set to be the original one with the rename of the columns. So what we are going to rename inside this data set are the columns. And here we will substitute, let's use here the equal notation. And we will start with the first column, which has the value of SP. And we'll rename this column SP to be species, like so. Then sex is a column that we will not change because the name is already abbreviated, the same for the index, but here the FL, we will change this FL, so the FL column is going to be replaced for the frontal lobe. So here we will have frontal lobe. The same applies for the RW, right? This is the rear width, so we just write rear width. Then we continue. With the CL, remember that this attribute here, this feature CL, represents the carapace midline. So here we will rename the CL column for carapace midline. Then the CW column to be the maximum width of the carapace. Remember that CW, this feature, is the maximum width of the carapace. So here we have that CW is going to be the maximum width for the carapace. And finally, we only have this BD. So here we will rename this feature BD to be the body depth, right? This BD is the depth body length in millimeters. So here we will have the body depth in millimeters. So here we just write body depth like so very well and once we apply this data rename okay and once we run this instruction then the data set is going to be updated and the columns name will be changed so let's verify this so let's run this cell so once we have run this cell let's now run this instruction to get the first five rows of this data set so let's see how the data set is now we press this run button 
and as we can see the data set has been updated right the names for the columns have been updated we only change the names okay all the values are the same so here we also see two uh, particular things we see here a categorical variable which is the species and also this categorical variable which is the sex and b represents and stands for blue and then you can also see at the end that we have another type of graph which is the orange graph so in fact here if we write as an argument 10 we'll have the first 10 uh, values right it seems that all of them uh, are blue so instead of head we will use tail to check the last ones of this data set so if we run this we see the last uh, five elements of this data set right and these last five elements, we see that here in the species, we have a value of O. So here, O stands for orange and B stands for blue. The same happens with the sex. It is a categorical binary possible value. F is for female and uh, M is for male, right? If we just look the first five elements, we see here that they are male. So we have your F or M in sex. And also we have the options B or the letter O in species. So what we will do to continue transforming this data set for better visualization and then applying the dimensionality reduction with the PCA technique is we will map each value B for being blue and each value O to be orange. And in the same way, in the sex attribute, we will map each value M to be male and each value F to be female. So to do this in pandas, we do it in the following way. So first of all here, okay, we will access this column species. So we can do this with grab data species. We will modify this column and we will say, all right, we will apply a mapping such that for each value B to transform this value and map this value to be blue. And for each value F, or in this case, O, map this value to be orange. So here we will access again this column species species and we will map this value depending if we have a b so if we have a b in here we'll map this to be blue right if we have an o we will map this o to be an orange like so keep in mind that this is different from what we have done before right also here we need to include this list so let's include this list in here in this case a dictionary this is not a list but regard a dictionary so this is different from what we've done before because before what we changed were the names for the attributes the name for the columns here what we are changing are the values okay inside a given column so if we need to change the values inside this data set we need to apply a mapping process okay so what pandas will do and what python will do is for each value b that he finds inside the column of species it will substitute this b to be blue and for each value o it will substitute this o to be orange and we will do the same in the sex feature so here we will access the sex we'll modify this column this is going to be grabs data sex and now we are going to map all the values that we find m to be male and all the values that we find f to be female right like so so we're applying also the same mapping process right so let's run this and see how this data set is updated we come here we press the uh, run cell and before pressing this cell remember that here we have a dictionary so we need to add here the braces like so so now we run this cell and now let's see how this is updated so here in this code window we will apply the same thing wraps data head we will execute now this window and now as we can see for each value that before was b we have blue and for each value that before was m we have male in the same way if we look at the last elements of this data set we have here that for each value o we have orange for each value f we have female in fact we can see more details and study more this data set we can check for the description of this data set using all the columns so to do this we just write the name of this data set then we use the method describe and here we will include all the features so here we will include all and all the data set right include all so let's press run and as we can see we have this description of the whole data set 
in the sense of so as we can see we can see many informations we can see the count of how many values we have right keep in mind that since the data set and on this environment they say we have a total of uh, 200 species we have 200 uh, crops different crops 200 instances so we will have 200 rows in this data set right this is an account this is the account for the unique values the mean we have many uh, here descriptions right for each attribute so as we can see the precision uh, sometimes is very very uh, big so we don't want this very very high precision so we can reduce this in the pandas configuration so here just above the pandas we can change the precision of the display so we can just write pv we use here the set option method set option and here we will set the precision so display precision to be for instance three so here we will just change this to be three so we run now this cell we update the code and now when we do the same thing here we see that we have this precision only with three decimal values okay this is because we don't want this very high precision very well we can also check the columns here if we write a new code window for instance crabs data columns here we can visualize all the columns on this data set right we have species sex index frontal lobe rear width and so on also a very important method that is very important to, to visualize is the shape because here we can see how many rows in total and how many columns we have in this data set so here we we just write grabs data shape we see that we have a total of 200 rows and eight columns right for instance in here grabs data head okay we can see the first five rows but we have actually in total 200 rows okay and uh, eight columns so the column for species sex index frontal lobe rear width carapace midline maximum width and body depth a total of eight rows so keep in mind that this first row is the identifier row so this is not really a attribute neither a feature in the pandas data frame this is only for specifying uh, which uh, grab instance we're dealing with at this moment okay the, the attributes are eight and they are these ones so the objective in this data set is to separate the 200 crabs that we have into four classes given by the configurations for sex and species so we will have four classes right one for male blue another for male orange and then another for female blue and another finally for female orange so here first let's add the new text window to indicate that this is the goal right and to separate these classes okay here in the pandas data frame we will create a new column for the class so here crops data let's create a new column this is going to be the name class okay, and you can write here any name we will use the name class and this is going to be the concatenation for the crabs data species plus the crabs data sex so we will have a class column that will be the concatenation of the species and sex right we can also here visualize how many different classes we will have at the end well, in this case we will have four so how many of each we will have so here we just write crabs data class and we can access how many values and different values of this column we have with the value counts okay so here if we just run this we see that we have uh, the same amount of each class we have 50 crabs that are blue male 50 crabs that are blue female 51 that are orange male and 50 ones that are orange female in fact right here if we just again check for the first rows of this uh, data set now we'll see an extra column okay we have now the column class that is basically the concatenation of the species and the sex since this crab with identifier zero is blue and male we have that he belongs to the class bone male in the same here for the next one if we check the last ones we see that since this crab is orange and female right we see that it belongs to the class orange female very well once we have these classes separated we have this exercise visualize all the classes that we have on this data set 
and also improve the visualization applying the dimensionality reduction technique that is the principal component analysis. And this is what we will do on the following lessons. On this lesson, we introduce this CRAPS data set. We also study this data set, right? And transform this data set for better description. And on the following lessons, we will visualize this data set and apply the dimensionality reduction PCA technique to have a better visualization. We remember that you can download all the documentation as well as all this notebook and this code on the downloadable documents of this lesson. See you on the next lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will continue with the dimensionality reduction project applying the principal component analysis. So in the previous lesson we introduced this data set, we created a notebook in Google Colab, we did the initial study of this data set, right? We loaded this data set. We also transformed the name of the columns. We mapped the different values for the species and for the sex attributes. And we also saw that we needed to separate the 200 grams that we have in total into four classes, right? So we did. We created here a new column in the data set. The name was class. And here, this was the concatenation of the species of this graph with the sex of this graph. So now at the end, if we check now the new data set, we have here an extra column for the class, right? We also saw the tail and the head of this data set. So remember when we write the head method in a pandas data frame, this will return the first five rows, the first five instances. And we have here that the class is again the concatenation of the species and the sex. For instance, the crab 2 is blue and male. So we have here that he belongs to the class blue male and so on. So in this lesson, we will do a first initial visualization of the classes on this data set. So we will here solve this first point of the project. And on the following lesson, we will improve this visualization applying the principal component analysis technique. So here, let's continue and add a new text window. Uh, we will start with the basic exploration of the data set, right? This visualization. Now, since on this data set, the only features and measurements that are important and relevant are these ones, right? Here, the sex the species or the index is not important. So we will explore this continuous values of the frontal lobe, the rear width, the carapace midline, the maximum width and the body depth. So we will define now a variable data columns that we will store the name of the columns that are relevant for the initial study. As we have just mentioned, it is going to be these columns. We can describe all the statistics information about this column so here on the crib's data we can access this columns data columns and here we use the describe method in pandas right with this we only describe these columns and here keep in mind that we need to change this width this w is in uppercase right this is in uppercase so we change this to be in uppercase we run again and now we see the description of only these columns that we have specified. We have a total number of two, uh, in this case, 200 instances for the frontal lobe and the same for the rest. Okay, all the attributes are defined. The mean of all the values of this frontal lobe here, we can see this 15.58, right? The mean for the rear width is 12. 0.73 and so on. Here it is the standard deviation, the minimum value. Okay, the minimum value for the frontal lobe is this one, and the same we have for the rest. And here we can also see the percentiles and finally the maximum value of them. So here the grab inside this data set that has the maximum uh, carapace midline is this value here with the value of 47.6. Right, so this first point of the project asks us to do a visualization. 
here we are only doing a statistic description so let's start with the visualization of the classes so before going into the classes that are basically a uh, blue male blue female orange male orange female we'll first visualize the data set with the relevant columns and then we will visualize the classes and we will also discuss why we need here and we have the necessity of applying a dimensionality reduction technique such as the PCA. Okay, we will see why this is important. So we will start with the box plot here on the text. Let's just visualize this with a box plot. So box plot of the relevant features. And now to represent this box plot, we will need to use the matplotlib library for Python. And this is a very important plotting library for creating static, animated, and interactive visualizations in Python. So we need to import this library. We go here to the section on imports. Okay, we can also do it on that last cell, but we will do it here on the first uh cell of code right so here we are going to import the matplotlib library to do this we just use here import matplotlib point pyplot like so okay and now as we can see we need to add here as plt with this we will import the pyplot for the matplotlib library this is the pyplot object oriented that will provide the applications and the visualizations that we want so we run again this cell do not forget to run again yourself. So now your Collab notebook is updated, right? And now here we will use a box plot, right? So first of all, we will create a new figure. Okay, and new axis also. And we can create this uh, in the object oriented style of PyPlot. We just write here PyPlot. Remember that PyPlot was imported as PLT. Whenever you want to use the PyPlot, you just write plt so here we use pyplot to create a new figure and axis we write the subplots method and here we can also specify the size of this figure we will specify a size of width 8 for instance and height 5 right so once we have this figure in fact if we run this cell like so we'll have an empty figure so we want to draw the box plot of the relevant columns that we see here on this data set so to do this we need to first write the name of the data set we want to also access the columns okay the specified columns that we want so we want only the relevant columns this is the data columns variable right like so and here we just do a box plot of pandas like so okay so now when we run this let's run it here we can see the box plot represented of all these variables, all these features, the frontal lobe, the real width, the curve base midline, the maximum width, and the body depth, represented in a box plot. Remember that in the box plot we have the information of the minimum, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum of the data. Remember that we can interpret the box plot in this way, this is not something and concept that belongs to the section of this PCA technique, but it's very important to remember. Okay, if we have a box plot, we can have here the upper whisker. If we have data that goes above the upper whisker, then they will be possible outliers. This upper quartile is the third quartile. Then this horizontal line is the median. Here we have the lower quartile, also named as the first quartile. And finally, we have here the lower whisker, that if we have data that goes uh, below this lower whisker, they will be possible of the liars. Again, this is not something that we will go inside and study deeply, because this is not a statistical curse. However, this is only a visualization process that we will do initially, so then we have this information visualized about the columns, right? So now let's proceed with visualizing the classes of this data set. Remember, we have four different classes, right? If we see here, we have the class blue male, blue female, orange male, and orange female. 
So now on this visualization of the classes, and this is what it is very interesting, we can study these features, these attributes, separately, depending on the given class. So let's see how we can do this. For instance, let's suppose we want to study the frontal law depending on these four classes. So we want to see how it is different when some crab is a blue male, some crab is a blue female, orange male or orange female, how the frontal lobe changes. So here let's add a new text window just here below. Okay, we can just press this cell new text window and in here we can say that this is the initial visualization of classes. So let's start with the frontal lobe feature. This is a relevant attribute and we want to study the classes with this attribute. So to do so, we just access the name of this data set, which is crops data. We will represent a box plot. So again, we write the box plot method in pandas data frame. So this is a box plot. But also here, moreover, we will specify the column name. So the column name, as we can see here, is frontal lob. So frontal lob. And now how we set the classes to be studied? Well, we can do this with an extra argument in the box plot method that this is the by argument that we can set where we want to study. So we want to study the classes. So here by class, right? So remember that this attribute here that we created extra is a class, this new feature. If you have uh, written another name, then you just write this new attribute name that you have set. For our case, we have set class. So here we just write class. And again, we will specify the figure size to be the same, which is 8 and 5, right? So here, 8 and 5, like so. Very well, so now let's run this cell. And as we can see, now we have four different box plots depending on the class. And the feature that we are studying is the frontal law, as we can see. Here we have the class blue female. As we can see, a blue female has, in general, a smaller value of the frontal lobe than a blue male, right? their values is uh, bigger. And here, on the other hand, on the female species, it can easily be seen that an orange female has a, in average, greater value for the frontal lobe than an orange male. Remember that here it is the frontal lobe attribute that represents the frontal lobe width of the graph. So this is very interesting because we can see how different classes behave, okay? and extract conclusion depending on the classes. So we will do the same thing for the rest of the relevant features. Okay, we have a total number of five relevant features. So we did it with the frontal lobe. We'll do the same with the rear width and so on. So here we can just copy this cell. We can add a new code. And now we can change this name to be the rear width. We run again. We can also see here how the rear width is different depending on the class. We add a new window of code and now we just change this to be the carapace midline. So now we are going to study the carapace midline. We run this cell. We see also this variation. Now we do the same for the maximum width and the body depth. So here we create a new code window now for the maximum width. We can see now the box plots, depending on the class. And now finally, to end this visualization with the box plot, we add now the box plots for the column body depth, depending on the class. So we run this cell, and as we can see, we have these four block spots. So with this, we are visualizing the four classes of the data set with box plots. We can also do histograms and represent histograms where the hue of the histogram is going to be the class. So initially we can just plot histograms. So we can add here new code window and also text window before to represent that we are going to do now histograms. Histograms study. Very well. So before going into the classes in the same way that initially 
when we were working with the box plots, we plotted, right? The box plots of all the relevant features. We will also see here the histogram of all the relevant features. So let's come here to this new window. Here we will access the crops data set, right? The columns that are relevant are the variable data columns. Here we have all the relevant features. Now we will use here a histogram. And to do this, we just write the histogram method, which is the hist. This syntax will create a histogram. The size of this histogram, let's just say it is 16 width and 4 of height. And also the layout, let's see it to be a layout of 1.6. So here the layout is 1.6. Remember that this layout is nothing more than the tuple of rows and columns for the histogram, right? We can even comment this, but it is important to remember that the layout here, layout, is this tuple of rows column for the histogram. So the idea is how many histograms will we have? Well, we will have a total value of five total important features right they are these ones as we can see here the frontal lobe the rear width and so on however we we are going to add an extra layout here an extra column so we have more space but you can also change this to be five and it will also work but we are going to add an extra column in blank to have an extra space so now let's run it and as we can see, we see these five histograms and we also see an extra space at the end because of this six, right? And we have here all the important features. So now let's use this histogram visualization depending on the class, since this first point, we need to visualize the classes. In order to do so, we will create now a new code window in here. We'll pick, for instance, this first Feature in order, let's do this in order from left to right. We will now study the frontal lobe depending on the class. So the first thing is creating a new figure. Remember that we can do this with the pie plot figure, right? Now the name of this figure, uh, it is not important because we are not going to title this figure. We are only going to visualize. And now let's specify the size of this figure. For instance, to be uh, eight width, and six high this is a sufficient size so now to plot the histogram depending on a given value depending on a given class right which is going to be the hue now the class let's visualize now this last attribute this class feature is going to be the hue for this frontal law so to do this we need to use a histogram plotting from the library of seaboard Seaborn is a Python data visualization library based on Matplotlib. So it provides also a high level interface for drawing advanced plotting. So again, let's go to the initial window of imports. And now we are going to import the Seaborn library. To do so, we can simply write import Seaborn as SNS. We run again this cell. We update the colored notebook right now the colored notebook is up to date and now on this new figure that we are going to plot we are going to plot a histogram plot using the seaborn library so to do so we need to write here the seaborn so s and s we will use the method east plot this is for histogram plotting now the first argument is the data we want to plot so the data set is scraps data the second is if we want to specify a given column, keep in mind that what is the column that we will start the first? Well, the first column is going to be the frontal lobe. So here we specify it with the X value. This X value specifies the column that we want to study. So in this case, the frontal lobe, like so. And now finally, a very important argument of this method is that we can set the hue. So we will study depending on a given value of the class. So here the hue is going to be the class. Finally, we can specify also the number of bins of this histogram. A value of 20 will be sufficient. Very well. So now let's see this visualization of this histogram depending on the class. So let's run this. And as we can see, here we have the frontal lobe histogram 
depending on the class. And this is a very important visualization. We can see that the class in blue is for the blue male, the class in orange is for the blue female crab, the class in green is for the orange male, the class in this pink or red is this orange female. Remember that in a histogram we have that for a given value of a given feature, how many instances of the data set satisfy this value. So, for instance, to one example of interpretation of this histogram, we can say that, for instance, for a frontal lobe value of 9, okay, which is this case here, we have a total of 4 crabs that are blue female, that have a frontal lobe of 9, and only we have 2 crabs, 2 instances of crabs that are blue male, that have a frontal lobe of 9, okay, as we can see on this point. And on this point for the class of blue female and the class blue male. In the same way, there are a total value of, for instance, four instances of crabs that are orange male that have a frontal lobe of 21.5. Okay, moreover, and only two instances of crabs that are for this other class in here. The most important here via interpretation that when can say, for instance, could be this one, where we see that for a given value of 18.5 of the frontal lobe, only one instance of crab blue male has this value, right? Only five instances for the crabs for orange male have this value of 18.5, and a total of eight total crabs that are orange female have a frontal lobe of 18.5, right? So, as we can see, this is the histogram plot depending on the class, since here the hue is the class. So, we will do the same thing for the rest of the attributes. So, we can just copy this, so we can create a new code window, right? And now, instead of frontal lobe, we will just set here that we will study the rear width depending on the class. So, again, we can just plot this and we see this histogram depending on these four classes. The same for the carapace midline. We create a new code window now for the carapace midline. Remember that you can download all this code and all this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Here we see now the hue histogram. The same we do for the maximum width. So we create this window for the maximum width. And now we see here now the maximum width histogram depending on the four classes. And finally we study the body depth depending on the four classes. So we create the final code window for the histogram, we run this, and now we see this histogram plot, right? So we did now the visualization of the classes with box plots, with histogram plots, right? And now also we will use here the final plot, which is a pair plot. And also now we will discuss why we need here to apply a principal company in analysis technique and why it is useful. So as we've said, we are going to use now Fireplot. This we will do it with Seaborn. The Seaborn pair plot allows us to plot pairwise relationships between variables within a data set. This creates a nice visualization and helps us understand the data by summarizing a large amount of data in a single figure. And also this is essential when we are exploring the data set and trying to become familiar with it. So it is an essential to enhance your data understanding. And also at the end now we will discuss why it is important to apply here the PCA. First let's here plot the pair plot. So to do this we just write here the Seaborn. Library, the method name is pair plot, like so. Here we write the data set, in our case, crops data, and also the hue. Keep in mind that we want to study depending on the classes. We want to do a visualization, right? This visualization depending on the classes. So now the hue is going to be equal to the class. So let's run this cell and see what we have. So we can see here different colors, right, of these points. They are these four different colors and they are precisely these four classes. In fact, if we see here, we have that the blue class is the blue male class, this orange is the blue female, this green 
is for the orange male and this red point is for the orange female. So with this we can visualize how the different classes change with the relation of these variables. This, for instance, first example we see here represents how the index changes of the four classes when we increment the frontal lobe, right? So as we move to the right, it means that we are incrementing the frontal lobe value and as we go up, it means that we are incrementing the index. So the index here is not an important feature, so we will skip this first row. However, let's come here to the frontal lobe, okay? And since this column is also for the index, we will come to the second and not only the second because it is only the frontal lobe as well, but now the third column. So keep in mind that this plot that we see in here, this one, okay, this third plot, represents how the frontal lobe changes when we increment or decrement the rear width, right? So as we can see, we have a, it is easy to see that we have a quasi linear function with a positive slope. This means that when we increment this rear width, we also see that the frontal lobe is incremented. More is pronounced this slope, okay? This slope here on the next figure, this one in here, is very pronunciated. It means that as we increment, let's see why that attribute is the curve base midline, okay, the frontal lobe is incremented a lot depending on all the classes, right? So here we can see how different classes change depending on the relationship. So this pair plot is a very important plot when we are studying classes because we can see the relationship between variables depending on classes, right? For instance, let's just study new this example. This example in this figure studies how the rear width, okay, changes when we increment the curve base midline. So, for instance, for the class in red, which is the class orange female, we can see that we have a slope, okay, very big slope, that is greater for instance, then the slope in green, which is for the orange male. So we can see the relationship is stronger on the class of orange female. This means that when we increment the Kerpes midline, when the Kerpes midline is incremented, the rear width is more incremented in the orange female than in the orange male. Okay, a crop that belongs to the class orange female, when it has a very big in a very great value of the carapace midline, he will be, or in this case, she will be likely to have a very also great rear width, right? However, in the orange male, this slope is also positive, okay? The relationship is positive, but it is not as strong, so it is a weaker one, okay? The relation is stronger and in fact strongest in the orange female and also we can see here in orange okay more or less the same for the blue female so it seems to be that female crabs tend to have a very stronger and strongest relationship between the carapace midline and the rear width very well so of course we can do this for all the possible plots that we see these on these pair plots and we can do it one by one and extract conclusions. However, we have lots of plots because we have too many features, right? So that's why we will apply the principal component analysis. And this is why and where the PCA technique comes on, right? We will improve this visualization using the PCA technique. So let's give here a final discussion. So we add here title. Let's just write here discussion or using PCA. First of all, that the high dimensionality makes it difficult and also longer to manage and understand it, and that the dimensionality reduction methods allows first to reduce unnecessary dimensions or noise. Also, it will reduce the computational cost when we are doing a learning model in machine learning, and also it allows us to visualize the data in two dimensions and three dimensions. And this is what we will do on the following lesson when we will apply this uh, principal component analysis technique. So, as we can see, we've done already two lessons on this project and we 
have not reached yet to apply this principal component analysis technique. But the reason it is that it is more important to know why we need to apply this technique, how this technique will be applied, than just apply it. Okay, we need to first understand why it is necessary. So that's what we did on these two lessons. We introduced the data set, we did an initial visualization, and here we can discuss why we need to apply this dimensionality reduction. If we here apply the pair plot for the data set, we have too many plots to study. Okay, just imagine if you had instead of this uh, four or five or six or any order until 10 columns, imagine if you have 800 attributes. Okay, imagine reading a pair plot with 100 features. So that's why we need to use the PCA technique. And this is what we will do on the following lesson. So remember that you can download all this code and all this notebook that we have done until this moment on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we are going to use the principal component analysis to make a better visualization of our data. Remember that on the previous lesson we visualized the classes of the data set, right? And now we will improve this visualization applying the PCA technique. Remember that on the previous lesson we discussed that when we have a high dimensionality of the data, this makes it difficult and longer to manage and understand this data. So dimensionality reduction methods such as the PDA, okay, provides us many benefits. So let's add now a new section here. Okay, we can just go to code window, a new code window, and here let's just write PCA. In this case, it's going to be a text window. So here we just add a text window, and here we just write PCA. So here let's add that we are going to use this technique for a better visualization. Now, on the PCA technique, we assume a Gaussian distribution of the attributes. This means that the data must be standardized. This will change the data so that all variables have mean 0 and the standard deviation is 1. So here, let's add a new code window and first of all, let's standardize this data. So in order to do this, let's define a new data set of the crops data. Let's just call it crabs standardized so this will be at the end the crab standardized data so initially we will have that this is a copy of the previous data set so we just copy this crabs data set and now we standardize this data set now to do this we will apply the standard scalar this is a procedure from the scikit-learn library the scikit-learn library is a free software machine learning library for the python programming language this library provides many many features such as for classification regression and clustering algorithms including support vector machines and so on so it is a very complete and extensive library for machine learning in python we will use this library to standardize the data which is one of the many many things we can do with this library so the first thing we need to do is to import this standard scalar procedure in the import uh, libraries window, right? So we will import this procedure for the scikit-learn library. So we can do it simply in here from the scikit-learn preprocessing module. So here we access the preprocessing. We are going to import the standard scalar. So here we import the standard scalar, like so. Again, this is to standardize our data, the standard scalar. Now, since we are already in this uh, window of importing libraries, and since we will apply and use the principal component analysis technique in this lesson, it is also important to know that we will need to import the PCA from this library scikit-learn. So to do this, to be able to use the PCA technique, we need to go to the scikit-learn. Here we will use the decomposition and we import the PCA. Also, we can set the display type of the configuration for the scikit-learn. This is optional. However, in the global scikit-learn configuration, 
the estimators will be displayed with a diagram in the notebook. If we want the estimators to be displayed as a text, we need to change this configuration. So to do this, it is very easy. We just hear from the scikit-learn library, we will import the set config so we can change the global configuration of the scikit-learn. This is the set config with this underscore. And now we will set the config of this scikit-learn. And now on the display option here, we will set this to be text. Again, this in here, this line we will will ensure that the estimators will be displayed as text and not as diagram here okay the default is diagram so let's just write here diagram so if you don't make this change the display uh, basically is diagram if you make this change now the display is text this is for when you're calculating the estimators also when you are working with the psyche learn or in fact in any machine learning process or project it doesn't need to be with the library scikit-learn. We have a thing that is called a deprecation warnings. Deprecation warnings are a common thing in the industry of machine learning. And they are simply warnings that notify us that a specific feature will be removed soon. And so be replaced with something else. So you can visualize this as the idea of warning messages that are typically issued in situations where it is useful to alert the user of some condition in the program where this condition does not raise any exception and does not terminate the program. For example, one might want to issue a warning to the user when a program uses an obsolete module. So there is a way to avoid and to ignore all these warnings that do not raise an exception at all. Uh, here basically ignoring this type of warnings. So here we will import the warnings library in Python. This uh, is a module in Python. So we will import this warnings module in Python. And to ignore all these deprecated warnings, we can just here type warnings, filter warnings, ignore, like so. So this is a general behavior when you're doing machine learning and this is not mandatory for this work on this project for the PCA. However, there will be occasions where you don't want to have many, many warnings in our windows, okay? Because these warnings do not produce any exception. They are simply warnings that uh, specify the behavior of the data set, how the data set is changing and so on. Too. So to avoid all these extensive warnings, we can use this criteria very well with all this once we have imported the standard scaler right we can standardize this data so we will not yet use this pca okay uh, we will just start standardizing the data since as we've explained before to apply the pca technique the data must be standardized so in this data set remember that when we did the visualization right we only visualize the relevant features. Remember that these relevant features uh, were five, the frontal lobe, the rear width, the carapace midline, the maximum width, and the body depth, right? So now when we visualize these classes of the data set applying the PCA technique, we will also use only these uh, relevant features, so we will only normalize these relevant features. Also keep in mind that there is no sense, and this does not make any sense, if we normalize or if we standardize the data that is uh, categorical or even binary, right? If we have a sex that can be either male or female, or if we have a species that can be either blue or orange, we have binary values, we have categorical variables. So we cannot standardize this data. On the other hand, it does make the total sense, and it is very, very important and efficient, that here we have continuous variables, okay, from the frontal lobe until the body depth. These are the five relevant features. So since they are continuous variables, okay, it makes the total sense that they can be standardized. So we will basically take all these relevant features, all these relevant attributes, and we will standardize this data. So we will copy this variable data columns. Okay, on these variables we have all the relevant features so now we will standardize this scraps standardized 
data and we will do it only with the relevant features right so we will only access here the data columns these are the relevant features and here we will use the standard scalar that we have imported right here above on top from the scikit-learn library we have imported a standard scalar so now we will use this scalar to standardize the data so in this sense now the mean of the data will have basically the mean zero and the standard deviation of this data will be one so to do this we just apply the standard scalar we are going to fit this transforming the data set crops data with the relevant feature so here we just write the data set grabs data and now the columns that we want to standardize in this case all the relevant features so this is the data columns array right like so so with this we will have the data standardized the data will have mean zero and the standard deviation is going to be one so we can check this with the describe method so here we just write this new data set standardized with the scribe method and here we can transpose this table so now when we run we'll have the description transposed so before running this remember that we need to go into the import window and also update this window because we have not run this we want to import the standard scaler so we run this again now the google collab will update this keep in mind that here we are only missing an n okay this is further warnings we add this and we run again and now we have done all the imports and now the notebook has imported the standard scaler right so since now the notebook is up to date we can proceed for running this cell and as we can see here we have the description why do we add this t what does this t property mean well this is basically the transposition of this matrix keep in mind that this description is nothing more than a table it is a matrix that if we erase this t for instance let's just copy this in a new uh, cold window let's clear this output we can do it in here clear output new cold window so if we just remove this t what is going to happen well, we have that now the count, the mean, the standard deviation, all these characteristics is, is on the left, but we want them to be on top, okay, to have this uh, classification. So we just add a T and here we transpose this matrix and now the description attributes is on top, right? So as we can see, we have here the count, the mean and so on. So why do we do this? Well, we do this, Okay, this is description to verify that we have correctly standardized all the data. Keep in mind, when we standardize the data, okay, the variables now must have mean zero, the ones that we have standardized, and the standard deviation needs to be one, also of the columns that we have standardized. Remember that we only standardize the uh, variables frontal lobe, we are with curve base midline max and with and max uh, and body depth right so here we can check for instance what is the mean of the frontal lobe well the mean is this value this is a value that is precisely as minus 7.1 okay multiply with 10 raised to minus 17 so this is a very very small number okay this is very very small and we can approximate trivially this to zero so this is zero practically and the same thing happens with the rear read what is the mean of the rear read now well it is 6.04 multiplied in scientific notations uh, with 10 raised to minus 16. this is also very 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 small number with many zeros we have a total of uh 16 zeros right so also there's a zero as we can see all the mean also the body depth the maximum width here is zero and what what about the standard deviation this standard deviation needs to be one so the same thing happens here what is the standard deviation of the frontal lobe one what is the standard deviation of the rear width it is also one right so with this we verify that all the columns that we have standardized are all correct we have standardized all data correctly so apart from only standardizing the data that's why we 
advise the student to also check that the standardization is correct. Okay, so with this we see that the standardization is correct. For all the columns that we have uh, standardized, frontal lobe, rear width, curve, pace, midline, maximum width, and body depth, all of them have mean zero and standard deviation one. Very well, once we have the data standardized, we can proceed to apply the principal component analysis. So here, let's just write a text window. Remember that you can download all this notebook on the downloadable resources of this lesson. So let's proceed to use the principal component analysis technique. We will do this with the method of PCA that we have imported from the scikit-learn. This method will return the explained variance ratio and all relevant PCA related parameters. Keep in mind that we can use the explained variance in here ratio and the singular values to decide how many components we will keep. Remember that here the components are the eigenvectors of the PCA. So let's apply the principal component analysis technique. We will explain this step by step. So first step, if we use the PCA method, this will return the explained variance ratio and all relevant PCA related parameters. So first let's calculate those. We add a new code window. So let's define a new variable that will have all this information. Let's just call it my PCA, right? And th this is going to be equal to the method PCA from the scikit-learn library that we have imported. Okay, here, import PCA. So we will use this module here, PCA. And we are going to fit this principal component analysis to the data set that is already standardized, in this case, this one, Grubs standardized. So we are going to feed Grubs standardized, right? And we are only going to apply the principal component analysis on those features that are relevant. So in this case, we will only apply them on the data columns, right? So here we are just going to apply it on the relevant features. Keep in mind that we want to use in the, the principal comment and analysis for this problem to improve the visualization right that we did on the previous lesson uh, if you remember the previous lesson we did an initial visualization of the data set however since we had too many dimensions this visualization was not the best one right because we need to do a lot of work to visualize all the relation between the relevant features and the classes. But the most important thing is that we only visualized those features that are relevant, right? The frontal lobe, the rear width, the curve base midline, the maximum width, the body depth, and this is all. We only visualize these features. So in the same way, when we apply the PCA technique for visualization and this enhancement of this visualization, we will only do it with the relevant features. That's why here, we are only going to fit the principal component analysis on the relevant features. So once we have this variable, we can print the explained variance ratio. To do this, we can just write here the print method in Python. Here, the object of the PCA, in this case, my PCA. And we can just access the explained variance ratio, like so. This explained variance ratio returns a vector of the variance explained by each dimension. So, since we have here five dimensions, we have five features, we will have a vector of the explained variance by each of these five features, right? So, we can print this, we can also print... So, to print the cumulative sum, we do the same thing, my PCA, explain it variance ratio and here we just access the method of the comsum this is a general method in any uh, array in python that returns the cumulative sum of a vector so keep in mind that if this is a vector that each position has the explained variance for that dimension then this is a vector here a vector x that will return Okay, the cumulative variance explain it by the first dimensions that we have seen until that moment, in the sense of if we are in the position i, 
This position i returns the cumulative variance explained by the first i plus 1 dimensions. Keep in mind that the index list in Python starts at 0, that's why in the position i we have the explained variance of the first i plus 1 dimensions, right? Here, if we are in the position, for instance, the position x2 of this vector, this contains the information of the first three dimensions. The dimension 0, the dimension 1, and the dimension 2, because we have the cumulative sum. So with all this, let's print this and explain the result. Right, we can uh, run this, let's run this cell. So here there is one argument that is missing, and this is because this is a method, so we can just add the parentheses in here, okay, just in here. We run again, and now as we can see, we have a vector, okay, we have a vector where each position, okay, explains the variance on each dimension. So here, this value in here, is the explained variance for the dimension frontal lobe. This one is the explained variance for the dimension rear width. This one is the explained variance for the dimension carapace midline. This one for the maximum width and this one for the body depth. Now, we want to reduce the dimensions of this data set. We want to apply a dimensionality reduction. Why is this useful? Why is this explained variance useful? Well, this is useful because since we can know also from this vector, okay, what is the explained variance for the i plus 1 dimensions, we can choose how many components, right? We can decide from these values how many components or how many uh, dimensions we will have at the end. For instance, with the first two dimensions, we have explained variance of 0 0.98. Okay, that's a good explained variance. Now, with the first three, we have a value of 0 0.9974, which is a 99.74%. This is a very good explained variance. So, it is going to be a greater idea and a better idea to visualize the data set using three dimensions, because as we can see with these three, we have this explained variance than with only two, right? So this is an example where these two dimensions and three dimensions is close to each other, but it may be cases where this, for instance, the, the cumulative sum in this position, which is basically the information with the first two dimensions is something like 0 0.6 and with the three first 0 0.97 or something like this. So in that case, you'll never choose only two dimensions. Instead, you will choose three. Here, it is a good idea to choose both, two or three, but it is better to choose, as we can see here, three, because we have a better uh, explained variance. Very well, now we are going to represent the script plot. The script plot, let's put here with this heading. So this script plot is very, very important when using PCA, and it is important to understand and to know how to interpret this script plot. So why is the script plot used? Well, the script plot is used to determine the number of principal components that we will keep in a principal component analysis in the PCA that we are doing here. So let's do this script plot for this example and see how we can choose the number of components. Again, one way is by the explained variance ratio in the cumulative sum of this vector. So we have until a given dimension how much of the explained variance we can have. But a very common way and usual way to do this uh, in machine learning is by a script plot. So let's do this now, this is script plot. The first thing that we need to do is to create a new figure. We will do this with the pi plot, okay, from matplotlib. So a new figure is going to be the pi plot with a better figure. Here we can also choose the size. Uh, let's just say that this is going to be a size of width 8 and height uh, 6 for instance okay so we already have the figure in fact if we just uh, run this we know that we have a figure of this size right now the x-axis is going to be the components right so here we are going to use the method plot to plot in this figure the x-axis is going to be from 0 to 5 right so here we can just say the range method in python we are going to start with 1, 
and then we are going to go until the length of the total dimensions in this case we can access the total dimensions with the singular values so here if we just write my pca are singular values with an underscore at the end okay this is going to be the length of the uh, component so in this case uh, five components however in python remember that if you have something like this range one five here you'll have the vector or the list uh, or in this case let's say uh, you start one then two then three and then four so the five is not included but we want to include the number five as well right so if we want to include the number five we need to change this five to six so since this is five which is the, the total components we are going to increase in one so five plus one gives us six so from one to six this range is going to be the vector one two three four five this is only uh, because of the range method in python and so then this is the x-axis then what is going to be the y-axis well the y-axis is going to be the eigenvalues keep in mind that this here will return the eigenvalues of the pca uh, these singular values are equal to the two normalized of the number of components variables in the lower dimensional space however you can just interpret this as the eigenvalues and then we can also set here an option for the line opacity this is completely optional however we are going to set an opacity of uh, 0 0.8 which is an 80 percent and also the marker is going to be with periods so we define here the marker to be periods you can change this to be squares or any other type of marker you want we are going to use the, the periods very well with this we have the plot that we want this is the script plot okay let's comment here script plot now we can also label the x-axis and the y-axis so it is easier to visualize this so the y label this is going to be equal to the eigenvalues so we can use the method y label from the pi plot this is going to label this uh, vertical axis and this is going to be the eigenvalues so here we just type eigenvalues like so and then in the same way the x label this is going to be equal to the x label of the components so this is the components right this is merely for labeling the vertical axis and the horizontal axis now finally we can set a title to this plot with the title method and here let's just say that the title is the script plot like so so now let's run this code window we run it and now we'll see the script plot like so here we have that the horizontal axis is the components the number of components and the y-axis the eigenvalues and if you know this is just plotting the screen and the, the singular values right in fact if we come here we add a new code window and here we just write the, the singular values and we run this this is going to be the array that is basically the eigenvalues for each uh, component this is the eigenvalue for the component one component two and so on so this is precisely what is happening here the component one has a value around 30 which is 30.94 the component two a value of 5.5 which is here the component three a value of three more or less like here and so on so this is just plotting the singular values now the rule of thumb for interpreting the script plot is as follows what we want to do is to retain the number of components that are above of what is the screen or when this plot tends not to draw much so we will then say also a flat line but taper off very gradually so as we can see we have a very big slope from the component one to component two and not so many big slope for component two uh to component three and then we have some something like a screen that really this doesn't change much the slope so what does this name come from the screen plot well the screen is a geological term that indicates the rubble or the stones that fall from a cliff so if you think of a cliff you're driving along a road and you're gonna see a lot of stones smaller sized you're gonna see a lot of stones smaller sized rocks 
than some bigger rocks, but they're all collecting along the side of the mountain, right? Well, this is the scree or the rubble that is collected off the cliff. So that's where this name comes from. So we want to retain the number of components above the scree. So generally for the visualization, two or three components are chosen. Keep in mind that the script here we can interpret like with two components can be sufficient, right? Because here we have the cliff and here we have the screen. However, for the visualization, we can also here choose three. So let's continue by putting the percentage of variance explained by component. So let's add a new text window. Here we are going to plot now the percentage of explained variance by component. Well, first of all, let's create here a new figure. We add a new code window. We are going to create a new figure with the pyplot figure method. So here we just write figure, the fig size, for instance, I just say this is going to be eight, six, and here we are going to return this in the variable figure, right? Now, once we have the figure drawn with the matplotlib library, we can now apply the method plot of the pyplot library. So here we can just use pyplot plot. And here we specify, first of all, the uh, x axis. And now the x axis is going to be the component. So in the same way, we can here define the x axis as to be the range from one to five. And this five, we can get with the length of the variance explained with the object my PCA. So remember that this object here of the PCA is my PCA. So here we just copy my PCA. Here we use the method explain variance ratio, like so. So since when we do the length of this, since we have five components, this is going to be five. But in the same way, when you do something like this, you'll have the array one, two, three, four. But we want also a five here. So here we change the five to be six. So we have also five. So we add the length plus one, right? So here we just add a plus one in here. Inside the range method. Now we specify as any plot method. First, we specify the x-axis, right? And now we specify the y-axis. So the y-axis is going to be the values of the explained variance ratio, like so. We can also define the opacity. Let's just say that the opacity is an 80%. The markers is going to be points as well. So here the marker, we just define this to be periods, like this. And then finally, we will add the label here to say that this is going to be the explained variance. So this is the explained variance. And we end this pyplot function. Now we are going to label the y-axis and the x-axis. So the y label is going to be here, the pyplot. And here we just write y label, right? Like so, y label. So this vertical axis is the explained variance. We are plotting the explained variance. And here we are also going to define the X label, the horizontal label. This is going to be the components that we have, right? In the same way here. On the previous plot, we defined the, and we plotted the eigenvalues for each component. And here we have the explained variance for each component. Very well. So with this plot, okay, we have the percentage of explained variance by component. Finally, we can define here the legend. We can add legends. So now we can have and see the labels that we have written. Okay, in a specific for this label, for this function. And now we can here, for instance, set the title of this figure as the percentage of variance explained by component. So let's run this. So here we see the percentage of the variance explained by component. Keep in mind that we add this pyplot legend, so we can see here this explained variance for this uh, function in blue. Now, keep in mind that what we have here is precisely the values of this uh, explained variance ratio, right? For instance, for the first component, we have a value of 0 0.95, right? Because here it is 
10 to the power of minus 1 in scientific notation. So this is around 0 0.195 and this is precisely what we see here. The component 1 has an explained invariance of 0 0.95. What about the second component? Well, the second component has uh, a value around 0 0.030337. So this is the value that we see here, right? So what if we also want to plot, now in this case we see it here, right? In the, in the percentage of a variance explained by component, the component 2 has this value 0 0.0303. And the component 3 has a value of 0 0.0093, what we see here, 0 0.0093, right? So what if we also want to see inside this same figure, the percentage of variance explained, but also the cumulative explained variance. So precisely this other array that we saw before. Okay, this is the cumulative sum of the variance explained, such that if we use only one component, we have this variance explained. If we use this two, we have this variance explained. If we use this three, we have this variance explained. So to do this, Let's just also plot this uh, accumulative variance explained. This is going to be very important. And we'll do this in the same figure. So here we are going to add a new line of code before the legend and the title. This is going to be another plot. The range for the x-axis is going to be the same, right? The range basically are the components. And now the y-axis, okay, the function, Okay, the image of this function now is the accumulative sum of this explained variance ratio. So to compute here the cumulative sum of this array, we need to use uh, a function that is the cumsum function. Okay, and this function belongs to the NumPy library. So the NumPy library, we need to import it on top of our code to import numpy we just type here import numpy as np so the numpy library is a library for the python programming language adding support for large multi-dimensional arrays and matrices along with a large collection of high level mathematical functions to operate on these arrays so we will use this library the numpy library to uh, compute the cumulative sum of this array so here okay on the plot at the end on the y okay here now instead of just my pca explain variance ratio we will compute the cumulative sum of this and to do this we just use the numpy method that is the cum sum and as an argument we pass this array like so this is going to compute the array that is the cumulative sum of this array. Also, since this is going to be another function inside the same figure, we are going to change the color for this. We are going to put this color to be red. Okay, we can add here DC. This means color in the PyPlot uh, plot method. Okay, this is for changing the color and DR stands for red. So now this function is going to be painted in red. The marker is going to be with periods as well and finally the label okay now instead of the explained variance this is going to be the cumulative explained variance right like so so here we change this v we change also this v and so we end this pi plot method right we end this plot and with this we are done okay we are ready to plot now this second function so now let's run again this cell we press the run button and also here before pressing this run button, let's load again the library window. So with this, we are going to import this numpy. We need to update. Very well. Now that we know that the notebook is up to date, we can run again this cell. And as we can see, here we see the plot of the explained variance, but also cumulative. So this red function is the cumulative explained variance. We can see it here with this label. Remember that this title... Okay, this legend corresponds to this label. And the blue function is the explained variance for each component, which is here this label, right? So with this, we can see uh, how many components does it take to get a very strong value 
for the explained variance. Keep in mind that a value that is the very closest to one is the, be the best value that we can have, okay? But normally for visualization, we will choose around two or three components. We can also visualize the weights that the PCA assigns to each component. So here, let's add a new text window. Let's comment this and let's see how we can visualize the weights that the PCA assigns to each component calculated. So we will use now a heat map. We can use a heat map with the scikit-learn library. And also with Seaborn, we are going to use this library Seaborn with the S and else to apply this heat map. So we go here to the window at the end of the notebook. And now we are going to use this library of Seaborn and we are going to use it with the heat map. The heat map plots rectangular data as a color encoded matrix such that we can see the weight values and also the color of these weights. So the first argument is the data we want to see the weights of. So in this case, it is the components of the PCA. So we access the my PCA object and here we just say components. Then the second argument is the, the C map, the color map. This is just the mapping from data values to color space. There is a wide range of color maps. We are going to use for this example, a seismic color map, but you can use any other. So here the color map, the C map is going to be seismic. Now this third argument is very important and this is the labels for the ticks on the X axis. So since we are plotting the color map for the components, now the X axis is going to be the relevant features, right? So here it is important that you remember, let's add here the code window, that for instance, if we visualize the graph's data with the head uh, function, right? And we uh, run this cell, we can see the first five elements of this data set, right? Keep in mind that what are the relevant features? Remember, the relevant features are the frontal lobe, the rear width, the group base midline, the maximum width, and the body depth. So we have here five features, right? That start at which position? Well, we can see that this position starts at the position three. So the idea, we are going to start from here, the position three. So this is basically position zero, position two, right? A yeah, position one, then we have position two and finally the position three. So we are going to start with the position three until when? Well, until the body depth. So the body depth is the previous element to the last element because we don't want to have here the class, okay? Only the body depth. So here we are going to use the minus one in Python to just jump to the previous element to the last. So let's explain this step by step. Essentially, this is going to be the list of the grapes data, which is our uh, data set, right? And here we are going to select the columns that start, at, as we've said, at position three. This position three is the frontal lobe, right? Zero, one, two, three. And it's going to end until the body there. So to select this uh, last but one value, basically the previous one to the last one, we can here use the notation until minus one. In Python, when you use here minus one, you are getting all the values until the uh, element that is previous to the last one. So we are not including the uh, class argument because if we change this to be like this, then we will be including the class column. Since we don't want to include the class column, only until the body depth, we want to include until the element previous to the last one. So here we are use the minus one notation. So with these, these labels for the x axis is going to be the columns from the lobe, rear width, curve base, midline, maximum width, and body depth, which is precisely the relevant features. Now, the next argument on this heat map method is what is called the v minimum and the v maximum. These are the values to ensure the color map. If we don't give them, otherwise they will be inferred from the data that we have. So we are going to select them and to indicate them to this function. Again, these values is to ensure the color map. So we will start with the vmin. This argument is going to be the minimum value, or in other words, since those weights can be negative, it is going to be minus the maximum 
of the absolute value in the principal components. So this is just the my PCA components like this. And then what is going to be the value for the maximum in the range? Well, this value for the maximum is going to be the same, but without the minus, right? Without the minus sign like this. So essentially what we are saying is that these values Vmin and Vmax are values to one short the color map, right? So this color map is going to be in the range from the minimum, which is the, the in negative of the maximum value of the weights on the components, and the maximum is going to be basically the maximum value on the weight of the component. So now the color map is ranged from the values that we have on the data set. Now there's an extra argument in here, which is the annotation. And this argument is a Boolean argument. It can be true or false. If we set this argument to be true, then the data is going to be written, the data value in each cell of the color map. Okay, we are going to visualize the weights inside each cell. And we are going to set this to be true so we can visualize easily those weights. If you set it to be false, there's no problem. However, you will only see the color and not the specific value for itself. We are going to set it to be true. So with this, we have the uh, heat map of these components. So let's run this cell. And as we can see, okay, with this function, we can see the weights that the principal component analysis assigns to each component. For instance, consider the component 0. This component, okay, the PCA assigns a weight of minus 0 0.45 for the frontal lobe, minus 0 0.043 for the rear width, and so on. So, as we can see here, as greater is the weight, okay, as more red is the weight, more important it is this component with this feature. So imagine with this component one. Well, the component one is very, very important because the weight is very big for the rear width. So we can explain a lot of variance of this attribute with this component. Okay, for the component two, we can see that the maximum width is explained a lot because the weight is 0 0.65. Uh, keep in mind that all of those weights range between zero and, and one. Okay, mainly if we don't specify the values, if we specify it, we have our own range that we can see here. It is from minus 0 0.8 until um, the one value. So precisely what we have here is minus one and one. Okay. So here the range of the possible weights is from minus one to one. Uh, the closest is to one, the more important is this attribute for this component, right? Very well. So with all this information, now we can proceed to visualize our data so that we will now transform our data set using the principal component analysis technique. In fact, it's going to be a trained principal component analysis. And generally for the visualization, and this is commonly using two or three components. Okay, so normally two or three components are chosen for the visualization. So here we are going to uh, add a new uh, text window. We are going to set this to be a title and this is going to be PCA transformation and visualization. So this is applying the PCA technique. So let's just also paste here that we can transform now our data set using the trained PCA and we are going to choose two or three components, okay? So let's use for this example three components and let's define this new uh, data set to be transform. So this is going to be the transform data set of the Grubs data set. So to apply the PCA, we need to access the PCA object and use here the function transform of the PCA object. Here we will pass as an argument the data set. So keep in mind that this data set is the standardized data set. So it is Grubs standardized. And we are going to transform only the relevant features, the ones that are continuous variables, right? So we can access here the data columns as the relevant features. So once we have done this transformation, now we have this data set transformed. So now we can define that on the data set scraps, uh, or in this case, grab standardized, we will define three new columns for the three new principal components. 
one for the principal component one, another for the principal component two, and finally the other for the principal component three. So we are going to insert here three new columns. So we add one for the principal component one, another for the principal component two, and finally the one for the principal component three. So these three new columns are going to have the value of the first three components of the transform data. So here we will only define and use the first three columns. We will use all the instances, all the rows, and here we will only use the first three columns. And to represent this in Python, we write here two points and then the number three. This means that we will cover the column zero, column one, and column two, which is basically these three principal components. This stands for all the rows. Very well. So once we have this, let's create a new figure. And we are going to use now a scatter plot. So here, figure is going to be the pie plot. Figure method with this size, 8.8. Eight. And now we are going to use the seaborn scatter plot. So here we just use scatter plot. And let's first visualize the first two components. So here we are going to visualize the first two components of the PCA so that the X axis is going to be the principal component one, the Y axis, the principal component two, right? What is going to be the hue? Well, remember that we need to do this visualization as we did before with the classes. So we need to really visualize the classes of this data set as we did on the previous lesson, right? And we did the initial visualization. So we do the same thing, but here applying the PCA technique. So now the hue is also going to be the class. So here, the hue of the scatter plot is going to be the class feature. And finally, we pass the data. So the data is the graphs standardized. So here we can plot now the scatter plot. Remember that a scatter plot is used to plot data points on a horizontal and vertical axis in the attempt to show how much one variable is affected by another. So before running this cell, keep in mind that this function normally returns a value, but if we don't want to return this to any variable, we can just use here an anonymous variable. This means an anonymous variable in Python, a variable that we will not use at all. We only want the visualization. So let's run this. And before running, let's run this transform data so we can transform like so very well. In fact, if here we want a new code window and now we visualize the standardized uh, data set of the graphs with the first five rows, for instance, we will see now these three new uh, principal components, which is basically these three new attributes, right? This is because we've done this instruction in here. Okay, we've added three new columns that have these uh, values, which is the values of the transform for the first three uh, principal components. Keep in mind that this transform array has the information of the five components, and here we are selecting only the first three, right? So here we have PC1, PC2, and PC3. Very well, once we have this data, and also updated to the grub standardized head, we can visualize the first two components on a scatter plot. So now let's run. And as we can see, here we have the scatter plot on the principal component one, the principal component two, and also this visualization for the classes. The blue points are for the blue male graphs, the orange for the blue female, the green for the orange male, and the red for the orange female. Keep in mind that principal components are created in order of the amount of variation they cover. The, the PC1 captures the most variation, PC2 the second most, and so on. Now, when we do a PCA plot, this plot shows clusters of samples based on their similarity. Because, as we can see, the objective of this project on the graphs dataset is to separate these 200 of graphs into four classes, right, depending on the male, female, and blue-orange. That's why we apply the PCA, the Principal Component Analysis. So, since here, since when we apply the Principal Component Analysis, we can see that the group, the class blue-male, is this one, okay, the, the, the other group blue-female is this one, 
the other class orange male is this one in green all in the same region and finally the orange male uh, orange female is this on red all in the same region so as we can see this separation is precise we have here four groups depending on their similarity so with this we can separate these four classes as the project statement specifies so we can see that the principal component analysis does a good job with this data separating these clusters we are using for this visualization only two principal components right so now to end this principal component analysis visualization let's do the same with three uh, components right so now we are going to visualize this let's put it in here with three components of the pca and to do this we are also going to do a scatter plot but on, but now with three dimensions right we'll have a three dimensional plot so the first thing we are going to define is the mapping between the colors and the classes of these graphs so imagine if we have the class blue female right so this class blue female we will set this to be yellow then the next class blue male we will set this to be with the color blue so we write the b so we are basically mapping each class to a given color then the orange female we are going to set it to be orange so we just add here an o and finally on this final class orange male we are going to use the color green so we just add here a g so this is nothing more than a dictionary it is a mapping that given a class we know its color okay where the classes are the keys and the colors are the values of this dictionary very well so now let's uh, create a new figure as always with the pie plot figure now by definition when we use this method this creates a two-dimensional feature uh, in this case figure if we want to add a third dimension to have a three-dimensional plot then the axis is going to be the figure and we are going to add a new axis so here we just can use here the add uh, subplot method subplot so we want this additional axis to be a grid of one times one so here one times one and we want it to return also the first and only axis object in this grid so that's why here we said one 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 finally we specify the projection and this is where this comes from the three dimension so here we just add 3d for the three dimensional plot very well with this we have the uh, figure in three dimensions prepared now the only thing remains to do is to do this scatter plot to do this we will use the method scatter from the pyplot library now we specify the three axes the x-axis is going to be the component one so we access the graph standardized and we access this column the principal component one the y-axis is going to be the principal component two it is standardized the same here and finally the z axis is going to be equal to this third component and also there's uh, more arguments in here we can also set the depth shade of this scatter plot to be false in the sense of this depth shade basically is the point opacity relative to the depth in the matplotlib three-dimensional plot so if we don't want the points of this plot uh, to have more opacity or to have less opacity depending on their depth to the plot we set this to be false and this is precisely what we will do we're going to visualize all the data in this three dimension uh, without any opacity changes so we define the depth shade to be false so there's no shading in respect to the depth so finally here we define the colors right now remember that here we define that just the scatter plot and the colors were automatic here we define a dictionary that for each class we have a color the blue female yellow blue male blue orange female orange and orange male g so to apply this dictionary inside this color one possible value of the color is to apply essentially this dictionary so we are going to access the data set and the column class and we will apply this mapping process that if we have a given value x okay we will return the value of this color graphs of the x so here color graphs for the value x so keep in mind that what we're doing here precisely is 
for a given class, a given blue female, blue male, orange female, or orange male, we will return and we will apply the color uh, Y, B, O, or G, depending on this value M. So we return here the value of this dictionary. This is a lambda function. We will not go inside how this is implemented, but this is mainly a function that given one single argument, we return this as an output. And this is precisely the color that we will apply for all these scatter plots. Depending on the class we have, we'll have different colors. So this is colors with an S. We end the final parenthesis of the scatter plot. And also here before running, we need to import the uh, possibility of using three-dimensional plots in Matplotlib. So to do this, we just go to the import window. And here we can simply import this configuration. And this is nothing more than a toolkit. And in here, we can do this, for instance, like here. And we just write from the matplotlib tokens, we import from the model uh, three-dimensional matplotlib, we import here the model axis 3D. So we run again this code window, we update the notebook, and now we're ready for running this cell. So we run it. And before running, we're also going to specify the marker size. For instance, let's use a marker size of 800. This as specifies the size of the marker. We run it, and now, as we can see here on the plot, we have the PCA visualization for three principal components. We have that the x-axis is the principal component 1, the y-axis the principal component 2, and the final z-axis the principal component 3. We also have that if we have a crop that is blue female, the color is yellow, so this yellow is the cluster, the group for the uh, blue female. If we have a blue, blue male, this is the color blue, we have this group. Orange female, the color red, we have this other group. And finally, the orange male, we have the color green, which is this other group. So with this principal component analysis visualization with three components, we can also see here all the clusters, all the cluster samples based on their similarity, because our objective in this project is to separate all the four classes. Right, and with this, with the PCA, we have done, and we have done this. First, we did it with two uh, dimensions, with two principal components. We have these four clusters, and this visualization, this separation is even more pronounced with three principal components in this three-dimensional plot. Okay, with this, we separate all the four classes, all these four clusters, with these four groups. We can also visualize those components finally in three dimensions using the Plotlib Python library. This is an interactive open source plotting library that supports many chart types covering a wide range of statistical, financial, geographic, scientific, and three dimensional use cases. So to import the Plotlib, we just go to the import window. We import here the Plotlib Express as the px okay we will use this plotly express library to do this scatter plot and here at the end so we will add now a new uh, code window and now with the plotly express library it is very very easy to create this scatter plot in three dimensions and also much shorter way than before so we are going to define the figure using the plotly express library as the px this is the plotly scatter three dimension this is a method from this library. Here we specify the data. This is the graphs standardized. Then we specify the x-axis. This is the principal component 1. The y-axis is the principal component 2. And finally, the z-axis is the principal component 3, right? What is going to be the color? Well, the color is going to be depending on the class. Okay, if we have one of these classes, depending on the class, we'll have a different color. Very well, and with only this line, only one single line, we can see and construct this uh, scatter plot. So finally, we can just show this with the figure show. With this, we are showing this figure that we have just created. So let's run this. And as we can see, we have here the scatter plot in three dimensions of the four classes. So we have separated these four classes with the principal component one, two, and three. In fact, we can zoom this in, zoom this out. And we can see here the four groups, right? If we have blue male, these colors uh, is for the colors in blue. The red is for the colors in blue female. 
the green is for the orange male class, right? We have also this other cluster, this other group, and the purple for the orange female. So we have here this final group. So with this, we have applied the PCA technique and also done the visualization of the classes with, on one hand, two principal components and also with three components on this PCA. We have done it with the scatter plot for the matplotlib library and also the uh, three-dimensional scatter plot of the PyPlotExpress library. We have separated all four classes of this data set with two principal components and also with three principal components. We remind the student that you can download all this code in this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Okay, here you have available all this notebook from the initial point where we studied all the graphs data set, right? We did our initial visualization of the data and also with the classes, right? And then we applied the principal components technique to reduce these dimensions and we visualized these four classes and we separated these four classes uh, with two components and three components. All of this code and all of this notebook is available for downloading. With this, we end this practice on the dimensionality reduction applying the principal component analysis technique. Hey everyone! On this lesson, we will study in deep the principal component analysis technique. Remember that on the previous lesson, we introduced this technique that allows us to analyze very large data sets containing a high number of dimensions. It also increases the interpretability of the data while preserving the maximum amount of information. So formally, this PCA is a technique for reducing the dimensionality of the data set. Principal component analysis has applications in many fields such as population genetics, microbiome, and atmospheric science. So let's start studying this technique and see how it works. Initially, given a data set, we assume that this data set and the attributes and the features of this data set follow a Gaussian distribution. Keep in mind that Gaussian distribution is another term for normal distribution. Also, the global variance on the data set is preserved, that is, of the variance for all the attributes from the dimension 1, this is the feature 1 of the data set, until the dimension d, this is the total number of dimensions, the total number of attributes, the total number of columns in this data set, then the global variance before applying the principal component analysis technique is the same as the global variance after applying this principal component analysis technique. In PCA, the data is projected onto a set of orthogonal dimensions that they are the components. These components are linear combinations of the original attributes. So, once we have initially the data set, we have the data, we project this data onto a set of orthogonal dimensions. These dimensions are called the components of the PCA, and they are linear combinations of the original attributes of the data set. So here we see a representation on how we can calculate this new dimension Y. This orthogonal dimension Y is nothing more than the linear combinations of the original attributes. Here the original attributes are this x with sub-index d. We know that this dimension is orthogonal, as we see in here, since for each pair of dimensions that we have on the PCA, they will form an angle of 90 degrees, which is a perpendicular angle. Now, the transformed dimensions in PCA are uncorrelated. Remember that correlation in statistics is any relationship, whether casual or not, between two random variables. So, on the PCA technique, these dimensions, transformed dimensions, are uncorrelated. They have no correlation, but also they are not independent. 
So since we know that the correlation, uh, since they are uncorrelated, there is no correlation, then this covariance is equal to zero for two pairs of these transform dimensions. So we can see here that this first y with subindex i is the first transform dimension. This second y with subindex j is another transform dimension. And this is true for any pair of transform dimensions. Something interesting also to know that we can sort these transform dimensions by the information of their variance. So for instance, if the transform dimension y1 has the biggest and the largest variance, then we can sort them in decreasing order in this way. So that we can put identifiers. So here we have the identifier y1, because this is the number one variance, the one that has the biggest variance. This is y2, it is the second with the biggest amount of variance, and so on. Now, this PCA technique computes the projection matrix. For those who don't know, the projection matrix in statistics maps the vector of response values, these are the dependent variable values, to the vector of fitted values, or also named as predicted values. The matrix describes the influence each response value has on each fitted value. So on the PCA, this projection matrix scales and rotates the data to the new orthogonal dimension space. Keep in mind, here we have the, the new transform dimension and the second new transform dimensions. Keep in mind that they are uh, perpendicular, right? They are orthogonal. This will always be like this. They will always form an angle of 90 degrees. So to calculate PCA, there are several ways to derive this method. On this course, we are going to explain the method based on the maximization of variance. So let's begin. We have initially, and suppose we have a data set with a given number of attributes. This data set has been standardized. This means that all the attributes, all the features are centered and they have unit variance. Their variance is one. Their covariance can be defined in this way. So then we assume that there is at least one dimensional space U with dimensionality M less than D defined by a projection matrix B. So when we make the transpose of this projection matrix multiply with this attribute, we have this dimension. And we define B as this projection matrix. Keep in mind that the dimension of B is a matrix that has a total number of D rows and M columns, where the columns of B are perpendicular and also unitary. So you can see this as each value B with subindex I is a base of the space U. This projected data we denoted with this x, with this arrow point, with a subindex n. This projected data obviously will belong to this dimension u. And the coordinates with respect to the base u as z of n, which is this z. This z of n are the coordinates with respect to the base of this dimension u. So here the objective is to obtain the base vectors b and their coordinates z, so that the projected data is as similar as possible to the original data. Also, keep in mind, since we have standardized this data, so the data is centered, the mean of this z is also going to be zero. So we start by looking for the first vector b1 that belongs to the dimension and the set of dimensions d, such that it maximizes the variance when projecting the data. So when looking for this first vector b1, we want to maximize the variance of the first coordinate z1, right? Where the variance of z1 is defined like so. And we also have that the first component z1 of zn is given by this notation which is here the product of the transpose 
of the vector b1 multiplied with the xz. So here we can just substitute this z1 squared to this. Yeah, if we know that z1 of n is equal to the product of b1 transposed with xn, so the variance of z1 is going to be all this with square value, right? So when we make the square of this, this is the same as multiplying the same for the same. So at the end, we have this final expression. However, don't worry for these formulas, since we will do this in this course all in Python. And in Python, there are methods that we can invoke and they do all this work for us. So here we are only introducing the mathematical notation and the mathematical foundations of this because it is important to know, but in reality when we start applying the principal component analysis in data sets in Python, we will do it with procedures that are already predefined. We will do this in the practical part of the course. We are currently in the theoretical section. So now if we want one unique and only one single solution to ensure that we only have one unique solution we need to have the restriction that b1 needs to have length 1 so the problem we must solve is this one we want to maximize the variance subject to this restriction which is precisely that the length of this vector is 1 and this is basically a constraint optimization problem that can be solved using Lagrange multipliers. Again, we are basically looking at the mathematical point of view of this problem and how we can solve it. Remember, to solve this Lagrange, we need to calculate the partial derivatives over the arguments, right? We have here uh, two arguments. We have b1 and lambda, so we calculate the partial derivative of this function uh, as a respect to b1 and also as respect to d lambda 1. And then we equal these equations equal to zero, right? Because we want to find the maximums. And this solution corresponds to the eigenvector of the covariance matrix that we represent with this summation symbol. And the Lagrange multiplier lambda 1 is the corresponding eigenvalue. So here remember that an eigenvector is a linear and a non-zero vector that changes at most by a scalar factor when that linear transformation is applied to it and the corresponding eigenvalue often denoted with lambda is this factor by which the eigenvector is scaled so this is merely for formalization if we have a linear transformation t from a vector space v and v is a non-zero vector then if this value t of v is a scalar multiple of v then v is the eigenvector of this linear transformation t and lambda is this scalar known as the eigenvalue okay this is a very linear algebra concept and very known so with this information we can continue so this allows us to substitute in the goal that we are optimizing so now the variance of z1 is equal precisely to lambda 1 this lake range multiplier which is the eigenvalue so all in all this means that to maximize the variance of the first vector b1 then we must choose the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix and use its first eigenvector this is going to be the first principal component, this first eigenvector that we find. And so to find the rest of the components, we can proceed in the same iterative way, subtracting now the effect of the previous n-1 components, and then imposing that the new component must be also perpendicular to the last component, the last eigenvector that we have found. Keep in mind that all the components here, right, are orthogonal. And so, in the end, we obtain that the components correspond to the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, and the sum of the eigenvalues is going to be the total variance. 
where D is Greek lambda, this is another Greek symbol to represent lambda with another notation. This is a diagonal matrix. Remember that a diagonal matrix is a matrix in which the entries outside the main diagonal are all zero. So we really only have elements in the diagonal and this lambda is going to be the diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues and B is going to be the eigenvectors. As we can see here, B, each value of B, each element in here is the eigenvector. So here we can see a quick example. We have your original these two dimensions. We have this original data. We apply the principal component analysis and now we find the first component along the maximum variance of the data. Once we find this component, this eigenvector, as we can see here with the arrow in red, now we continue in a iterative way with the principal component analysis and then we find the next component. Keep in mind that this next eigenvector needs to be orthogonal, needs to be perpendicular to the previous one. And this happens also in here. And this is the maximum variation vector perpendicular to the other components. So again, this lesson is all about the theory behind the PCA, behind this principal component analysis. It's uh, all about mathematics, really, in, in this lesson. We are now inside the code in Python on how to implement this. We do this on the practical section of this course, where we apply uh, the PCA with different data sets and see how we can do that using Python. So, for this lesson, as a conclusion, if you're using a mathematical notation, right, Keep in mind that since the eigenvalues correspond to the total variance, then it is possible to calculate the proportion that each component represents as the division of the eigenvalue i divided by the sum with the, all the eigenvalues. Also, to establish a stop criteria, we can decide the threshold, we can set a threshold, basically representing how much variance we want to keep, for instance, 90%, and we will discard the remaining components. Also, we can represent the variance of the components in decreasing form. This is commonly known in machine learning as a script plot. A script plot is a line plot of the eigenvalues of factors, or also the principal components in an analysis. Why is this script plot used? Well, this script plot is used to determine the principal components to keep in a principal component analysis. We will talk more about this on the practical part in this course and how we can interpret these script plots. So finally, if we take two or three components, we can visualize the data because we know it is possible to visualize the data in two dimensions and also in three dimensions, right? Now, the quality of this visualization depends mainly on the amount of variance of those components. So, we will study many examples, we will see many examples on this in the practical section of this course, where we will apply this PCA technique, the principal component analysis in Python. Very well. So, for now, this is all about the theory that you need to understand and to know and really to have a quick idea to start implementing the principal component analysis with real data sets in Python. So now just jump on the practical section and we'll begin programming in Python. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will introduce the locally linear embedding algorithm. This is a method of dimensionality reduction. That is, we have a data set, we have a data frame, we have a very high dimensionality. This means we have lots of features, lots of attributes in this data set, and we want to reduce this dimensionality. So for this, we can use the locally linear embedding. This algorithm projects the data into a lower dimensional space with the condition of retaining the distances between neighbors. So that now each example, each instance can be reconstructed by a linear combination of its neighbors. Those are essentially the weights for this algorithm. And with the information of these weights, then a new data set is calculated, 
that preserves this information it preserves the reconstruction in a very lower dimensional space so we have fewer dimensions so for the locally linear embedding we have two arguments the first one is the number k of neighbors that we want to use to calculate this locality and the second one is the value of the dimensions that we want to have at the end also as a precondition this number of dimensions must be less than k minus 1 so here we can use uh, and we can see these two examples with the locally linear embedding method so we have a data set okay this data set has classes it has clusters in it and we can visualize those clusters we can visualize those clusters and these groups and see how they are separated with this algorithm for instance we can see here a group in red this correspond to a class in our data set then we have another in orange we also see that this orange class is separated of these two we have another yellow class then a white blue a dark blue and finally this purple so with this we can see the separation between classes in the same way we can see it here on this plot with the form of an s so on the next lesson we will study this algorithm and the steps that we need to follow for this introduction lesson you only need to know that this algorithm the locally linear embedding algorithm is a method for dimensionality reduction in a data set so given a data set with lots of dimensions we can reduce this dimensionality preserving the information and also visualize all the classes inside this data set with these fewer dimensions this will allow us a very better and easier visualization on the next lesson we will study this algorithm hey everyone on this lesson we are going to learn the steps that we need to follow to use the locally linear embedding algorithm remember this is a dimensionally deep reduction algorithm that is we have a data set with high dimensionality and we want to reduce these dimensions so the way this works is that this algorithm is going to project the same data but now into a lower dimensional space preserving the distances between neighbors so for each data we will calculate the neighbors we have here as an argument this value k and also the value and number for the desired dimensions and the way that we do this is the following first for each data that we have on the data set for each instance we are going to find the first k nearest neighbors in the original dimensional space this is basically the the original dimensions that we have on this data set once we have this k nearest neighbors we are going to approximate each of the data by a linear combination of these neighbors remember that these weights okay each weight that we assign uh, if we sum all of the weights for given data this needs to be equal to one okay so as we can see here each weight is a proportion and the sum of all the weights for a given data is equal to one also here it is important that the k nearest neighbors that we find this value k is less than the original dimension space that we have and so now to find this new data on this new dimension space let's just call this new data y with subindex i which is the same subindex that we have here on this data on the original dimension space then to find this y we need to minimize the square distance between this new value y with subindex i when we subtract the approximation of the weights and this is essentially it we can see an example from a two-dimensional space into a one-dimensional space also something that we have not mentioned but is important is that the eigenvalue decomposition can be used to calculate the coordinates we'll see this when we get to the project of the linear embedding and the locally linear embedding so as we can see initially we have this data we calculate here the three nearest neighbors in this case it is this one this one and this one here we have the weight one the weight two and the weight three so we have one weight for each neighbor the weight depends directly on the distance of this data and this data that we're calculating right so this data here is this data xi so this is going to be an approximation 
of each of the other datums, basically the neighbors, multiplied by their weights. And at the end, we will have this same data, but now on this new dimensional space with only one dimension. And this new dimension, this same data, is going to be an approximation of the summatory and the summation of all the other data multiplied by their weight in the same way, but now in this new dimensional space. So as we can see, this method preserves the distances between the neighbors. Now, in the following lessons, we will apply in practice this method, this locally linear embedding algorithm, to reduce the high dimensionality of a given data set. Hey everyone, on this lesson, we will introduce the data set that we will work with in this practice. The name of this data set is Scraps, it is a CSV file. You can download this data set on the downloadable resources of this lesson. So, in essence, it is a data set that has an information of the graphs. It is taken from a paper published by Campo. Campo was a researcher that studied rock graphs in the 1974, mainly the rock graphs for the genus Leptograpsus. One species, the Leptograpsus variegatus, had split into two new species, previously grouped by color orange and blue. So the preserved specimens lose their color, so it was hoped that the morphological differences would allow the museum material to be classified. So this is a practice about dimensionality reduction, right? We'll apply a technique, a method, to reduce the dimensionality of this data set. So on this lesson, we will introduce the data set. We will see what are the columns, what are the features of this data set, which information we have. So then on the following lessons, we can proceed with the technique. So the data uh, are available on 50 specimens of its sex and species. So we have a 200 total crabs collected in Fremantle, Western Australia. So each specimen has the measures on, and here we have the attributes. The first one is the frontal lobe width, then we have the rear width of the crab, the length along the midline of the carapace, the maximum width of the carapace of the crab, and finally the depth body length in millimeters, plus the color of the crab, in other words, the species, and also the sex. So now let's create a new notebook in Google Colab to start working. We already explained on the code environment setup section how we could create a new Google Colab notebook. So let's do it. We have just created a new Google Colab notebook. The name of this notebook we have set it to be introduction to the data set. Later we will change and modify this when we start applying the dimensionality reduction technique. So first of all, let's load this data set in the notebook. To do this, we will need to import some libraries in Python. So here, first of all, we are going to add a text window. Let's call it, for instance, import of libraries. We are going to use also a here hashtag notation. When you use a hashtag in a text window, you are representing a heading or a header or a title, okay, depending on the title 1, 2 or 3, depending on the number of hashtags, we are going to put here a title 3. So here we have the import of libraries, right? So we are going to start by importing the pandas library. The pandas library is a software library written for the Python programming language for data manipulation and analysis. It offers data structures and operations for manipulating numerical tables and time series. So we will need to import the pandas because this data frame, this data set grabs CSV, okay, we will need to import this as a pandas data frame, a pandas data set. So we are going to work with pandas. That's why here the first thing that we need to do is to import the pandas library as PD, right? And now, since we also want to load a CSV file, we will need to import the input and output library. So we will be able to import and load files from our computer. So now finally, to be able to load files for the Google Colab notebook, we just here import from the Google Colab. We are going to import files like so. So now we run this cell. 
with this uh, run we have all the imports done and now we can just proceed to load uh, this uh, CSV file. So in our case, you just go to this lesson on the downloadable resources. You go to the Krebs CSV. You download this file. Once you have this file on your computer, here keep in mind that you have a folder in, in this directory of the Google Colab Notebook. So here we just click it. This is the files that we have loaded. For now, we have not loaded anything. We just have the sample data that Google Colab provides to us. So to load this CSV inside this notebook, we will do this in a new code window. And we will do this with the files module upload method. So here we are going to create a new variable. Let's just say uploaded. This is going to be equal to the files upload method. So with this, we are able to load a new CSV or any other file that we want inside our notebook. So let's run this. We uh, click run. Now, as we can see, this option appears to us. Choose files. We are going to cl click here. And so it is going to open your file explorer in your operating system. So we just browse for the Grubs data set and we double click here or just click open. And now, as we can see, we have loaded this Krabs CSV file. We can just go to the files in the notebook and we see here the Krabs CSV. So we are able now to work with this file. So now let's do an initial study and initial exploration of this data set before applying any dimensionality reduction technique. This we will do this on the following lessons. Now this is only an introduction to this data set. So let's add here new text window and let's name this window the initial study of the data set. So let's load this CSV as a data set, as a pandas data set. So to do this, let's name a variable. Let's name it grabs data, for instance, to be the data set of the grabs. And now we are going to use the pandas and we are going to use the method read CSV with an underscore between read and CSV. So now we pass as an argument the name of the file, the name of the CSV. As we can see, this grabs CSV. So we pass the name as the string. So this is grabs dart CSV. So now we can run this very well. So with this, we have loaded onto this variable. Now we have the data set for this variable grabs data. We can visualize the first rows of this data set with the head method of pandas. So here, if we just write grabs data head, with this, we can visualize the first five rows. So we can have, we have one attribute for the species, uh, B stands for blue, right? The other option is O, that is orange. We also have an attribute for the sex, a feature for the index, a feature for the frontal lobe, rear width, curve base, midline, right? Which is abbreviated with CL. Then we have the CW, which is the maximum width of the curve base. And finally, the body length, which is here D depth body length, abbreviated with BD. And so we have this data set, right? We have the initial data set with the columns and their names. However, let's improve the understanding of this data set before applying any dimensionality reduction. Let's rename the name of these columns. Instead of using the abbreviation, let's just use the total name. And also here for the values B, that stands for blue, M that stands for male, and also here we can use the tail to see the last five column uh, rows in this case. Also, instead of O that stands for orange, and instead of F that stands for female, we are going to change this to map D values that is the total word. Instead of O, we want to see orange, instead of F, we want to see female. And the same way, if we use here we see the head, this gives us the first five col uh, rows. We want male instead of M, and also blue instead of b so on one side we want to rename the name of the columns and also change these values of this mapping for the columns species and sex so something we have not mentioned but here if we just write tail this will give you the five last elements okay keep in mind that you have a total of 200 elements in fact you can use here the shape if you just run now this gives you the dimension of this data set. We have 200 instances, 200 rows, and a total of eight columns. These eight columns are, as we can see here, this uh, eight that we see, right? From the species to the body depth. 
So let's start by renaming the column. So now we are going to rename the columns. To do this, we are going to update this data set such that now the new data set with the new name is going to be updated. We are going to rename the data set that we have now and we are going to rename the column. So here we are going to only remain, uh, in this case, uh, rename and change the column names. And to do this, it is very simple and easy. We just here type a dictionary with the old value, which is the key, and the new value, which is the value of this uh, dictionary key, right? So here we have one to add species. This is going to change this column uh, SP, which is this one, to species. The same thing we can do with the frontal lob, right? These two we are not going to change because they are easy to understand, both of them. But now the FL, we want to change this FL. So FL is going to be changed and renamed to the frontal lob. This is going to be the frontal lob. Then the R W attribute is going to be changed and renamed to the rear width. This is going to be the rear width. And we can continue doing this for everyone. We change the name of this L to be the Kerpace midline of CW to be the maximum width. And from the BD, we go to the body depth. Right, we are going to also change this and erase the last key and the last bracket. Let's just suppose this from this until here in a new line so you can visualize. Very well, now we hope that now it is easy to see everything. We just change this older name to be this new name, this old name to be this new name and so on. So now we are going to run this uh, code cell, right? And now we are going to add now a new cell to visualize this change and verify that we have changed correctly the names of the columns. So again, we can just write grubs data head. The change has not uh, affected the name, right? The name is the same. We run this cell. And now as we can see the columns, okay, have updated their names. Instead of SP, we have species. Instead of FL, we have frontal lob. Instead of RW, we have rear width and so on. Now, the other thing that we wanted to do as well is to change the mapping between B for being blue, M for being male. And in the same way, if we check the last ones, instead of O, we want the orange and instead of F, we want the female. So now instead of changing the names of the columns, we want to change the mapping for the values. So the way to do this is the following. We access the columns that we want to change. In this case, first, we want to change the species, right? So here we just type species we want to change uh, instead of b to be blue instead of o to be orange so we are going to update this column to be the grubs data species but now we are mapping and this is important here we are adding a map because we are changing the values not the names of the columns and again here we pass a dictionary as an argument here we have the old value so instead of b we want to have blue Instead of all, we want to have orange. Write this as a no. And the same thing stands for this uh, feature, this column of the sex. So here we access this column data with the column sex. We are going to update this column to be a mapping. So again, we access this column and with the map. And now instead of M, we want to be male. Right, so here we change for male, and instead of F, we want female, so we just change this to be female, like so. Very well, so now let's run this code cell. Once we have run this, let's update this uh, Kurab's data head and verify that now the values are changed. So we run this, and as we can see, we have precisely done that. Instead of B, we have blue, instead of M, we have male, and if we check the last uh, elements in this data set, the last instances of the Kurab's. Instead of O, we have orange. Instead of F, we have female. Pretty easy, right? Very well. So once we have introduced to this data set, the objective of this practice is to separate the 200 crabs that we have in this data set into four different classes, four different groups or four different clusters, right? given by their sex and given by their species. So we can have one class that is male blue, another it is male orange, then we have another female blue and another female orange. So we have four classes. 
And we will need to do this with a dimensionality reduction technique. So let's add here a new text window. And now let's paste here the objective. So here the goal is to separate these 200 instances of graphs into four classes, right? And this is what we are going to do on the following lesson using the dimension reduction and the dimensionality reduction technique of this section. See you on the following lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will use the locally linear embedding method to reduce the dimensionality of the data set that we have and also have a visualization with the components in this new dimension space. So remember that on the previous lesson, we introduced this data set. It was a data set about crabs. We have a total number of 200 instances, a total of 200 crabs. And the objective of this practice is to separate those crabs into four classes, depending on the sex and the species. So we have male blue, female blue, male orange, female orange. So in this lesson, we will apply the locally linear embedding technique. So, remember from the previous lesson, we had created this notebook in Google Colab, right? Where we introduced this data set. We also rename the name for the columns and also the values of the species and sex features. So, the first thing we are going to do is to rename the name of this notebook. Let's just say using locally linear embedding. So the objective is to separate these 200 grams into four classes, right? Given their sex and their species, right? So here, before applying the locally linear embedding, the first thing we need to do is to create a new column inside this data set that is going to be a column for the class. So we'll have four classes. So to do this, let's add a new code window. Now we are going to create this new column in the data set. So then we can use the LLE, the locally linear embedding method, depending on this column, depending on the class, right? So we are going to add a new column on the data set. We just write the name of the data set. Here we write the new column name. This is class. Keep in mind that this column does not exist yet in this data set. We are going to create it. So what is going to be the value of the class of a given crab? Well, as we see here, this depends on the sex of this crab and the species of this crab. So this is going to be a concatenation. First, we access the species of the crab, and we concatenate this with the sex of the crab, like so. So once we do this, let's run this uh, cell, right? Once we have run this uh, window, we can verify that this data set is updated. So let's add a new code window and let's just check, for instance, the first five elements of this data set. We run this and as we can see here, we have a new column uh, for the class. Okay, this class attribute now is the concatenation of the species of the crab plus the sex. For instance, this crab with identifier zero is of the species blue and sex male, so the class is blue male. If we access here uh, one of the last elements, so we just access the tail of this data set. For instance, the grab 896 has the species orange and sex female. So the class of it is going to be orange female. Very easy, right? So with this, we have this new class. Something we can also do is to count how many different uh, instances of each class we have. To do this, we can just access the class column like so and here we just type value counts this is going to return how many instances how many crabs we have for each class so let's run this here the class is data sex like so we run again and as we can see with this instruction the crab value uh, counts we see that we have a total of 50 blue male crabs 50 blue female 50 orange male and 50 orange female so this is the total distribution. In fact, that this is also something that they have uh, specified on the statement, right? We have five specimens of each sex and of each species. Very well, now we have this new column in here. 
okay if we update this again let's just run this this is going to be updated we have this new column class that basically represents the class of this graph so this new column is important because we are going to apply the locally linear embedding method depending on this class because we want to separate the instances we want to separate all the elements of this data set in this case all the graphs depending on their classes so let's add here a new section uh, the name of this section is going to be uh, locally linear embedding right and here where are we going to apply this method in which features well we can see that in this data set uh, the only relevant features that we will apply are these ones okay total number of five features frontal lobe, rear reef, curve pace midline, maximum width and body depth. Keep in mind that these features are these measurements that we have here on the introduction to the data set. These are the features that we will study. They are continuous values. They are continuous variables, right? We have a very wide range. And also they are numerical values. So we can apply the locally linear embedding. There is no way we can apply here this method to the species value, for instance, because this is a Boolean value. In fact, it is a categorical value where this can be orange or blue. Okay, well, there is not a continuous value here. In the same way, the sex is a binary value. It is also a categorical variable that ranges from female to male. But this is not a continuous variable. And the same for the index and the same for the class. Keep in mind that the index is merely an identifier, the same thing that we have here in the column zero. And finally, the class is also a categorical variable. So we cannot apply here because this is not a continuous numerical value. So in fact, this is what the problem statement specifies, the, the, the data set introduction specifies. We only have these measurements. The only relevant features that we need to study are these ones. So now we are going to define these data columns in here. Okay, this is going to be the relevant features. So here we are going to define data columns. These are going to be the relevant features. So we just copy this and we paste. And as we can see, we can separate those as a list, as an array, like so. The same for the query base midline with the maximum depth, and in this case width, and the body depth, like so. So with this, we are defining what are the relevant features that we will apply the locally linear embedding. Okay, so here, let's just run this very well. Also, we'll see how the classes are separated depending on these features. Okay, for instance, a crab that is orange female can have different values for these features. Uh, a crab that is another class, for instance, if we just here type head, we can see different classes because we, we study the first five. A blue male, for instance, can have different values of these measurements. So we will study this separation. We will visualize this separation applying this dimensionality reduction technique, which is the locally linear embedding. So here it is important to know that this method projects the data into a lower dimensional space, trying to preserve the distances between the neighbors. So this method is based on local distances. We preserve the local structure. So when we are working with distances, it is very important that all variables have the same range. So we don't have any out of layer or out of range value. Otherwise, a variable with large values could confuse the model. So to avoid these problems, we are going to use here the mean max scalar. The mean max scalar is, is an estimator that transforms all the features by scaling each feature to a given range. So all different features will have the same range for that feature. So this min max scalar is a procedure that belongs to the scikit-learn library. So we'll need to import this library. We can do this on this same window, but also on the beginning window of the import of libraries. So this library, scikit-learn, is a free software machine learning library for the Python programming language. It features various classification, regression, and clustering algorithms, including many tools. So we will use this library to apply the min max scalar. So basically, we transform the feature in the same range. So to import the min max scalar, we just hear from the scikit-learn, and we write it like so: scikit-learn in this way. Period preprocessing. We are going to import the min max 
scalar procedure very well just like this so we run again so we update the notebook now the notebook is up to date and now here let's define a new data set that will have this new range we are going to name this data set uh, min max for instance because we will use here the min max scalar initially this data set will have the same value as the original data set so we will make a copy okay with this you can make a copy of a given data set in pandas and then we will apply this method the min max scalar only on the measurements right only on the relevant features so we are going to access these relevant features in the min max data set so here we just write data columns keep in mind that on the variable data columns we have all the information of the relevant columns the relevant features this is going to be equal to the min max scalar method so min max scalar then we write here fit transform because we want to transform this data and now as an argument we pass this scrubs data data columns like so so this we are passing only okay the values of the measurements only the relevant features again because this array contains all the relevant columns to study very well so let's run this cold window all right we have read uh, run this so let's now visualize this new data set so grabs min max for instance head we can see the five first elements so let's run this and what happens well now as we can see we have here that all the measures have the same range they do have the same range in fact we can here just uh, write 20 so we can see the first 20 values okay and we can see that these values ranges from 0 to 1 so they do all have the same range this is because when you apply the min max scalar method um, one argument that you can choose is the feature range you can change this instead of 0 to 1 to be from minus 1 to 1 from minus 10 to 10 and so on uh, keep in mind that if you don't write anything the default is going to range from 0 to 1 and this is what we are going to establish on this situation okay we don't write anything because we want the values to be from 0 to 1 here the important thing is that they do have the same range it is not necessary that they have from 0 to 1 they can have another range but they need to have and they must have the same range for this situation we will choose a range from 0 to 1 this will work fine as we can see here they do all have the same range uh, we can even uh, see here the tail the last 20 elements right and as we can see the last element is the one that has the the greatest value of these measurements it has uh, one one on the frontal lobe and rear width almost one on the curve base midline a 0 0.95 0 0.94 of the maximum width and 0 0.98 for the body depth very well let's clear this output we can just right click uh, clear output we are going to remain this to be only the first five elements when we want to very well once we have this data scaled all in the same range all the relevant features in the same range we can now proceed to apply the locally linear embedding method now this method belongs also to the scikit-learn library so to do this method and to apply this algorithm we need to import here from the scikit-learn library we need to access the model of manifold this is manifold and now we can import in here the locally linear embedding as we can see it appears already for us like so with this we apply this procedure and we can import this procedure and so we can use it on this notebook so we run this we update this uh, import and now we're ready to use this uh, method and also another library that we will import just now that we will need is the Seaborn library. This library, Seaborn, is a library that will allow us to do different plots in Python. So it is a plotting library. To do it, we just import the Seaborn library as S and S, like so. And then another library that we will use also is the matplotlib library. This library, matplotlib, is a very extensive and comprehensive library for creating static, animated, and interactive visualization in Python. In fact, the library Seaborn uses matplotlib, right? So we can extend with the Seaborn, but in fact, this Seaborn uses matplotlib underneath. To import this matplotlib library, we just write as simple as matplotlib dart pyplot as 
PLT. We are going to import the PyPlot object of myplotlib that will allow us to do many figures. So we are going to run this again. We update this import and now we come here and we are ready to visualize all the results that we will have with the locally linear embedding. And also since we have imported this library and oh, this procedure for the from the scikit-learn library, we can also apply this algorithm right so we are going to apply this algorithm and see all the visualizations we have everything ready before applying this locally linear embedding also keep in mind that on the grubs min max you can describe your data and you can see this range uh, between zero and one uh, okay more precisely for instance here if we just write the scribe of this data set we can see that for instance uh, for all the measurements the minimum value is zero okay the maximum value is one and they range from this value. Here in the same way that we read, okay, the minimum is zero, maximum one, minimum zero, maximum one, and so on. That we did not have this, okay, before when we uh, had not applied this mean max scalar. So this we can see it more precisely even, right? So we are going to change this for head. We are going to clear the output. And now let's apply the locally linear embedding. So like here we are going to use locally linear embedding so we are going to use this method let's define a variable with the name of lle for the abbreviation of the locally linear embedding algorithm and now we are going to use this algorithm so like so we just here write locally linear embedding okay we are going to use this procedure now the first argument we have here is the number of components this number of components is essentially the number of dimensions, the number of the di desired dimension in this lower space. So we are going to start with two. So we want to reduce the dimensions that we have initially, right? Which is basically this, uh, this data set with the relevant features. We want to reduce those relevant features to only two components, only two dimensional space. Remember that this number of dimensions was one of the arguments on the input for this algorithm, right? This We have just specified this value D. This number of components is this value D of the desired dimensions. And now we need to specify also the number of neighbors that we are going to calculate the locality. This is the number K. And this is the second argument in this input. So keep in mind that this method in Python essentially applies the same algorithm idea that we have explained on the theory lessons. We are going to choose for this example a total neighbors of 15. This is the number of neighbors that we will consider for each point for each data in this data set. Essentially for each grab in this data set of grabs. Very well, this is going to return an object itself on the locally linear embedding and now we can apply this algorithm on this data set. Keep in mind that this is not applying anything to any data set, we're just building this configuration of the locally linear embedding algorithm and now to apply this algorithm we just here define a new data set grabs lle and this is going to be the uh, fit transform so here we just apply lle which is this variable right fit transform and now we are going to fit this on the data set which is the grabs min max where we have the data ranged Min max, and here we are only going to apply this on the relevant features, like so. Very well, with this we are going to apply this technique. We can also calculate the reconstruction error for each action and to get a total reconstruction. Keep in mind that with these weights of this distance that we calculate for each uh, data around this uh, value that we are studying, right? Given a point, given a data, we calculate in this case the 15 nearest neighbors, and each of them has its weight and so we calculate all these weights and now a new data set is calculated with all these uh, data points in this data set that preserves the reconstructions in a space with fewer dimensions so we can calculate the error of this right we are always going to have a given margin of error and the less and the smaller is the error the better is the fitting on this lower dimensional space so to calculate the reconstruction error after applying this method, we can just print here the reconstruction error. So this is the reconstruction error. This is going to be equal. 
and we can access this value with the object LLE reconstruction error like so this is the reconstruction error associated with the embedding also apart from printing this reconstruction error keep in mind that this here is going to return this data set this data set will have only two columns the two components right so this is going to return the two components with the values so we can now add on the data set two new columns for the components these columns can be the locally linear embedding one locally linear embedding two so this is the components right the dimensions so here on the grabs min max data set we are going to add two new columns and the way to do this we just here add the component LLE1 and then the component LLE2. These are the two new columns that we are going to add in the data set and this is going to be precisely what this returns, so this variable in here. Keep in mind that this uh, is a data set with two columns, so we are adding two new columns to have this value. Very well, now we are not going to visualize yet this uh, component dimension, we'll do this in the, in the next window. First let's just run this window. So as we can see, the reconstruction error is 2.15 times 10 raised to minus 6, right, in scientific notation. So this is a very, very low error. So the separation is good. In fact, we can also visualize here, before visualizing this two-dimensional space and the separation between classes, which is precisely what we have to do, right? We can see these two new columns on this uh, data set. So here we can just write the grabs min max head we can execute again this and as we can see we have here two new columns if we zoom a bit out as we can see we have this column locally linear embedding one this is the first component locally linear embedding two which is a second component this second dimension so we have reduced the data set of the relevant features keep in mind that this data set was essentially these uh, columns in here. So we had five dimensions and we reduced it uh, in the two dimensional space, right? So once we have these two new dimensions, we here can plot, let's zoom this a bit in again, and we can visualize this new dimensional space. And to do this, we are going to use matplotlib for the visualization. It is very easy. We just create a new figure with the fig method from pyplot so here we just write plt keep in mind that this is the pyplot right pyplot as plt so we access here pyplot we write figure this is going to create the figure we can also specify the size of this figure let's just uh, specify a size of 8 width and 8 height this is going to be okay and now we are going to do a scatter plot to visualize this data so we need to access here the seaborne Remember that we imported the Seaborn as SNS, so here that's why we're writing SNS. Here we write scatterplot. The x value for this scatterplot is going to be the first dimension, the first component, right? The second value, the second dimension, that is the second component. Now, remember for those who don't know that a scatterplot is used to plot data points on a horizontal and vertical axis in the attempt to show how much one variable is affected by another. So here we are going to study how the variable y is affected by the variable x, so how the second component, the second dimension is affected by the first component, the first uh, dimension, and now what is going to be the hue, that is the separation criteria, how we are going to separate the groups, based on what? Well precisely based on their classes right we want to separate the graphs into four classes so here the hue the separation criteria is going to be the class this is precisely this uh, column in here this class column okay depending if we have a graph of one class or another we'll have this separation in colors in fact the scatter plot is going to be different colors for different uh, classes that we have here in total four classes right finally the final argument on the scatter plot is the data what is the data set well the data set is the grabs min max so here grabs min max right keep in mind that this is basically those values that are range that we have used the min max scale 
So now we're ready to plot this. So let's run this cell. And as we can see precisely, we see here, and within this plot, we can see this separation between the classes. We have on one side the class blue male. These points are blue, so we can see here that we have one cluster, right? We have one group in here. All of them are together. So this means that they will have similar values for the relevant features. Keep in mind that all these five attributes dimension, we have translated these into only two dimensions. So this means that they are related. So the blue male crop is going to have all of the blue male crops are going to have relevant and similar values for the relevant features. The same happens with the blue female. We can see this separation here. All of them, okay, seems to be on the same group in here. These are another cluster. So they will have also similar values for the relevant features. We can also visualize this with the orange female. As we can see here, the orange female, they all will have relevant and similar values for the relevant features. Finally, these in green, the orange male, all of them seem to be in the same group, okay, on the same cluster, so they can be separated. And as we can see on this green group for the orange male, they will all have the similar relevant feature values. It is also uh, easy to see that, for instance, the blue male and the blue female can share some of the relevant features because they seem to be near to each other, right? And in the same way, the orange male and the orange female seem to uh, share some of the feature values because they are also uh, near to each other. And this is mainly what this locally linear embedding is used for, to reduce the dimensionality of our data set and visualize this separation and this similarity. Now, we have chosen only two components. But we can also here visualize very well with this, we achieve the objective of this practice, which is to separate this total data set of 200 grams into four classes and visualize this separation using the dimensionality reduction technique, which is the locally linear embedding. Now, on the following lesson, we are going to do the same thing, uh, separate these classes and visualize these classes, but with only and not only two components, but now with three components, okay? And normally, when you want to separate those classes, you choose between two and three, okay, for visualization. So on this lesson, we do this with two dimensions, and in the following lesson, we will also apply this locally linear embedding algorithm with three dimensions. We remind the student that you can download all this code and all the notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will use the locally linear embedding method but now with three dimensions. So remember from the previous lesson that we separated these classes, these four classes into groups, into clusters, and we use only two components, right? So here uh, we were working in a two-dimensional space. So on this lesson, we are going to use three components. So let's first change the name of this notebook. Let's, for instance, write LLE with three dimensions. Very well. Remember that we have this data set. We have these relevant features. They are also already ranged. We did this on the previous lesson, right? And now, instead of only creating these two new components, we want to create three uh, new attributes that are going to be the components of the locally linear embedding. So we are going to reduce this uh, dimensional space of five measurements, five features, into three components in order to visualize this data depending on the class, right? So let's do this in here. Let's create a new text window. Let's name this to be the locally linear embedding using three dimensions. So initially, let's build the locally linear embedding construction. We are going to do it in the same way as we did before, right? With the same method. However, here we are going to change the number of components instead of two to be three in this case. So here we just paste this. 
here we change the number of components to be three. So we're going to visualize these three components in three dimensions. So now let's get these three components applying to this data set. So let's call this grab LLE for these three components. And now we are going to use this object and we are going to fit the algorithm on this data set and here we just specify the data set so remember that this data set we need to apply the locally linear embedding on the relevant features those relevant features are five the frontal lobe rear width curve base midline maximum width and body depth and we already specified those relevant features on the data columns as we can see here right the data columns variable has the relevant columns right the relevant features that we are going to apply this locally linear embedding so here we are going to use the grabs min max remember that we did this min max basically for ranging all those values from zero to one right all those values on these measurements now are from zero to one we did this on the previous lesson so here we access this data set only now these columns here which is the data columns so here we just write data columns right very well with this we will get the three components so now we are going to create three new components instead of only creating two now we are going to create three new uh, components right the linear the locally linear embedding one two and three so here we are going to access the data set that is range which is the min max and here we are going to create the locally linear embedding one this is the first component the first column that we are going to create locally linear embedding two and the locally linear embedding three like so and this is going to be equal precisely to the grabs locally linear embedding keep in mind that this is going to return three components so here we are creating three components and assigning them to this value now, some people may say, well, but now you only need to create one more because the previous two were already created before. Well, but keep in mind that there is no problem because here when we use th the number of components to be three, we are going to include the two previous ones that we had and also the new third one. So the previous two are going to be the same. Okay, here we are only adding this new one, which is this. Very well. Now, before continuing here it is important to visualize the reconstruction error remember that this reconstruction error was the reconstruction error when embedding on the algorithm so here we were using the number of components to be two and we had this error so now let's print the same thing with three components so it is not complex to see here that this error here is going to be different from the previous one Right, so let's run this and see which reconstruction error we have. So we have here 1.52 times 10 to the power of minus 5, so in scientific notation. So as we can see, here we have uh, to the power of minus 6, so this reconstruction error is smaller than this one. Right? This is because we are using different number of components. In fact, we can change this for... To just see the error okay keep in mind that this line is going to be executed now and like so we have this error so now let's say five okay so we have this other error so it isn't complex to say that as we increase the number of components the error is also increased right for instance if we only have one component then this error is to the power of minus seven which is a smaller so we are going to use three on this exam. So we already have the reconstruction error. Now we are going to also uh, execute this cell, right? In this line. Let's visualize these three new columns in the data set for now. So grabs, min, max, head. With this, we can see the first five elements. So let's run this. And now, as we can see here, we see these three uh, components that we have created, right? We have here the component uh, one the component two and the component three so this is uh working correctly in the same way when we come here and we go above what is going to happen well as we can see the first column of the created component and the second one here they are the same 
okay they have not changed they are the same because we are applying the same locally linear embedding algorithm now we are creating and adding a new column which is the locally linear embedding 3 for the third dimension and the third component right this is the new in this three dimensions so now let's proceed to visualize in the same way that we visualize the separation of the classes on the previous lesson using two components using two dimensions let's do the same thing but now visualizing with three dimensions so to do this we are going to create a new figure uh, with the matplotlib we can do this in the same window or in another one let's do this in another one so let's create a new figure with the pi plot there's something that we've already worked with in this course and now let's establish the figure size to be for instance 8 per 8 so 8 width 8 height right and now let's define a 3 projection axis to do this we can use here the figure adds a plot of matplotlib we want this axis the the z axis to be one times one grid and also to return a value output of one so that's why we use here three ones okay you can read about the documentation of this function but essentially is when we create this axis it is an axis that is a one times one grid and returns only one value so the projection of this axis is going to be three-dimensional so here we just write the projection to be 3d very well now let's proceed to apply a scatter plot in the same way that we've done this scatter plot here okay however we are not going to use seaborn we are going to use pi plot because we want to visualize this in three dimensions so in fact we are going to visualize in two different ways using three dimensions this is going to be the first one okay so the idea is we're going to use pi plot the name of the method is a scatter to see a scatter plot now we specify the three axes and the three uh, variables the x the y and the z so what is going to be the x remember the x is going to be here the component uh, linear embedding one we can see it also in here if we again let's write the new grabs min max head okay with this we can see this three components so the x variable is going to be the linear embedding one so here on the x we just write grabs min max and to access this column we write a period and the name of the column in this case linear embedding one locally linear embedding one right the y is going to be the linear two so here is min max period locally linear embedding two like so this is the second uh dimension right the linear two this one here and now finally the z axis we need to specify the z and this is going to be the crops min max locally linear embedding three right which is here this uh, third dimension we see here on this data set now more options that we can set on the skater plot since this is a three-dimensional plot okay we can define here the depth shade now what is this depth shade in here the depth shade well this depth shade basically establishes that when we have the points in three dimensions their opacity is going to be relative to their depth so essentially the point opacity is going to be relative to the depth of this point by definition this is set to true we don't want to use this we want all the points to have the same opacity okay the same transparency so we are going to set this to be false okay this is called the depth shade with lowercase like so you know finally here the last argument is the colors of the points so here in the same way that when we plotted the two-dimensional view and the separation of these classes using only two components we saw that the class blue male was blue the blue female was orange right the green was for orange male and the red for orange female so how can we do the same thing using three dimensions well we specify this on these colors so to do this we will define a mapping so a dictionary that for each possible value of the colors we will have a given color in this skater plot in three dimensions so we are going to define this to be colors graphs and here we are going to specify the colors for each class so as we can see to to follow the same criteria the blue male needs to be blue the blue female orange the orange male green and 
the orange female red. So let's do this in here. On this dictionary, we are going to define that the class blue female is going to be yellow. So here we just specify Y. Uh, in, in the PyPlot scatter, when you set the color to be Y, or just this, if you just use this, then all the points are going to be yellow. Okay, so here we are setting the blue female class to be yellow. Very well. In the same way, we set the blue male to be the color blue. Then we continue with the orange female class. This is going to be the color red. So as we can see, essentially, those classes are the keys for the dictionary. And those colors here are the values of this dictionary. So finally, we have here the orange male that has the color green, right? And we end here the bracket for the dictionary, like so. So now we are going to define the colors depending on the class of this data. If a crab belongs to the blue female class, it's going to be yellow. If a crab belongs to the uh, orange female, it's going to be red, and so on. So we are going to access the crab's data class. And here we are going to apply what is known as a lambda function. This is a function that is going to receive an argument x. And it is going to return the value on this dictionary color scraps. So here, color scraps. And then here we just write x like this. So as we can see, essentially what we are doing here is this is a lambda function. This is a function that given one argument x, given a value, okay, or, or a string or anything, we are going to return, okay, the value in this dictionary for this key. So it is not complex to see that here the X are going to be the keys, blue female, blue male, orange female, orange male. And here what we are going to return are going to be the values for the keys. So Y or blue or red or green. So as we can see, we are going to access the class of this uh, data. Once we have that class, we have this value X, the key. So given this value x, which is going to be the key, we are going to return the values, which is these values in here for the colors, like so. And with this, we can define the same criteria that we defined before using three dimensions. Very well. Now the final argument that we are going to set here is the size of the markers. Basically, each point is going to have a marker size. Let's just say this size to be 800. Also, here we must close the lambda function notation that we apply once we finish this uh, parenthesis here we add the last parenthesis to close the first one very well with this scatter plot now we can visualize in three dimensions the separation of the classes which is precisely the objective of this practice we are going to use the locally linear embedding technique using now three dimensions so let's perform this visualization let's run this cell and as we can see in here okay we have the three-dimensional plot of the separation of the classes. We can see that the blue male crabs are the, the points, the data, with the marker in blue. Then we have the class blue female that is in yellow. We have here another group. The orange female with this group in red. And finally, the orange male to be here, this group in green. So, here we can see also these groups, okay, this grouping by class. So here essentially we are separating those crops, those data with classes. Okay, this is a classification by class. So each of these features that we have here, okay, are relevant features. And we have reduced this dimensionality of five columns to only three components so that we can see, because with five dimensions we cannot visualize this right so but with three we can and we can visualize this separation into groups so as we can see here with the color in red which is basically for the orange female well the crabs in red the crabs that are for the class orange female they have similar values for these features okay because they are in a group in in this space then on the other hand, the ones in green, which are basically the orange male, 
they will also have similar features for these features here. They will have similar values because they are all grouped in the same space. And the same for the yellow that represents the blue female and for the red or the blue that represents here the blue, the blue male. So essentially, we are separating these graphs in three dimensions. And each graph is divided onto its class and we can conclude from this visualization that depending on the class of this graph then the graph is going to have specific values for these uh, features here for the measurements right so if we take a graph from one class and a graph from another okay the values that they have is is going to be is going to differ more than if we take two graphs of the same class if we take two graphs of the same class, then there we're going to have similar values for the features. So we can see this separation in three dimensions in this way. We're going to also see another way of visualizing in three dimensions this separation using Plotly Express. And this is another model of the Plotly library in Python. The Plotly library in Python is an interactive open source plotting library that supports many many tools and charts covering a wide range of statistical, financial, geographic, scientific and three-dimensional use cases. So we are going to plot the same thing and it is the same algorithm. We are not going to change the algorithm, okay, and neither the construction. It is the same algorithm with the same three dimensions, but instead of using the common matplotlib library to plot it, we can use the Plotly Express and we can do it in a very shorter way. Here it is also important to understand both ways. So if you want to do it in a short way, you can as well. If you have a scenario that you don't need to specify too many things, right? So here we are going to use with the Plotly Express. So let's first import this uh, model of this library. So the library name is uh, Plotly. So import Plotly. The model is Express. So we add period Express. And we are going to import as px for broadly express so let's run this again we update this code cell so now the notebook is up to date and we are ready to use the plotly express model so now if we want to plot the same thing in a very shorter way one way to do is to create the figure just with the plotly method which is the scatter 3d this is a method of uh, the model Plotly Express that allows us to create uh, directly a scatter plot. Uh, we only need to specify the, the three dimensions and then the color that in our case is going to be the class. So the X is going to be here, the component one, right? The, the Y, the component two, and the uh, Z, the component three. So the first argument is to specify the data. So here the data is going to be the groups min max which is all in the same range the x is going to be the lin locally linear embedding one this is the first component the y locally linear embedding two right the second component this is the second dimension and finally the z the third component locally linear embedding three like this finally the color what is going to be the color of this uh, skater plot well, the color of the data is going to depend on the class. So here we can just write color is equal to the class. So crops with the same class uh, that are in the same class, they will have the same color and the ones that are on different classes will have different color. Right? Now to show this figure, we can just use here the method show of this uh, Plotly Express. So with only two lines, we can visualize the same thing. Right? So let's run this. This is going to take a bit more time to execute so we wait and as we can see here we have precisely the same separation of the data the same separation by classes depending on these three components the three dimension so now we have come oh, we have came from the same thing from a space that was uh, essentially five dimensions we had a five dimensional space because we are applying this algorithm on the relevant features only and we are now uh, reducing this dimensional space to have only three dimensions. So with three dimensions, we can visualize this separation. So here we can just 
visualize this separation, right? And also here we have the description. The blue male is, is on blue, the blue female on uh, red, the orange female with this uh, clear blue, this cyan, and then the orange female on this uh, purple, right? So we can see here that the grubs that are on the orange male, they all have the same space, so they are near to each other, right? This means that they will have uh, similar values to the relevant features, to the frontal lobe, the rear width, the carapace midline, and so on. The same happens for the orange female, for the blue male, and also for the blue female, okay? They will have very similar features if they are in the same class. If we take a crab from the orange male class, right, and we take another crab on the blue female, then the feature values of them, okay, the frontal lobe, the curve base midline, they will not be similar. They will be different because they do not belong to the same class. Okay, so this locally linear embedding allows us to do this, to separate those data depending on the class that they belong to. So, and we can even visualize this separation in three dimensions as we can see in here. Very well, with this we end the locally linear embedding practice. We remind the student that you can download all this code, all this notebook, okay? And the updated notebook with three dimensions, okay? We also have here on this notebook all the previous things that we have done. You can download all this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. I hope you have enjoyed the lessons and with this practice, now you are ready prepared to apply the locally linear embedding algorithm in Python and understand its visualizations. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will introduce the t stochastic neighbor embedding, abbreviated as T-S-N-E. This is a dimensionality reduction technique for embedding high dimensional data or visualization in a low dimensional space of two or three dimensions. So the idea is that we have a very large data set with lots of features, lots of attributes. We have a high dimensional space and we want to reduce this dimensionality. So we can apply here the D stochastic neighbor embedding method. So this method is mainly used as a visualization tool. This will allow us to visualize our data and separate this data into two or three dimensions. Important to note that with this technique, we cannot transform data to apply learning algorithms. It is a visualization technique. This method also assumes that the distances between the data instances define a probability distribution that must be retained into a space with fewer dimensions. The TSNE, as the name indicates, is a stochastic algorithm. That means that it has a random probability distribution or pattern. And this random behavior depends on the initialization of the arguments. We have many arguments to the number of target dimensions. So on this dimensionality reduction technique, the only argument is not only the number of dimensions that we want in the end, that is not only the argument 2 or the argument 3, but we have more arguments to take into account. We will study in deep these arguments when we start using the DSNE in Python on our dataset. So for this lesson, we will take a look at the procedure that we need to follow to execute this algorithm. First of all, this method assumes a Gaussian distribution for the distances of the examples. So the examples have distances that follow a Gaussian distribution. Remember that Gaussian means a normal distribution. Then once we have the distances, then each of these distances on each example to the rest are scaled to sum to 1. This will make us a probability distribution. So here each distance, if we sum all of the distances, this will give us 1. And the goal here is to find a projection of the data with fewer dimensions that retain the distribution of each distance. So now the data, the examples, are distributed in a new space 
with lower dimensions and the distribution of their distances is calculated. And here very important, the distance that we want to minimize in this optimization is the kobach leibler distance. There's no problem if you don't previously know this distance, the kobach leibler This is a type of a statistical distance and it is a measure of how one probability distribution P is different from a second. This is because when we reduce the dimensions, we will have a new probability distribution and we want to reduce this difference from the original one that we had to the new one, right? So we will use here the cool black label and we want to minimize this distance. So they are as similar, as most similar as possible. So let's get an intuition of how this algorithm works. So here we have our data, okay, plotted in the data set. So we can calculate the distances between each of these examples and each example has a probability distribution for each distances, right? This method also assumes that this is following a Gaussian distribution and once we have the distances, we can obtain the distribution of the similarities. This is our original distribution P and we want to now reduce the dimensionality of this data set. So now we distribute the data in a space with fewer dimensions. So we have a lower dimensionality space. And so now the data is moved so that the similarity distributions get closer together. So they are as similar as possible, like so. So this is the theory between the, the stochastic neighbor embedding. Now in the next lessons, we will apply this algorithm in Python, in practice, working with a real data set, and we will reduce the dimensionality of this data set and visualize the data set with this lower dimension space. Hey everyone, on the following lesson, we will introduce the data set that we will work on this section. Now this is the data set of the crabs data set which is precisely the same that we have worked using principal component analysis and also locally linear embedding. So if you have already done these sections and work with this data set, you can just skip the following lesson and go to the next one. If you haven't done the previous lessons and you're not familiar with the Krabs CSV data set, then you can start watching the introduction to the dataset lecture. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will introduce the dataset that we will work with in this practice. The name of this dataset is Krabs, it is a CSV file. You can download this dataset on the downloadable resources of this lesson. So, in essence, it is a dataset that has an information of the Krabs. It is taken from a paper published by Campo. Campo was a researcher that studied rock crabs in the 1974s, mainly the rock crabs for the genus Leptograpsus. One species, the Leptograpsus variegatus, had split into two new species, previously grouped by color orange and blue. So the preserved specimens lose their color. So it was hoped that the morphological differences will allow the museum material to be classified. So this is a practice about dimensionality reduction, right? We'll apply a technique, a method to reduce the dimensionality of this data set. So on this lesson, we will introduce the data set. We will see what are the columns, what are the features of this data set, which information we have. So then on the following lessons, we can proceed with the technique. So the data uh, are available on 50 specimens of its sex and species. So we have a 200 total crabs collected in Fremantle, Western Australia. So each specimen has the measures on, and here we have the attributes. The first one is the frontal lobe width. Then we have the rear width of the crab, the length along the midline of the carapace, the maximum width of the carapace of the crab, and finally the depth body length in millimeters plus the color of the crab, in other words, the species, and also the sex. So now let's create a new notebook in Google Colab to start working. We already explained on the code environment setup section 
how we could create a new Google Colab notebook. So let's do it. We have just created a new Google Colab notebook. The name of this notebook we have set it to be introduction to the data set. Later we will change and modify this when we start applying the dimensionality reduction technique. So first of all, let's load this data set in the notebook. To do this, we will need to import some libraries in Python. So here, first of all, we are going to add a text window. Let's call it, for instance, import of libraries. We are going to use also a here hashtag notation. When you use a hashtag in a text window, you are representing a heading or a header or a title. OK, depending on the title one, two or three, depending on the number of hashtags, we are going to put here a title three. So here we have the import of libraries, right? So we are going to start by importing the pandas library. The pandas library is a software library written for the Python programming language for data manipulation and analysis. It offers data structures and operations for manipulating numerical tables and time series. So we will need to import the pandas because this data frame, this data set grabs CSV, okay, we will need to import this as a pandas data frame, a pandas data set. So we are going to work with pandas. That's why here the first thing that we need to do is to import the pandas library as PD, right? And now, since we also want to load a CSV file, we will need to import the input and output library. So we will be able to import and load files from our computer. So now finally, to be able to load files for the Google Colab notebook, we just here import from the Google Colab. We are going to import files like so. So now we run this cell. With this uh, run, we have all the imports done. And now we can just proceed to load uh, this uh, CSV file. So in our case, you just go to this lesson on the downloadable resources. You go to the Krabs CSV. You download this file. Once you have this file on your computer, here keep in mind that you have a folder in, in this directory of the Google Colab Notebook. So here we just click it. This is the files that we have loaded. For now, we have not loaded anything. We just have the sample data that Google Colab provides to us. So to load this CSV inside this notebook, we will do this in a new code window. And we will do this with the files module upload method. So here we are going to create a new variable. Let's just say uploaded. This is going to be equal to the files upload method. So with this, we are able to load a new CSV or any other file that we want inside or not. So let's run this. We uh, click run. Now, as we can see, this option appears to us. Choose files. We are going to cl click here. And so it is going to open your file explorer in your operating system. So we just browse for the grabs data set and we double click here or just click open. And now, as we can see, we have loaded this Krabs CSV file. We can just go to the files in the notebook and we see here the Krabs CSV. So we are able now to work with this file. So now let's do an initial study and initial exploration of this data set before applying any dimensionality reduction technique. This We will do this on the following lessons. Now this is only an introduction to this data set. So let's add here new text window and let's name this window the initial study of the data set. So let's load this CSV as a data set, as a pandas data set. So to do this, let's name a variable. Let's name it grabs data, for instance, to be the data set of the grabs. And now we are going to use the pandas and we are going to use the method read CSV with an underscore between read and CSV. So now we pass as an argument the name of the file, the name of the CSV. As we can see, it is grabs CSV. So we pass the name as the string. So this is grabs dart CSV. So now we can run this very well. So with this, we have loaded onto this variable. Now we have the data set for this variable grabs data. We can visualize the first rows of this data set with the head method of pandas. So here, if we just write grabs data head, with this, we can visualize the first five rows. 
So we can have, we have one attribute for the species, uh, B stands for blue, right? The other option is O, that is orange. We also have an attribute for the sex, a feature for the index, a feature for the frontal lobe, rear wreath, curve base, midline, right? Which is abbreviated with CL. Then we have the CW, which is the maximum width of the curve base. And finally, the body length, which is here the depth body length, abbreviated with BD. And so we have this data set, right? We have the initial data set with the columns and their names. However, let's improve the understanding of this data set before applying any dimensionality reduction. Let's rename the name of these columns. Instead of using the abbreviation, let's just use the total name. And also here for the values B, that stands for blue, M that stands for male, and also here we can use the tail to see the last five column, uh, rows in this case. Also, instead of O that stands for orange, and instead of F that stands for female, we are going to change this to map D values, that is the total word. Instead of O, we want to see orange, instead of F, we want to see female. And the same way, if we use here, we see the head, this gives us the first five uh, rows. We want male instead of M, and also blue instead of B. So on one side we want to rename the name of the columns and also change these values of this mapping for the columns, species and sex. So something we have not mentioned but here if we just write tail this will give you the five last elements. Okay, Keep in mind that you have a total of 200 elements. In fact you can use here the shape if you just run now this gives you the dimension of this data set. We have 200 instances, 200 rows, and a total of 8 columns. These 8 columns are, as we can see here, this uh, 8 that we see, right? From the species to the body depth. So let's start by renaming the columns. So now we are going to rename the columns. To do this, we are going to update this data set such that now the new data set with the new name is going to be updated we are going to rename the data set that we have now and we are going to rename the column so here we are going to only remain uh, in this case uh, rename and change the column names and to do this it is very simple and easy we just here type a dictionary with the old value which is the key and the new value which is the value of this uh, dictionary key right so here we want to add species this is going to change this column uh, SP, which is this one, to a species. The same thing we can do with the frontal lobe, right? These two we are not going to change because they are easy to understand, both of them. But now the FL, we want to change this FL. So FL is going to be changed and renamed to the frontal lobe. This is going to be the frontal lobe. Then the R. W attribute is going to be changed and renamed to the rear width. This is going to be the rear width. And we can continue doing this for everyone. We change the name of this L to be the curve base midline of CW to be the maximum width. And from the BD, we go to the body depth. Right, we are going to also change this and erase the last key and the last bracket. Let's just suppose this from this until here in a new line, so you can visualize. Very well, now we hope that now it is easy to see everything. We just change this older name to be this new name, this old name to be this new name, and so on. So now we are going to run this uh, code cell, right? And now we are going to add now a new cell to visualize this change and verify that we have changed correctly the names of the columns. So again, we can just write grabs data head. The change has not uh, affected the name, right? The name is the same. We run this cell, and now as we can see, the columns, okay, have updated their names. Instead of SP, we have species. Instead of FL, we have frontal lobe. Instead of RW, we have rear width, and so on. Now, the other thing that we wanted to do as well is to change the mapping between B for being blue, M for being male, and in the same way, if we check the last ones, Instead of O, we want the orange, and instead of F, we want the female. So now, instead of changing the names of the columns, we want to change the mapping for the values. So the way to do this is the following. We access the columns that we want to change. In this case, first, we want to change the species, right? So here we just type species, 
we want to change uh, instead of B to be blue, instead of O to be orange. So we are going to update this column to be the grabs data species. But now we are mapping, and this is important, here we are adding a map because we are changing the values, not the names of the columns. And again, here we pass a dictionary as an argument. Here we have the old value, so instead of B, we want to have blue. Instead of all, we want to have orange. Write this as a no. And the same thing stands for this uh, feature, this column of the sex. So here we access this column, data with the column sex. We are going to update this column to be a mapping. So again, we access this column and with the map. And now instead of M, we want to be male, right? So here we change for male. And instead of F, we want female. So we just change this to be female, like so. Very well. So now let's run this code cell. Once we have run this, let's update this uh, Kurab's data head and verify that now the values are changed. So we run this. And as we can see, we have precisely done that. Instead of B, we have blue. Instead of M, we have male, and if we check the last uh, elements in this data set, the last instances of the grabs, instead of O, we have orange, instead of F, we have female. Pretty easy, right? Very well, so once we have introduced to this data set, the objective of this practice is to separate the 200 grabs that we have in this data set into four different classes, four different groups or four different clusters right given by their sex and given by their species so we can have one class that is male blue another it is male orange then we have another female blue and another female orange so we have four classes and we will need to do this with a dimensionality reduction technique so let's add here a new text window and now let's paste here the objective, so here the goal is to separate these 200 instances of graphs into four classes, right? And this is what we are going to do on the following lesson using the dimension reduction and the dimensionality reduction technique of this section. See you on the following lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will apply and use the stochastic neighbor embedding in our data set. So on the previous lesson, we introduced this data set, right? It is a data set with the information of crabs. And so we have features in this data set. We created a new collab notebook file for this. And now the goal is to separate this 200 instances of crabs into four classes, depending on the sex and the species of this crab. So this exercise for this practice it was to reduce this dimensionality, right? Using a dimensionality reduction technique. And we will use now the T stochastic neighbor embedding. So first of all, let's change the name of this notebook to be, for instance, using here DSE. Okay, we are going to use now this dimensionality reduction technique on this data set and also visualize the new data in this new lower dimensional space. So now, since we want to separate all the instances of this graph depending on their class, the idea is that we will now create a new column in this data set, a new feature for the class. And the class is going to be nothing more than the concatenation of the species and the sex. So to add a new column in this data set, let's do this in a new code window here. And it is as easy as we write the name of the data set, in our case, grabs data. Now we write the column name, in our case, class. And we are going to set the values for this column to be the species column, so grabs data species, concatenated with the sex of the grab. So here we concatenated with the grabs data sex, like so. So now let's run this code cell. And now here, as we can see, if we again look for the first five elements or the last five elements of this data set, let's just write here head. Now we will visualize a new column here, depending on the class. So let's run this. 
And as we can see, here we have this new column for the class. So keep in mind that the class is nothing more than concatenation of the species of this crab with the sex of this crab. For instance, this first crab has the species blue and the sex male, so the class is blue male. If we check the last element, with the tail method here, now we see that, for instance, this crab with the identifier 895 belongs to the species orange. The sex of this crab is female, that's why the class is orange female. So we have four classes, right? We have a blue male, blue female, and then orange male and orange female. Very well, once we have now this new column on the right, we can also update here this cell. If we run it again, we see this class updated. We will proceed to apply the T-Stochastic neighbor embedding. So let's add a new text window. Let's here, for instance, just write T-Stochastic neighbor embedding, TS and E. And on this section, we are going to use this uh, dimensionality reduction method in this data set, right? So remember from the introduction lesson that this method transforms the distances between points into probabilities and then it tries to keep the same probability distributions while transforming the data to a lower dimensional space. Something very important on this algorithm is that it depends on the initialization and its result may change between runs. This is because it is an stochastic algorithm. There is random behavior inside so we can keep running this algorithm several times and the results may change. It also depends strongly on the arguments that we pass. It is generally only used for visualization and not for dimensionality reduction or learning algorithms. This is also that something we mentioned on the introduction lesson. The most important arguments of this model are 1. The perplexity. This balances the attention between the local and the global aspects of the data and this value will usually be between 5 and 50. This also has a very strong effect on the final display of the visualization. And also the second very important argument is the number of iterations that we will choose. Now, on this section we will apply the stochastic need for embedding using the raw data that is with no preprocess to the data, just the original data set with the original values we have. We will also apply on the following lessons the same technique but now on the scale data and now proceed to calculate a new visualization and the same for the standardized data okay and CD visualization. For this lesson we will apply this technique on the raw data, the original data set and plot the visualization for the raw data. So we will first apply this technique on the uh, data set, on the original data set, and then we will process this data set and see how the results are different depending on if we apply this algorithm on a scale data set or a standardized data set. So here, first of all, let's add a new text window. So here we are using raw data, no process. We are going to use the algorithm on the data set just like we have the raw data set, not scaling, not standardizing this data set, just the data set. Very well. Another thing that we need to know is what are we going to do with this technique? And the idea is that we want to separate the graphs into classes, right? Now we are only going to apply the T stochastic neighbor embedding on the relevant features. Those relevant features are the frontal lobe, the pre-width, the group base midline, and the, max the maximum width and also the body depth. So we have here five uh, relevant features, five attributes that we want to apply this algorithm to. We are not going to apply this algorithm onto the species attribute, neither the sex attribute, right? Only the relevant measurements. So we will now define an array to indicate these relevant features. So we will do this in here. Let's add a new code window. Let's name this array the data columns. So here we will have the relevant measurements. So the idea is that we start with the frontal lobe. So here we have the frontal lobe. Then the next one is the rear width. We can just copy this here and we paste here the rear width like so. 
Then we have the care base midline. We copy this and we continue here with the care base midline. Then we have the maximum width. And finally, the body depth. So we just copy and paste here the body depth. So here what we have, well, here we have the relevant features that we will apply the stochastic neighbor embedding. We are going to reduce this dimensionality that we have a total of five columns into two or three columns. So let's run this cell. So we load this variable very well. Now the notebook has this variable data columns with all the relevant features. And now we can proceed to apply the stochastic neighbor embedding. Now here to use the, the stochastic neighbor embedding, we need to import from the scikit-learn library. So let's go on top of all. Here we have the import window, right? So now from the scikit-learn, scikit-learn manifold, we will import the stochastic neighbor embedding. Now, this is for using this technique that we're studying, the stochastic neighbor embedding. Now, here, scikit-learn is from the library scikit-learn. This is a free software machine learning library for the Python programming language. Manifold is a learning approach to nonlinear dimensionality reduction from scikit-learn. So, we are going to import here the T stochastic neighbor embedding. It is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique, right? So moreover, we also need to be able to plot figures. To do this, we will import the matplotlib library in Python. We can do it simply as import matplotlib dart plot as, or in this case, dart pyplot as plot. With this, we will import the pyplot library of matplotlib matplotlib is a plotting library for the python programming language and it is very used since it contains a wide range of plotting figures applications we will also need to import the pandas library import pandas as pd panda is a software library written for the python programming language for data manipulation and analysis so keep in mind that we have already imported this library previously, so we don't need to import again, although we will need to use it on this technique, but we have already imported it. Now, the final library that we will need to import that we have not imported yet is the Seaborn library for Python. So here the name is Seaborn as SN as this is a Python data visualization library based on Matplotlib. It provides a high-level interface for drawing and for informative statistical graphics. Very well. Once we have all the imports done, let's run this cell. So we update the notebook. Now the notebook is up to date. And now we can proceed here to apply the uh, stochastic neighbor embedding, right? So keep in mind that you need to import this method so you can use it. Don't forget to import here and also to run your cell to update the notebook. So let's start. Keep in mind that we are going now to apply the T stochastic neighbor embedding using the raw data. That is, we are not doing any pre-process uh, previously to the technique. We are just going to apply this technique, okay, onto the original data set. Very well. So we are going to start using two dimensions. So here, let's just use as a header to dimensions okay so we are going to apply this technique using two components two dimensions let's define this new components to be graphs of the stochastic nearest neighbors like so so now we have this uh, variable graphs the stochastic neighbor embedding so with this we will apply now the method that's why important that you to import here okay because we are going to apply now this method in here it is the stochastic neighbor embedding. Now, this method receives multiple arguments. The first argument is the number of components that we want to calculate. Now, keep in mind that we are using now two dimensions. So here, the argument for the number of components is going to be equal to two, because we are using two dimensions. Okay. Uh, later, we will use three, and we are going to change this argument. Now, more important arguments. Remember the perplexity this is another important argument okay this is usually between 5 and 50 we are going to choose uh, for this example a total 
value for the perplexity to be 10, for instance. Perplexity equal to 10, like so. Then the, the next argument is the number of iterations. So here we can define this as n uh, iterations, like so. Okay, keep in mind that here you need to use the same syntax because this is a predefined syntax for this method of the scikit-learn library. Okay, here remember that you need to use the same syntax. So we are going to choose, for instance, 2000 iterations. Okay, uh, remember that this is a stochastic model. We have here random behavior. So between uh, an execution to another execution, the visualization is going to change. So here the initialization is going to be random. Okay, we are going to study more types of initializations on following lessons. For now, we are going to use the default, which is random. And now we are going to fit transform like so. And here we need to uh, indicate the data set that we are going to apply this method. So the data set is this one. Okay, the crops data, the original one. And keep in mind that we are only going to apply this dimensionality reduction technique, this algorithm, we are only going to apply it onto the relevant features, that is, these five features. So we can access these five columns, these five features, with this data columns uh, attribute, right? With this variable, we have the data column. So here, we can just use here the data column. So now we are going to access only these columns here, frontal lob, view width, core base midline, maximum width, and body depth right so we have this this is going to return uh, two columns two new columns that they are going to be the components okay these two dimensions that we are going to have so we can use this uh, for visualization so with this we want to add two new columns onto the data set and these two new columns we want them to be precisely this here that returns two new columns so how can we add new columns onto the original data set well we already saw this like here okay so now we write again crabs data but now since we want to add two columns not only one we add here a list of columns the first element let's say it is the ts and e1 this is the first component the second is ts and e2 uh, the second component and what are going to be the values for these two new columns? Well, the values, they're going to be precisely what this method here returns, right? So here we just add the crops TS in. Crops, the stochastic neighbor embed, like so. Uh, you need to just use here the same name you've written here. If you name this to be K, then you also here needs to be K, okay? Because this is what this method returns. So with this, we have these two new columns. Uh, they are precisely this, these two new components of the uh, T-stochastic neighbor embedding. Okay? So with this, let's just run this. We wait for this uh, execution. Keep in mind that we have 2,000 iterations. It, it is not a so big value. If you have a very big value of the number of iterations, then this can long uh, and last more time. Okay? So we already run this. Now we can update this uh, cell here, okay, we can run again. And now when we update this code window, we will see two new columns. So let's verify, let's run. And as we can see, we have these two new columns. This is the component one for this technique and the component two, right? So here we have the T-stochastic neighbor embedding one, component one, component two, dimension one, dimension two. In the same way, we can check here for the first elements, the head, and we also have here these two new columns represent right so very well we already have these two new columns how can we visualize now the separation between classes using this technique which is precisely the object that we need to do right so that's where the uh, matplotlib library comes uh, in and that's why here we have imported this matplotlib library as the pyplot because now we can use this pyplot to create a new figure. To do this, we can just define the figure to be the pyplot. Uh, whenever we want to use pyplot, we can just write plt. And to create a figure, there's a method to call uh, just like that, figure. And we can also specify the size of this figure with a fixed size. Let's just say to have a width of 8 and also a height of 8, like this. 
So with this we have a new figure, okay? And now we are going to use the Seaborn library to have a scatter plot of this uh, data, okay? Using these two components. So now to use a scatter plot, we can just here use SNE to access the Seaborn. Okay, here we are accessing this Seaborn uh, library. And now we just type here scatter plot. This is going to create a scatter plot in Python. And now we need to give the two components. So the X is going to be the component uh, one. So we just type TS and E1. The Y is going to be the component two. So we just type TS and E2 like this, right? This is going to be a visualization using two dimensions because we are using here uh, two components, right? And now very, very important. What is going to be the hue? or the separation criteria. Well, now the separation criteria is going to be the class. Why the hue is the class here? Well, remember, because the objective is to separate all these 200 grams that we have on our data set into four different classes. So we want to have a visualization of the separation of the grams between classes. So that's why the hue here uh, is the class. Okay, we want to separate these grams depending on their class. Finally, the last argument of the scatterplot method of the Seaborn library is the data. What is the data? Well, the data is just the, the data set that we have, which is crops data. Crops data, like this. Very well, now we can run this cell. We press here the run cell. And now, as we can see, we have here this visualization using the the stochastic neighbor embedding on this data set. Here we can see that the color, for instance, blue is for the blue male, the orange is for the blue female, the green for the orange male, and the red for the orange female. Right? Uh, now we can also run again, and you'll see that the visualization is going to be different, so let's run. We wait, and we see a different visualization. Why does this change? Well, remember, because this is an stochastic method, so it is not a deterministic method. In the sense of, uh, with the same arguments, different executions may have different results. Very well, now we are going to do the same thing, but now using uh, three dimensions. So let's copy this cell. Let's run, let's paste here. And now we are going to use three dimensions. So now we are going to have a three-dimensional visualization of this separation between classes, right? So how can we do this? Well, the, the, in essence, the method is going to be very similar, only the final part is going to be a bit different. So here, let's add the code window. We can erase this text window, and we start by defining the graphs, the stochastic neighbor embedding. So we are going to use the TSNE method. So now, what is going to be the number of components? Well, the number of components is the same as the number of the dimensions. So in this case, three, right? And the perplexity, we're going to do the same. So here we can just copy here the perplexity, like this. We can copy this, like so. Also the same number of iterations. We're going to use here the fit transform. And here we just, uh, the data is going to be the graphs data with the relevant features. So it is data columns, like this. So now we want to add three new columns on the data set before we added only two. And now we want to add three. So what is the difference between the, the previous uh, statement and now? Well, well, now this instruction is going to return three columns. This method is going to return three components because we've set the number of components to be three. So now here we need to add a third component, which is TS and E3. And this is going to be equal to this. Okay. So now when we run, okay, we run this uh, technique. In this method, we are not going to plot anything because we are not using any uh, matplotlib or seaborn uh, method here. But now let's just verify that when we write crabs data head, we have these three new columns of the components. So let's run this. And as we can see, we have here these uh, three uh, components and this third component, right? Now keep in mind that if we go above, okay, before we had this, and now we have uh, this here we have three components, okay? In the same way, very important. What if we run again? Let's run again this method. Let's wait for this method to finish. 
And now, once this has finished, let's run again this. And remember these values, so 21, minus 48, 91. Let's run again. So we have different values. This is uh, very obvious because if the visualization changes, the reason for this is because these values change at each iteration. Okay, so at each iteration, and basically at each execution more of this method, at each different execution that you set, you'll have different values for the components. That's why this is the reason why the visualization changes. Okay, so important to know, in essence, why the visualization changes, and it is because these components' values change. Right? So now let's plot here, uh, in this same window, we are going to use now to have a three-dimensional plot, uh, very important, we are going we are going to define it in this way. First of all, we need to create a new figure, right? This is very uh, simple. We already learned this. So the figure is going to use the pipe plot figure. We can just copy from this. And uh, the size of this figure can be the same. No? So, but since now this is going to be a three-dimensional plot, we need to define a new axis. Keep in mind that on two-dimensional space, we have one axis, the the vertical axis, the y-axis, and then the, the horizontal axis, which is the x-axis, right? This is the second axis. So here we have three axes, so that's why we need to add a new axis. And to do this, we can just type fig, this is the name of the figure we've chosen, add, and then we add the subplot with underscore subplot, and here we need to specify the projection. So the projection is going to be a three-dimensional projection and we are going to add the grid that is one times one so one per one and the output is going to be one this is because when you have a three-dimensional uh, the the z-axis this third axis is uh, an axis on of one dimension one per one and the output is one the z values right the z values cannot be tuples cannot be pairs it is only one value that's why here we have a grid one times one that returns one uh, value. So here, the only thing that you need to take care of is if you want to have a three-dimensional plot, you just need to have this instruction. Okay, but this is the reason why this is one y one. For those who don't know, is because we are adding a z-axis that is uh, one times one grid, and the output is also only one. Very well. So now we can proceed to use here the scatter method of the pie plot. Okay, keep in mind that this is not the Seaborn library, we are not using the Seaborn library, we are using the PyPlot uh, library. Okay, so we just type scatter. Now we need to specify the DX data, and DX data is going to be crops data of the column TSNE. So here we just copy this column. Okay, we can access the value with the point. In the same way, the Y data is going to be crops data TSNE2, like so. Then we specify this third axis with ZS, and this is going to be this uh, TSN3. So, grabs data, TSN E3. Finally, we can also specify the depth shade. Uh, this depth shade basically represents that the points that have a higher depth can have more opacity or less opacity. We don't want this. We want all the points to have the same uh, opacity and the same transparency depending if they are uh, very, very in a depth part of the graph or if they have a lower depth. This does not change for the visualization. We want all of them to have the same opacity. So here we define this to be false. Okay. Uh, keep in mind that if you don't set this to be false, the default behavior of the skater of the pipe plot, when you have a three-dimensional plot, is to have different opacity depending on the depth of the data. We want all of them to have the same opacity, so the depth shade is false. There's no depth shading in here. Now, finally, we have here the C value, and this is the colors of each point. So how can we define the colors of each point? Remember that when we had a two-dimensional plot, we didn't need to specify anything of this because it was automatic, right? We just specified the data is this, right? And here we have, depending on the class, different colors. How can we make the same thing uh, to work with the same colors in three dimensions? Well, to do this, we need to specify what is called the dictionary 
And you just need to know, for the ones who don't know the dictionary data structure, okay, it is not very important to know how to use this data structure, just understand that this is a structure that for a given key, we can have a given value, okay? If we have a key, this key can be mapped to a unique value. And this is precisely what we are going to do. We are going to define here the colors for the graphs. This is going to be a dictionary, it's going to be a mapping, where, for instance, the class blue female, this class in here, blue female, uh, how is this class? Well, this class is orange in here, so here let's just set this to be orange, like so. Then, next one. What about, for instance, the blue male? Well, the blue male is a key, is a class, that when we have the class blue male, we are going to set it to be blue. So, here we have the B. When we have a class like, for instance, the orange uh, female, okay? Well, the orange female, we want it to be red. So, here we define the R. Finally, the uh, orange uh, male, we want it to be green, the same as the two-dimensional plot. So here we define the G, like this. And this is a dictionary, it is a mapping, that if we have this class, we will have this color. If we have this class, we will have this color. So how can we use this uh, notation of the dictionary here? Well, we can do this with the lambda function, in the sense of, let's put it in here, the color is going to be, okay, a lambda function that we are going to plus this on the class of the data set so we are going to apply this dictionary depending on the class column right keep in mind that the class can be blue male uh, blue female and so on so here we apply a lambda function you can use the apply method and now this is a function that given an argument x given a key x this is going to be the class value Okay, this is going to be the keys. We are going to use here the color crops for the key X. Just like that. So, essentially, you just need to know that this X is going to be these keys for the class. Blue male, blue female, orange male, orange female. And the colors that we are going to use are going to be these values. O, B, R, or G, depending on the keys, which are the classes. Right? So this is the argument for the color. And then we have here uh, a last argument of the scatter method, which is the size. The size of the markers. Basically, how big the points of the data are going to be represented. So here, a common size to use is uh, 800, okay? Like so. Basically, this is the size of the markers. Not very important to, uh, to specify this because the default is going to be 800 as well. But here, this argument is very important because it is the argument for the colors. And we do this in a mapping process, like so. Very well. So with this, we are ready to now uh, plot this. And we are going to clear the output in here. So let's run this cell. And before running, very important to remember, when we are using with base colors of a matplotlib, the orange is not present on the base color. So we are going to use yellow instead of orange. Okay, just remember here to put yellow. And now you have here the base color. This is because the orange color is not uh, included on the base colors and the yellow is. So we are going to change this orange to be yellow. Let's run this cell. Let's wait for the execution. And now we shall have a visualization in three dimensions, right? Very well. And as we can see, here we can see the visualization of the separation of the graphs depending on their class using the t stochastic neighbor embedding with three components with three dimensions there's also another way for visualizing in three dimensions in python is just using the plotly express library we are going to do it in here yeah. let's add a new code window and to do this we need to import the plotly express this is another uh, library in python for visualization it is an easy to use high level interface to Plotly, which operates on a variety of types of data and produces an easy to style figures. Plotly Express provides functions to visualize a variety of types of data. We can import this library with this uh, instruction. We are going to do it above. Just importing here. We run again. Okay, so we update now. And now, as you see, why do we say it is an easy to use? Well, because here to, to visualize this, 
three-dimensional data, uh, we had all of these lines, right? So using the Plotlib Express library, we can do it in one line or two lines. How can we do that? Well, we define the figure to be the Plotlib Express uh, method. So here we just are using this Plotlib Express method. In here, we just type uh, scatter 3D because it is going to be a three-dimensional plot, so underscore 3D, this is the name syntax of the method. Now we specify the data set, so crabs data, right? Now we specify the three uh, axes, right? The three components. So the first dimension X is going to be the T, S, and E1. The dimension two, the dimension Y is going to be T, S, and E2, right? And finally, the Z is going to be the TSN E3, this third dimension. And finally, the Plotlib Express method allows us to specify the color in a very easier way. So, if before we needed the map, right, the mapping and a dictionary to, to, to establish that each class go to a different color, here we can just do it with the color attribute. So, we just type here color, and the top color is going to be equal to the class just like this in one line we are able to have this figure so to show this figure we just type fig show like this so as we can see with only here these two short lines of code instead of using all of these lines we can have the same result using the plot lib express so let's run this and as we can see here we have the same plotting in three dimensions of the separation of these classes using plot lib express Right? And here we see this dimension ID. We see that the color uh, blue is for the blue male, the color red is for the blue female, the color green for the orange male, and the color purple for the orange female. And here we can see the data separation between classes. So remember, we could apply this method to the raw data, uh, that is the original data set with no preprocessing, to the scale data. Remember that we can apply this method onto the raw data with no preprocessing, the scaled data and the standardized data, right? So we have applied now this method and so the separation between classes and also the visualization using two and three dimensions with the raw data and on the following lessons we will finish with the scale data and the standardized data. Remember that you can download all this notebook, right? And all of this code on the downloadable documents of this lesson. See you in the next lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will apply the two stochastic need for embedding on our data set after scaling the data. So we will apply this method on the scale data. So in the previous lesson we applied this method and we used this method for the visualization, right? And we did it on the raw data. That is, we did no pre-processing at all. We just had this original data set and we just apply the, the stochastic neighbor embedding. Now, in this lesson, we will apply it on the scale data. So, let's go below to this notebook. Let's add here a new text window. And now, we are going to use this on the scale data. And in the same way, we are going to start using two dimensions. So here we are going to use two dimensions. Now, first of all, we need to scale the data, right? So here, let's set the new code window before. And to do this, to scale the data, we need to import from the scikit-learn library the min-max scaler. So we need to go here onto the lib library import. So also, we are going to change this notebook with the scale data like this and so to scale the data we need to import the min max scaler this is a model to scale all our data and we are going to use it in this way so we need to import from the scikit learn let's do it in here for instance from the scikit learn library so here for scikit learn and we access the pre-processing model. So here pre-processing, we are going to import the mean max scalar, as we can see. So with this, we are able to scale our data. Let's run this. So we update the notebook like so. Now, how can we scale the values on our data set? Keep in mind that the values that we want to scale 
are only the relevant features. That is the uh, frontal lob, the rear width, the grip base midline, the maximum width, and the body depth. Right. So we are only going to scale the data columns. So here to scale this data set in Python, let's define the new data set. Let's put the name as min max since we are going to use the min max scaler. Initially, this is going to be a copy of the original data set. Right. So here we just use the copy method. And now we access the, the relevant features on the new data set. So we access in the way data columns. Right. Keep in mind that on this variable, the data columns, we have the relevant features, as we can see right in here, data columns, we have the relevant measurements and the relevant features that we want to scale. So here to use the min max scaler, we just use min max scaler method like so. And we access here the function with the name of fit transform. So we are going to fit transform and he, we need to pass here the columns and the values that we want to scale so in our case we access the original data set grabs data and the relevant columns so the relevant features are the relevant columns so we have here the data columns the relevant features that we want to scale so before using this let's again uh, uh, visualize this data set so the first elements and see those values so let's just see so as we can see the frontal lobe has this range of values the rear width also this range of values and so on right and now we are going to use this uh, instruction right we are going to scale them so we have just scaled them and now instead of visualizing this original data set let's now here below see the values of the relevant measurements but now on this new data set like so so we want to see now the values on the scale data let's run this and as we can see, here we have the values of the frontal lobe, the rear width, the gear pace midline, the maximum width, and the body depth. So with the scaling process, what have we done? Well, we made that all of those values range from 0 to 1. In fact, we can use here the describe method of a pandas data set. And we can see that all of these values, the minimum is 0, the maximum is 1 minimum zero maximum one minimum zero maximum one right in the same way we can see here the first 60 elements and we'll see that no none of them have a value greater than one or less than zero right as we can see in here okay they scale from zero to one this is what the min max scalar does okay by definition so if we see the 61st values in here on the original data set, we see values that are greater than one, like here, 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 and so, right? So that's the difference. Now, all the values range with the same from zero to one. All of these values, okay, have the same range. Very well, once we have scaled the data, once we have here the data set scaled, we can now proceed to apply the uh, stochastic neighbor embedding, right? Uh, dimensionality reduction technique we're using two dimensionals on this new data set so let's do this now so initially using two dimensions let's define the graphs t stochastic nearest neighbors or in this case the t stochastic neighbor embedding to be equal to the method tsne that we have used on the previous lesson and uh, the rest is the same in the sense of we here go to what we have done before Okay, this code, we just copy here. We're using two dimensions. We copy all of these arguments. We are going to use the same of them. So we just copy here, TSNE, like so. In here, for instance, let's change the number of iterations from 2000 to 1000, like this. And when we scale the data and we apply this uh, stochastic neighbor embedding, we make sure that different dimensions to be treated with equal importance. So we apply it in here, right? Keep in mind that also something that we need to change is that now we want to use here the data, not the original data, but the e-scale data. And the scale data is this one. So we need to change crabs data to crabs min max, like so, right? And now once we have this, we can add to this, uh, as we can see here, let's change this to be the first five. Now we want to add two new columns on the data set, right? 
keep in mind that this copy that we make initially this copy will also copy the previously uh, action that we have done on the previous lesson that we added three dimensions if we don't want this to be done then we can go again onto the upload this window we just run here and we upload we choose again the crabs data set file okay which is this crabs data set we make again the study of the data set and the changes of the columns names and the columns values we add this class value again also we did this again and now we don't do what we did before when we're using the raw data so we don't execute any of the windows that we did on the previous lesson using the raw data we just go here using the scale data and now when we run this we will have no extra components because we have not used the raw data okay uh, method of tsne and we can just come here and use the on the scale data so when we do a copy of this and we see this head as we can see we have no extra components which is precisely what we want to do now we want to study this case isolated from the previous one yeah so now we have this and we want to add these two new columns for these two dimensions right on the scale data so to do this we just go to the scale data min max and here we add uh, two new columns and to do this we can just pass as a list these two new columns in here and what are going to be the values of these two columns well precisely what this returns so we just got uh, what this here returns so we just copy this variable we paste it here we execute here and now we can rerun this code cell and instead of only class at the end we will have two extra components very well this works very well we have two extra components so now we can visualize this components we can do it in the same way that we have done on the raw data remember right here using two dimensions with the figure and the pipe plot figure and the scatter plot of seaborn so here we can just come on this code window we first create the figure using the figure equal to the pipe plot figure and now we define this scatter plot of the seaborn so sns for seaborn scatter plot here we specify the x axis this x axis is going to be this first component of the scale data the y axis is going to be the second component of this scale data right then we specify the hue so the hue is going to be the class it is our separation criteria right remember that we want to separate the crabs depending on their class and finally now very important what is going to be the data is the data crabs data no the data is the scale data so the scale data is crabs min max like this yes so now let's run this and uh, plot this visualization as we can see in here so we have here the separation of classes depending on the color so as we can see uh, the blue color defines the crab that belong to the class of blue male then the orange for blue female the green for orange male and the red for orange female Okay, keep in mind that if we do it again, this visualization is going to change because we have that this technique, the T-stochastic neighbor embedding, is an stochastic technique. Each execution will have different results, right? Very well, so let's do the same thing now using three dimensions. So let's copy this cell and paste it here. And now we are going to use three dimensions now the way that we are going to do this is the same way as we did on the raw data so we are not going to roll to write all of them so we can just copy all this code and we are going to discuss what we need to change here so we paste very well so first of all we want to use three dimensions so we define here the crabs uh, t stochastic neighbor embedding columns to be equal to this this is going to return three dimensions because we have specified that we are using three components the perplexity is 10 okay the number of iterations 2000 okay the initialization is going to be random and now what happens here well we want to use this technique on the scale data not the raw data so we change this to be the min max right so with this we have the scale data so we also want to add these three new columns on the scale data not on the original data so we do it on the scale data 
like so uh, min max equal to this very well because this returns three attributes and we are going to set them to be equal to these three columns here we have the same mapping process that we did on the previous lesson the same figure the same axis aggregation we do this to aggregate the new axis so we can plot a three-dimensional plot and finally on the scatter plot okay we have here that now instead of here the color to access the grabs data we want to access the grabs min max and in the same way here we access that the column x or the axis x is the grabs min max tsne1 right it is this data set min max tsne1 and then the y axis is going to be the grabs min max min max tsne2 the z is going to be the grabs min max tsne3 keep in mind that when we execute this here this cell these two instructions will have a new column in fact we can copy everything in here add the new code and paste it here and now we can say here grabs min max head okay we can run this and now we will see and we shall see an extra third component for the third dimension let's wait and as we can see we see here at the end a third component this is for the third dimension so this is going to be precisely this z axis in here okay tsne3 the depth shade is false remember that this basically establishes that the depth of the uh, data does not depend on their opacity so all of the data is going to have the same opacity okay depending and regardless if they are uh, in a very high depth or very low depth all of them have the same transparency the same opacity the color we do it with the mapping where this is the mapping for the colors this x is a given class and this is the color depending on this class so we do this with a lambda function we explained this on the previous lesson right and with this we are ready to plot this so let's run and here we see the data the separation of the classes right as we can see here using three dimensions using the t stochastic neighbor embedding with the scale data okay this is the case using here the scale data right in the same way that we did on the raw data there's an extra way using the plot lee express to uh, represent this data set or basically this new uh, data set after applying this method okay and here we can do this with the new code cell and in the same way we can copy what we did on the previous lesson okay to have this plotly express and it is important to know this because with only two lines of code with only two instructions we can have the same plot right Keep in mind that we need to change from Krabs data now to the Krabs min max because we are going to visualize this on the new scale data set. We run this, we wait for the execution, and here we have the visualization of the uh, algorithm. Okay, we see the separation between the classes using the T stochastic neighbor embedding on the scale data set after scaling the data set. And with this, with this, we have this objective to separate this data into four classes, depending on the uh, species and the sect of the crab, right? And we did this with the T stochastic neighbor embedding now on the scale data. So remember that this is a cumulative. You can download all of this notebook, okay, as well as what we did on the previous lesson on the downloadable documents of this lesson okay you can you have all this documentation and all of this notebook for downloading so if you want to try it out okay on your, your desktop and on the next lesson we will finish this section of the t stochastic neighbor embedding using this method on the standardized data hey everyone on this lesson we are going to finish the t stochastic neighbor embedding algorithm by applying this method onto the standardized data set so we have the original data set of the crabs we are going to standardize this data set and then we are going to apply this technique so on the previous lesson we did it with the scale data this means that all of the variables all of the columns and all of the features on our data set will have mean zero and standard deviation one 
So the first thing we're going to do is to change the name of the notebook to be standardized data. We are going to add here a new section. So we add a new text window. Here we use two hashtags to represent or three to represent the heading. And we are going to say using on standardized data. This is what we are going to do on this list. So first of all, we need to know how we can standardize a given data set. So to do this, keep in mind that the Krabs data set, if we just uh, see the first element, so Krabs data head like this. So what we see from this data set? Well, we see that the relevant features that we saw it were them. These ones, the frontal lobe, the reread, grab base, me line, and so on. If we do a describe of them, basically of every column that we have and we take a look on the relevant features which are basically these ones right what can we see well for instance what about the frontal lobe the standard deviation is 3.49 so it is not one and the mean also is not zero it is 15.58 what about the rear width well the mean is 12.73 it is not zero and the standard deviation is also not one it is 2. Uh, 57 so now we will standardize this data set so now they all the, the relevant features will have mean zero and standard deviation one now to be able to do this to standardize the data we need to import here a new model from the, from the scikit-learn library it is also a pre-processing model so we can just copy this and paste here but now instead of the min max scalar that we did on the previous lesson we are going to import the standard standard scalar like so we run this cell again so now the notebook is up to date and so here let's standardize this data set so let's uh, clear this output firstly and to standardize this data set it is very very simple let's just define a new data set to have the standardized data so let's call it standardized this is going to be initially a copy of the original data set right so initially it is going to be the same so we can just use here the copy method of pandas and now keep in mind that we are only going to standardize the relevant features right so here let's just say uh, code grabs data head so remember that the relevant features are these five ones the as we can see from the lob, we read curve base midline, maximum width and body depth. And we have all of them on the data columns variable. Okay, if you look for data columns, here we have the relevant features. So now let's just apply this standardization on the relevant features. So the grabs standardized of the relevant features data columns. These are the relevant features that we are going to standardize. Then we use here the standard scalar. So we just type standard scalar. And now here on the argument, we need to uh, first use the method of fit transformation since we are going to transform a given data set. So fit transform. And now as the argument for the fit transform, we need to give the original data set, crumbs data with the relevant features, data columns like this. So this means we are going to standardize all of these features and save it in here right so let's run this very well now the data has been standardized and now when we again here on a new code window type grabs standardized head let's compare here we see the five first elements uh, of the non standardized data that means only the raw data so the frontal lob is 8.1 8.8 and so on so here on the standardized data we have minus 2.14 minus 1.94 right and something like so in the same way here we have different values and if we take a look at the last element so we just add here tail we run and here we also add tail and we run here we see the last five elements of the original data set the raw data we have these values 
and here we see also the five last elements but on the standardized data set and we see these values though they are different they are very very different okay so as we can see to verify that we have correctly standardized the data remember that we can see we did describe the mean and the deviation of each variable of each attribute right so here let's verify on the standardized that each of them have mean zero and standard deviation one so let's take a look at the frontal lobe so the mean is minus 7.1 times 10 with the raise to the power of minus a uh, 17 so this is a very very small number which is basically zero keep in mind that this is in scientific notation this is zero the standard deviation is also approximately one the same happens with the real width standard deviation one mean zero because this is a very very small number right this is also a very small number so we have zero zero standard deviation one standard deviation one so with this we verify that we have correctly standardized the data set some may say well but does this means that when you use the scalar that you just use now the standard scalar and when you used before the min max scalar they all do the same thing and the, the answer is no uh, keep in mind very important to standardize the data is not the same as to scale the data okay some people here may think that doing the scaling and doing the standardized is the same and the, the, the answer is no they're different uh, when we scale the data it means that all of the values are between 0 and 1 we just range the values all of these values here of these variables range from 0 to 1 the minimum is 0 the maximum is 1 however on the other hand when we standardize the data we don't care about the range of the data the only thing we care is that the mean is as we can see in here zero and the standard deviation is one so we don't care the range we only care the mean and the standard deviation okay so very important when you scale the data you set a range uh, normally and by default it is uh, from zero to one what we did in the previous lesson was basically to scale all the values from zero to one but we could also have chosen another range but we did uh, and then the normal one the usual one which is from zero to one but when we standardize the data uh, we always make sure that the standard deviation is one and the mean is zero of all of these variables that's the difference between scaling and we standardize the data all right so once we have the data standardized we can just uh, clear this output also we can clear this output and now we can proceed to apply this algorithm with the standardized data so we can just copy this uh, text window we're going to add a new text window here we just use uh, two dimensions so here two dimensions like so and now we apply the uh, t stochastic neighbor embedding using two dimensions on the standardized data and the way for doing this is the same we just change the data set where we are going to apply it so we just go here to the two dimensional on the scale data for instance right and here we copy the two dimension we copy this text window that you have we come here on the standardized data here below we just paste this in here right and now we just change here where we are applying this method but now instead of the uh, scale data crab's min max we use it on the standardized data so we change this min max to be the crab's standardized in the same way we want to add new columns on the standardized uh, data set so here we add these two new columns with these two components which is precisely what this returns this method returns two new components two columns with their values so we just set them to be in here and we plot it now the data set is not grabs min max but grabs standardized we only need to change this right so let's execute it and let's wait for the visualization and here we can see the separation of classes uh, on the standardized data right we are separating those instances of grabs depending uh, on their class that they belong to now keep in mind that at each time that you execute this method since this is an stochastic method you'll have a different results 
okay let's continue now with the three-dimensional so we just copy this text window we have a new text window here now three-dimensional plot uh, we do it in the same way as we did on the previous uh, lessons, right? It is no different. So here in the 3D, for instance, we copy this uh, and we have here two columns. So we copy this component and this code cell. And we also copy this other code cell. We come here and we paste it, right? And here uh, we are going to make sure that let's just change the data set so now instead of uh doing this on the scale data set we are doing this method on the standardized so standardized data set we are also going to add three new columns on the standardized data set this is going to be the values for the components and we can check that these new columns exist here with the head so standardized like so, so let's run this first of all and let's verify that on the scrap standardized data set we have three new columns or the three new dimensions very well okay here we see now let's plot it so on the plot figure uh, we need to change also the data set so this is not min max is standardized the same applies on the vertical axis the axis y and the z axis here right the depth shade is false we don't want different shading uh, for different depths so we want all of the data to have the same opacity uh, regardless of their depth so we set the depth shade to be false the colors now we use the same mapping process that we explained on previous lessons right the classes are going to be the keys and the colors are going to be the values associated with this keys such that we use a lambda function and the class column given a class x this is the key we will return the color graphs of x which is the value of this key as in essence the color corresponded to this class finally this argument s is basically the size of the markers that we want right so a common value is 800 so let's run this now let's wait for the execution and as we can see here we see this uh, 3d plot on the separation of the classes the separation of all the instances of this data set depending on the class that they belong to so we have used uh, many lines to do this right and we can do it a uh, shorter way using the pyplotlib express uh, remember that the pyplot express is another useful library that we can use uh, for plotting in python so we will do it in the same way that we did on the previous lesson okay we are going to copy this code window in another way to visualize this 3d plot this three-dimensional plot in here is using the uh, pyplot express so here we can do this with the px this is when we want to use the pyplot express we just type px then we here use the scatter3d method the plot is scattered in three dimensions now the data set is not grabs min max this is the data set for the scale data we want the data set for the standardized data so this is grabs standardized so we change this to be standardized the x is going to be the first component this one here uh, the y axis the second component and the z axis finally this uh, third component that we see in the data set the t stochastic neighbor embedding three right so once we have these uh, three components finally the color is just the class so we are able to visualize a 3d plot and the same results instead of using a mapping of colors and basically lots of lines of code with only two lines we can do this using the pyplotlib express right so to show the figure we can just use fig show and we run this cell we wait for the execution as we can see here we see this uh, 3d plot okay we can plot this visualization using three components three dimensions on the t -st stochastic neighbor embedding and we are doing this and applying this method on the standardized data well all of the variables have mean zero and all of the variables have standard deviation one right and we see here the visualization if we zoom this a bit out okay 
we can see that the color blue is for the blue male class the color uh red is for the blue female the color green for the orange male and finally the color purple for the orange female on this plot in here as we can see very well so with this we end the practice and the section on the algorithm of the stochastic neighbor embedding remember that on this practice we needed to separate all of the instances of the graphs of the data set, all of the elements of this data set, and we needed to separate them depending on their class and also visualizing this separation. We did this with the stochastic neighbor embedding technique, and we applied this technique on the raw data with no pre-processing at all, on the scale data and also on the standardized data. With this, we end this practice. Remember that you can download all of the notebook, okay? And you also have here on the last notebook all of the results so using the standardized data, using also the scale data, and also the raw data. And you can see all of these separations using this technique. I hope you have enjoyed the lessons. And with this practice, now you're already prepared to apply the stochastic neighbor embedding algorithm in Python and plot its visualizations. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will introduce the multidimensional scaling. The multidimensional scaling is a dimensionality reduction technique for visualization. That is, we have a very high dimensionality data set. So basically we have a very big data set with lots of features, lots of columns, right? We have lots of attributes and we cannot visualize this data set we have a high dimensionality so this is the idea what is the solution well we can use the multi-dimensional scaling technique to reduce this data set and be able to visualize it so how does this algorithm work on this lesson we are going to introduce the first notions of this algorithm and on the future lessons, we will apply these notions and use this technique on Python with a real data set. So the idea is that given a distance matrix with the distances between each pair of objects in the data set, right? Here is, we have the original data set. We calculate the distances between each point and a chosen number of dimensions. This chosen number N will commonly be two or three to visualize the data set using two dimensions or three dimensions the multi-dimensional scaling algorithm places each data each object into this new n dimensional space which is a lower dimensional space representation than the original number of dimensions that we have such that now the between object distances that this algorithm uses the least squares distances these distances are retained are preserved as well as possible so if we have two data points on the data set that if before they had a distance similar to five on this new lower dimensional space they will also have this a distance similar to five in fact the goal here is to have the same uh, distances right so we want to preserve the similarity and as we've mentioned when the n is one two or three we are able to visualize it okay commonly we will use two or three components uh, this means two or three dimensions on the multi-dimensional scaling and with this, uh, the resulting points can be visualized using a scatter plot. And this is what we will do on the practice of the multidimensional scaling project on the following lessons. We will have a data set and we will apply this technique to reduce the high dimensionality of this data set. So for this lesson, you only need to know that the multidimensional scaling is a dimensionality reduction technique and allows us to visualize high dimensionality data sets. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will use the multidimensional scaling technique to visualize the separation of these graphs on the data set 
using the four classes. We will use the multidimensional scaling using on this lesson two dimensions. So remember on the previous lesson we introduced this data set. It is a data set with information of the graphs. We have the species, the sex, and the relevant measurements, which are these ones, right? So we want to separate these graphs depending on the class that they belong to. And the idea is that we need to separate the classes depending on the sex of this graph and also the species of this graph. So essentially, we will now uh, need to create here a new column for the class basically given a crab we can know which class this crab belongs to with this column so to do this it is very very simple we are going to add a new code window in here and now the class is going to be the concatenation of the species and the sex and so here we can just access our data set which is crabs data here we are going to add a new column let's name this column to be class right and this is going to be just the concatenation of the species of this graph so we can access the value species and we concatenate this with the sex so here we add graphs data sex with this for each given instance for each given element on this data set this column value is going to be the value for the species concatenated with the value for the sex so we are going to run this very well and now we can uh, rerun this cell and we are going to see a new column so let's verify it we run again and here we see okay in the notebook we see a new column this is the column class after we executed this cell and as we can see this is nothing more than concatenation of the species of the crab with the sex uh, this crab one as the species blue and the sex male, that's why the class is blue male. If we check, for instance, the first 80 elements and we scroll down, for instance, this graph, the 75 uh, belongs to the species blue, the sex is female, that's why here the class is blue female. Okay, if we look at the last five elements with the tail method on the pandas, and as we can see here, this one orange female, so the class is orange female. Really simple, right? So here we have now a new column that basically tells us for each crab uh, which class this crab belongs to. Now we also need to define what are the relevant features, basically what are the attributes that we are going to use the multidimensional scaling on. So the idea is that here the relevant measurements of each crab are these ones, right? Here the measurements are the frontal lobe, the rear width, the uh, curve base midline, the maximum width of the curve base, and the depth body length. So here the relevant features are these five. We are going to, to use this dimensionality reduction technique from these five attributes, right? So it is very important to define these attributes. So we are going to define a new variable, a data columns, and this is going to store the columns that are relevant. So we can just copy this. We paste here. And now we define this to be a list okay, of strings. This is the first attribute. This is the second. Right. This is the third. This is the fourth element of this list. And this is the final fifth element of this list. So with this... We have on this variable the information of all the columns that are relevant, all the columns that we are going to use this dimensionality uh, reduction on. Right, so we run this cell again, and we have already this uh, variable defined. Very well. So now let's begin with the uh, multi-dimensional scaling. Also, we are going to change this uh, name of the notebook to be uh, MDS for multi-dimensional scaling. Uh, with two dimensions for this uh, lecture we're going to use here new uh, section so new text with two hashtags we have a heading and multi-dimensional scaling uh, let's just say 2d for two dimensions like so so here let's have a header for the general multi-dimensional scaling and here we will have another for uh, two dimensions like so so here remember from the multi-dimensional scaling 
that this model projects the data to a space with fewer dimensions, it is a lower dimensional space, trying to preserve the distances in the original space using a linear transformation using the least squares distances. Now, to use the multidimensional scaling in Python, we need to import from the library of scikit-learn. This is a free software machine learning library for the Python programming language. So we just type from a psyche learn in this way, then we access the manifold. Manifold learning is an approach to nonlinear dimensionality of reduction. And finally, we are going to import the multidimensional scaling. So we just type MDS like so. So when we do this import, we are now able to, to use this uh, method. Uh, however, to the visualization, we will need to import more libraries. First, the matplotlib library. So this uh, library, the matplotlib, okay, we can do it with import matplotlib, and then we type here pyplot period pyplot as plt. And the matplotlib library is a plotting library for the Python programming language that is widely used. Here we are using and the import from the pyplot. This is a state-based interface to matplotlib and it provides an implicit way of plotting so now whenever we want to use the matplotlib pyplot we just type plt and also we will need to import here the seaborn library so import seaborn as sns so now this library the seaborn library is a python data visualization library also based on matplotlib and it provides a high level interface for drawing attractive and informative statistical graphics that's why we're using this library to plot some of the graphics that we will need along these following lessons very well so once we have these imports done we need to rerun this cell so we run again very well now the notebook is up to date we can go here and we can start applying this multidimensional scaling on this data set so first of all we will need to use the multidimensional scaling method so here we are going to define a variable mds for the constructor of this method so here this method receives uh, three arguments the first one is the number of components that is the number of dimensions okay and this is an, in essence this chosen number of dimensions n that we did on the introduction lesson so in this example we're using two dimensions so here we just set this to two then here we have a second argument which is the n init now this value here n init is the number of times that the sma cof algorithm will be run with different initializations now what does this SMACOF algorithm mean? Well, this is an algorithm and it is a multi dimensional scaling algorithm which minimizes the objective function. This is called the stress. So, here the objective is to minimize this function, the stress, using a majorization technique. And this is a more, very more powerful than the traditional techniques such as the gradient density. And that's why we are using and that's why this method uses. So we are going to set this number of initializations to be 15. Now the final argument here, it is a Boolean argument. That means it can be true or false. And this is called the metric argument. If we set this to be true, we will perform a metric multidimensional scaling. Otherwise, if it is false, we will perform a non-metric multidimensional scaling. Just keep in mind that when we have this to be false, basically a non-metric multidimensional scaling, then the similarities with zero are considered missing values. So we will use here a matrix multidimensional scaling. That's why here we are going to set this to be true, like so. Very well. Once we have the constructor, this is the first step to have the constructor done. We will now fit this technique onto the data set. So now we need to fit it and we need to define a new data set. Let's just call it instead of Krebs data, Krebs 
uh, MDS for Krabs Multidimensional Scaling. This is the notation. And here we just type the constructor. Then we use the feed transform method. And here, as an argument, we need to pass the data set with the relevant features. And not only this, this data set needs to be scaled that this all the values of the relevant features must have the same range for instance from 0 to 1 so this is something that we need to do also so now we are going to add here a new text window and we are going to just set this to be scaling the data so here to scale the data set okay that we have here on the relevant features we are going to use the min max scaling to do this, we need to import the minmax uh, scaler from the scikit-learn library. So here from scikit-learn, we access the pre-processing pre -processing model. And here we need to import the minmax uh, scaler, like so. Okay, we run again. Now the notebook is up to date. And now we can proceed to scale our data. So here we are going to scale our data that means all of these values are going to be ranged from 0 to 1 okay so now the first thing is to define a new data set so since we are using the min max scaler min max for the name of this uh, new data set okay initially this is going to be a copy of the original one so that's why here we're just making a copy of this uh, raw data set right the grabs data and now the next thing here is to use the minmax scaler method only on the relevant features, only on the measurements, right? We are going to scale only these columns. So here we use this new data set. We access these relevant features from the variable data columns. As we can see here, we see this, we have these columns. And this is going to be equal to the minmax scaler. So we just type minmax scaler and we are going to apply it with the feed transform on the original data set with the original columns so here we just type grabs data data columns okay so with this we apply this uh, scaling to range the values from 0 to 1 these values that we can see let's erase this these values that we can see in here okay and we are going to store these new values that are ranged from 0 to 1 on this new data set so now we are going to run this so let's run and now let's verify that these values are going to be changed so here let's visualize the min max head so let's run this now and as we can see the frontal lobe the rear width the curve base mid line okay we begin to see different values than before this is because the values are ranged from zero to one in fact we can see the first uh, 100 elements in here and as we can see we keep incrementing the values from 0 to 1 okay every time uh, we can even describe this describe and we can verify that on each relevant feature the minimum value is 0 and the maximum is 1 the same for the rewrite minimum uh, 0 maximum 1 the same for the curve is midline 1 for the maximum width 0 1 and finally for the body depth zero and one so as we can see the data has been scaled and ranged correctly from zero to one right so now we can proceed here with the uh, multi-dimensional scaling and on this uh, method here feed transform instead of using the crabs data what are we going to write well we are going to write here the crabs min max this is the scaled okay the range data from zero to one data columns like this that's why here we use the mo the min max scaler so now then we can use the multi-dimensional scaling on this new data set now very important this here is going to return two columns basically it's going to return the two new dimensions that we want right so we need to uh, include these two new dimensions basically these two new columns on this uh, data set for the min max so here if we just type head for now we only have uh, the 
normal data set that we have uh, they are ranged but we have the the same number of columns we want to add these new two dimensions as columns here at the right basically these two new components to do this we just type grabs min max and to add two new columns we just add here the first column to be mds1 the second with the name of mds2 you can change the name here okay uh, you can choose any name you want we are going to choose these ones for the component one component two and we are going to set the values of these two new columns basically to be this all right keep in mind that this here returns two columns so here we are uh, setting the values for these two new columns on the data set to be precisely the results of the multi-dimensional scaling now before plotting the visualization using two dimension uh, there is a way of getting the final value of the stress this is the sum of the square distances of the disparities so we can obtain it and print it as just we print here we just type mds and we can access the stress underscore so this stress underscore indicates the final value of this stress keep in mind that we want to minimize this value so a smaller value will always be better than a very bigger value right so this is nothing more than mean squared error so here let's just define msc equal to the m in this stress and a comma to separate the string with the real value so keep in mind that this is the mean squared error so let's run this very well so with two dimensions we have this uh, mean squared error so in the following lesson we are going to do the same with three dimensions and see uh, if we have a smaller value okay we should get a smaller value since the more dimensions we have we will have a smaller value in here so now let's do the plotting so to do the plotting we will use here the pi plot uh, from the pi plot library so we are going to define the figure and we are going to create it with the pipe plot from the matplotlib. We can just use here the method figure, we just type figure, and we can also specify the size of this figure. So let's specify a size of uh, width 8 and height 8. Then to visualize this skater plot that we explained on the introduction lesson, right, this skater plot, we are going to use the Seaborn library. So Remember, whenever we want to use the Seaborn library, we need to type SNS. So we just come here and we type SNS. We use the method scatterplot of this library in here. So this method receives first the argument X. So what is going to be the X axis value? So with this, we know that this is going to be this column. In fact, we can verify before plotting that we have this new column. So we can just copy here, right? And since we have already run this cell, we can in here above, we can just write md or crops min max head. And as we can see, now we have these two new values for the uh, multidimensional scaling component one, component two. So the, the x here is going to be the component one then we need to specify the y this is the component two right then we specify the hue that is the separation criteria and since here the objective is to separate all of these graphs into four classes so the separation criteria is depending on the class that they belong to here the hue to differentiate the data we are going to use the class color right so here we just specify the class finally we specify the data set so now the data set is the grabs min max right which is precisely this data set here where all the relevant feature values have been ranged from 0 to 1 so now let's run this and verify and see this visualization using two dimensions very well so here we can see this separation of the graphs depending on the class that they belong to we can see here that the blue data is for the class blue male so here all the graphs in blue belong to the class blue male then these orange points are for the graphs that belong to the blue female class the green for the orange male and finally the red for the orange female we can see on this plot the separation 
of all of these crumbs depending on their class, which is precisely what we needed to do. And we did it with the multidimensional scaling technique. So on this lesson, we are using two dimensions. On the following lesson, we are going to use three. And also we are going to compute here the stress that is the mean squared error using three dimensions. Okay. This shall give a smaller result than this one, since we are going to increment the number of dimensions. So with this, we end this lesson. We remind the student that you can download all of this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. See you in the following lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we are going to finish the multidimensional scaling technique practice. On this lesson we are going to apply this technique using now three components, that is three dimensions. So remember the objective here is to separate all the graphs depending on their class. Here the separation criteria is the class. And on the previous lesson, we did this and we visualized the result using two dimensions. And we also here calculated the minimum squared error. Uh, on this case, it was 4.27. We are, we're only using two components of the multidimensional scaling. So now in this lesson, we will apply this technique using three dimensions. So instead of a plot in two dimensions, we will have a plot in three dimensions. We'll have three axes and we will also have a different minimum square error so let's copy this uh, window here 2d let's paste it in here below we are going to paste and now we're going to change this to or three we're going to use now three dimensions and here also the name of this notebook we were going to change it to be three dimensions so here first of all let's add a new code window we are going to define our constructor configuration for the multidimensional scaling. Here we use the multidimensional scaling method. And here we will have, uh, in essence, the same arguments. The only argument that we are going to change is the number of components. Since now we are going to use it in three dimensions. So here the number of components that we will use, the multidimensional technique, the number of components that we are going to take, are going to be three so here we change this to be three so we want to get this three new columns let's define this to be crabs multi-dimensional scaling so here we are going to use this multi-dimensional scaling constructor and we are going to apply it and to fit it on the data set that we have so we apply the fit transform and here we need to pass the data set but remember the data set needs to be ranged from 0 to 1. It needs to be scaled. And this is something that we had done on the previous lesson as well. Okay, here we did the, the scaling. We define a new data set with the name of grabs min max and all the values of the relevant features uh, have uh, in this range from 0 to 1. Okay, so they all belong to this range from 0 to 1. So instead of using here grabs data, we are going to use the grabs min max. Okay, this is something that we did on the previous lesson. And we are only going to apply this technique on the, the relevant measurements, right? Only on the relevant features and the relevant variables. In our case, these ones. In fact, they are the only ones that are continuous variables and not categorical or Boolean, right? So here we have these relevant features. We are applying this uh, multidimensional uh, constructor this technique and we are going to fit it on these relevant features so what this is going to return is going to return a total number of three columns so in this variable we have the information of these three new columns that are precisely the three new uh, components so we are going to proceed now to add three new columns on the data set keep in mind that what we have here on the crabs min max data set for now is only these uh, columns that we have initially uh, with the class also but we want to add three new columns that are the three new components so to do this we just copy the name of this data set here so grabs min max we can comment this to be add 
three new columns. They're going to be the components of the multidimensional scaling. So here to add three new columns, it is very simple. We just pass them uh, as a list. So here is going to be the name for the first column. Let's just name it uh, MDS1 for multidimensional scaling 1. This is the component 2. This is going to be the component 3, like so. And this is basically the names for the columns. So what are going to be the values of these columns? Well, the values of these columns are going to be precisely this, which is what we have in return of the function. Keep in mind that this returns three columns. So if we just copy this in here, we have that these new columns are going to have these values, which is precisely what we want here. So now we can let's run this. We are going to add also a new code window and let's verify that now we have new columns on the data set. So here we have the min max for the scale data set in this range within the range from zero to one. We run this and as we can see, Okay, we verify that we have three new columns, the component one, component two, and component three for the multidimensional scaling, right? So once we have verified this, let's clear the output. And so let's continue with the visualization. Um, before printing the visualization, let's verify that the stress, that is the minimum uh, squared error is less, and it is smaller than this value, which was the value with two components so let's do the same thing let's print here below the uh, stress which is the uh, minimum squared error and you can access with the name of the constructor and then this uh, argument here stress underscore so let's run this we wait for the execution and as we can see we have here a stress value a minimum squared error value that is smaller than the previous one Okay, so the model is fitting better than, than before. Keep in mind that the potential value we want, the desired value of this is going to be zero. If, we, if the stress is zero, it means that the model fits perfectly. Okay, so here the goal is to have the, as a low stress as possible. So very well, we also verified what we did and we discussed in the previous lesson that with more components, the stress is smaller. And so now let's do the visualization. Keep in mind that this visualization is going to be in three dimensions, right? So first of all, let's create a new figure. We can do this with the pyplot figure method. We can also specify the size of this figure. Let's maintain the same size as before with the width eight and the height eight. And now since we will have three uh, dimensions, we are going to add the new axis. So add new axis for the third dimension and we can add it with the figure object and here we can use the method add subplot okay this method can add a new axis and we are going to add the z axis this axis is an axis that is a one per one grid and also outputs one value and finally the projection is going to be in three dimensions so here the projection is going to be in three dimensions. Now, what does this one 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 mean? Well, it is precisely what we we said before. This one one, these first two ones represents that this z axis. This is the z axis. Is a one times one grid. This is true. It is only one line. And this final one represents that the z values output only one value. The z can be three, right? The z can be zero. Can be minus two. It can be five. So the output is only one single value. That's why here we have the last one. So this is the reason we have one, one, one. Whenever you want to add the third axis, you need to add here the three ones and then the projection to be in three dimension. And so now we can proceed to use the scatter plot. This scatter plot is a method from the pyplot library. And so here, the first argument, we need to specify the x axis that we are going to indicate here so here we can choose freely uh, each of these components we want so here we have three components right and we can set this x axis to be this one this one or this one let's just say that this axis to be uh, the uh, multi-dimensional scaling component one so here grabs min max and we just paste this this is going to be the x axis we can also have here the y axis to be the component two and finally, the z-axis, we need to specify that this is the z-axis. So here, the z-axis, this is going to be the uh, Krabs min max component three. 
Again, this is arbitrary, we can change this if we want. This is merely for the visualization, right? Now, the depth shade is also an argument on the skater plot that is important. Uh, what does this depth shade mean in here? Okay, so this is a method that basically changes. If this is true, if this is true, then the points or the, the data that have a bigger shade will have a bigger opacity. And the ones that are uh, with a smaller depth will have less opacity. So we want all the points in the scatter plot to have the same opacity, to have the same transparency. So we don't want depth shading. So this we said to be false. Okay. Finally, the last argument here is something to, to take into account because they are going to be the colors. In fact, we have two more arguments. Here, uh, this argument C is very important. This is the argument of the colors. That is, remember when we did the two-dimensional visualization, the class blue male was in blue, the one in blue female was in orange, the orange male was in green, and the orange female was in red. Each class had its own color. How can we do the same thing in a three-dimensional plot with the pi plot scatter plot? So what we're going to do is to define a mapping. In the sense of given a class, we'll have only one unique mapped value. So we're going to define this mapping here. Let's call this mapping and this dictionary color graphs. This is going to behave like a dictionary, like a map. And so in any dictionary, in any map, we first define the keys and then the value. So the key, for instance, blue. Let's start with the blue female. Blue female. So given this class, which color we are going to map this class to? Well, let's just map this to be yellow. Then we have the class blue male. Blue male. So let's just say that this blue male has the same color, blue. So we map it to be blue. Then we continue with the orange female class. So here we write the key orange and then we write the associated value. So to use the same one, orange female is in red. So here we just type R for red. Now, finally, the orange male key, so this is the key, and now we, we set the value. The orange, uh, let's just say here, the orange male, this is green. So here, let's also use the same color green. So with this, we have the mapping defined, the dictionary defined. Essentially, is given a key, we have the value, which is basically the color. Given the key blue male, we have the value B, which is the color. Given the key and the class orange female, we will have the value uh, red. Given the key for the class orange male, we will have the value G, which is the color green. So how can we use this map on this uh, data set? So the way to do this, it is very simple. We just type the name of the data set, crops min max, like this. And now here, we need to specify the column. Uh, name that we're going to do the mapping so the column name is class right and now we're going to apply a lambda function so we apply a lambda function that given an element x now this element is going to be the class it's going to be the key we are going to return the value associated with this class that is these colors here so we just type the name of this dictionary and with index this key so basically what we're doing is given a class X, given this key or this key or this key, we are going to return the associated value. That is the color of this class. Very well. Now, finally, the last argument of the scatter plot is the size of the markers. A common size to choose is, for instance, a hundred. This is essentially how big the markers we will be. Very well. Once we have this scatter plot defined, we can now run this cell. So let's run it. And as we can see here, we can see the visualization of the separation of the crabs depending on their class, which is precisely what we need to do with this practice. And here we can see the separation in three dimensions. We have here three components for the multidimensional scaling. Now keep in mind that you can, for instance, change this uh, y to be the component 1 and the x to be the component 2. You can run again and basically your point of view is going to be uh, rotated 
right? We are going to choose and to maintain here the component one, component two for a better visualization. But keep in mind that you can change this axis if you wish. Now keep in mind that this is a stochastic model. That means on each execution we will have different results. So we execute again and we can see here now this result, this new visualization and this new error and the new value for this stress. We can run again. And as we can see, the stress value and the results has been changed. This is because the multidimensional scaling is in a stochastic model. The same happens in two dimensions. Okay, at each time that we execute the two-dimensional technique, we have here different values for the stress and also the visualization changes because our results changes. Very well, now to finalize and to terminate this lesson, we're going to see another intuitive way of plotting this three-dimensional technique uh, using another library in a very shorter way. So instead of writing all of these lines, we can do it in a very shorter way. And we can do it with the Plotly Express library. So we add a new code window. And we also will need to import the Plotly Express library. So in here, we just type import Plotly Express as px. The Plotly Express is the easy to use high level interface to Plotly, which operates on a variety of types of data and produces easy to style figures. Plotly Express provides functions to visualize a variety of types of data. So we run this code again, this imports. So now the notebook is up to date. We go below. And now to uh, plot here this three dimensional plot using the Plotly Express library is as simple as we define the figure to be the Plotly Express. And here we just type figure. And to make this even shorter, since we are going to use a scatter plot and it's going to be in three dimensions, we can just type scattered 3D like so. Now, the first argument is the data set that we are going to operate with. So in our case, it is the data set grabs min max with a range value for the relevant features, right? It is this data set in here. Then we specify the x axis. So we can just specify with the name of the column. So here, let's just say that this is the x axis. Then we specify the y axis. So the y is going to be the component two. And finally, the Z axis is going to be the component three. Now, finally, to specify the color of the data points, right? Uh, it is as simple as here. We just specify the class is going to uh, determine the color. So instead of using a dictionary or a map that we used previously uh, in here, we define a dictionary in the mapping of the colors. And we did it with a Lambda function in this extensive way with the PyPlot scatter method in here we can just set the color to be equal to the class so we just type color equal to class like this and with this very one line we have this scatter plot now to show the figure we can just type fig dart show so let's verify this we run and as we can see here we can observe and plot the visualization of the separation between the grabs depending on their class that they belong to. We can also see here if we zoom in that the marker points in blue are for the blue male, the ones in uh, orange are for the blue female, the ones in green for the crabs that belong to the class orange male and the ones in purple for the crabs that belong to the class orange female. And keep in mind that we're able to see this and plot this visualization with only two lines of code using the Plotly Express library. Right, and we can see here this separation between the graphs depending on their class that they belong to. Here we see these three components of the multidimensional scaling. Very well, with this we end this practice. Remember that you can download all of the notebook and all of this code on the downloadable documents of this lesson. And with this, we end the multidimensional scaling practice. I hope you have enjoyed the lessons. And with this practice, now you are ready prepared to apply the multidimensional scaling technique 
in Python and understand its visualizations. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will introduce the isomap technique. The isomap is a dimensionality reduction technique for visualization. So the idea is that we have a very high dimensionality data set. We have a data set with lots of features, lots of variables and lots of attributes in this data set. We are not able to visualize this large dimensionality data set. So the solution is to use the isomap technique to reduce this dimensionality. And with this, we will be able to visualize the data set and the relation between those attributes. So let's have a first intuition of how this algorithm of the isomap technique works. Initially, we need to determine the neighbors of each point, the neighbors of each instance of the data set. Keep in mind that each of these elements on our data set is a data point. And so we determine the neighbors of each data point. We can uh, set all the points in some fixed radius, or we can also execute here the k nearest neighbors. This last option is most common. Then, once we have the neighbors for each point, we build a neighborhood graph. This means on this neighborhood graph that each point is connected to other if and only if it is a k nearest neighbor. Then also the edge length is equal to the Euclidean distance between those points. The next step is to compute the shortest path between two nodes. We can use Dijkstra algorithm, which is an algorithm for finding the shortest paths between nodes in a graph. We can also use the Floyd Warshaw algorithm, which is an algorithm for finding the shortest paths in a directed weighted graph. Once we have the shortest paths between all of two pairs of nodes in this neighborhood graph, then we compute a lower dimensional embedding. Normally, we will use the multidimensional scaling. So this is a very high level description of the isomap algorithm. On the following lessons, we will apply this technique on a real data set, we will have a high dimensionality data set, and we will use this isomap technique to reduce the dimensionality of the data set and also visualize the classes of this data set. We'll see how we can do this using Python. Hey everyone, on this lesson, we will apply the isomap technique using two dimensions. So in the previous lesson, we introduced the data set. We saw that this was a data set with the information of 200 crabs. And so the objective here is to separate these 200 crabs into four classes, into four groups or four clusters, given by their sex and their species. We will use the isomap technique here it is a dimensionality reduction technique to visualize this separation between the classes. So here, first of all, let's change the name of this notebook from introduction to the data set to isomap with two dimensions. Just type isomap with two dimensions. And here we are going to add a new text window. Uh, let's use hashtags for the heading and this is isomap and then here below, we just add the uh, window for two dimensions. This is first two dimensions. On the following lesson, we are going to see how we can do the same thing, the same visualization and this dimensionality reduction technique of the isomap using uh, instead three dimensions. For now, we are only going to use it with two dimensions. So here, before anything, since the objective is to separate these crabs depending on their class, we will now create a new column for the class. This column is nothing but the concatenation of the species and the sex, right? So, for instance, if we have this crab here, this class is going to be the class orange female, 
and if we check here the first with the head function we can see that for instance the scrub with the identifier zero since it belongs to the split is blue and it is a male crab, then the class is going to be blue male, right? So this is going to be how we are going to define these classes. So let's do this now. Let's add a new column. So let's here create a new code window. And the way to define this new column for the class is very simple. To add a new column in the pandas data set, we just type the name of the data set, in our case, crabs data. Here we type the name of the column we want. So we want the name to be class, right? So here we just type class. And this is going to be the concatenation of the species, grabs data species, and the sex of the graph, like so. Grabs data sex. So let's run this window. We run it and now let's uh, update this. And now when we update this cell, we are going to see this new uh column for the class so let's verify this we run this cell and as we can see here we have the class that this crab belongs the same for this one we can check for the first hundred of crabs and depending on their species and their sex uh, they are going to have a class or another so for instance this crab it is a crab for the species blue sex female so the class is blue female if we check the last elements with the tail method of the pandas data frame we see here for instance this graph species orange sex female so the class is orange female right once we have this column the column for the class we can begin to use the isomap technique and also before using this technique let's define the columns that we are going to apply this technique on keep in mind that here the relevant measurements the relevant features are these ones these five measurements the frontal lobe the rear width the curve base midline the maximum width and the body depth right these are the measurements the relevant features of this data set in fact they are the only continuous variables so we are going to apply the isomap technique onto these variables so here let's define for instance the data columns this is going to be basically a variable to store all the relevant features so we will begin with the frontal lobe Basically, we are storing here the name of all the relevant features. Then we have the rear width. Then we also have here the curve base midline. So we can just copy here the curve base midline. We paste. We continue with the maximum width column. And finally, the body depth, right? This is the last relevant feature. So here we just add the body depth like so. So let's run this so the notebook is up to date and now we're ready uh, we have here on this variable all the relevant attributes all the relevant features and the relevant columns that we will apply the dimensionality reduction technique and in fact these are the columns that we want to study we want to study the relation of these values depending on their class so for instance a class that is orange female will have different values of these measurements than a given class to be for instance blue male right this here blue male class will have similar values for the measurements and on the other hand the orange female will have other values right so this is what we want to study so these are the the measurements that we are going to study very well so let's start here with the isomap technique keep in mind that to use the isomap technique we need to import the isomap method from the scikit-learn library so we go here on the libraries window and here we type from the scikit-learn library this is a free software machine learning library for the python programming language and here we access the manifold model here this manifold of the psyche learn the manifold learning is an approach to the non-linear dimensionality reduction which is precisely what this isomap belongs to so from here we are going to import the isomap just like that so with this okay and this is in lowercase isomap we are ready to start using this uh, isomap technique this dimensionality reduction technique that belongs to the psyche learn library so here 
even though with this we are ready to, to, to apply this technique and uh, to use this dimensionality reduction method, since we want to visualize the results, we will also need to import here some libraries in Python that allows us to do the visualization. One of them is the matplotlib library. We can do that in here, for instance. We just import matplotlib. Matplotlib is a plotting library for the Python programming language. And we are going to import the pyplot model of this library. This is a state-based interface to matplotlib. It provides an implicit way of plotting that we are going to use in this lesson. So we are going to import the pyplot from the matplotlib library as plt. So whenever we want to use pyplot, we can just type a plt and also another library that we are going to import to do our visualizations is the seaborn library so we can just here import seaborn as sns like so seaborn is a python data visualization library based on matplotlib and it provides a high level interface for drawing attractive and informative statistical graphics very well once we have done all the imports the use map method from the scikit-learn library and also the visualizations libraries that we'll use to visualize this result so let's update the notebook so we can rerun here we run this cell again so now the notebook is up to date and we can start using the isomap technique the isomap model tries to maintain the geodesic distances between all points this is the shortest distance between two points on a plane. Keep in mind that if this surface is a plane, this geodesic distance is going to be the same as the Euclidean distance. So formally, the geodesic distance is the shortest distance between two points on a surface. And if this surface is a plane, then this is the same as computing the Euclidean distance. So let's start applying this technique. On this lesson we will use this technique with two components so with two dimensions so here we are going to start by defining the constructor of the isomap so let's define here a variable for instance with the name of isomap this is going to be the variable that we are going to start the method of isomap now this method here the isomap method is the one that we have imported here above right so here when we just write isomap we can pass the arguments we want. So first of all, we have the number of components. This is the number of dimensions. How many new columns, right? We will basically reduce this dimensionality to a new one. So keep in mind that if we have five relevant features, we have five relevant measurements. How many new columns will we have? Well, in this case, two new columns, right? So here, the number of components is the number of dimensions is going to be equal to two. Now, the second argument we need to pass here is the number of neighbors, that is, the number of neighbors to consider to each point, to each instance of the data set. So, remember on the ISO map, okay, we determine the neighbors for each point and we can do it in two ways. We can uh, look for all the points in some fixed radius, so we can give the radius, or we can find the k nearest neighbors from that point. So what we will do with this function, with this method of the isomap, is the k nearest neighbors. Okay, you can also specify the radius, like so. Imagine you can just set here radius to be six, so you look for all the neighbors in this uh, radius. However, we are not going to use the radius. We are going to define the number of neighbors we want. So here we just type n underscore neighbors, neighbors. And with this, we can find the k nearest neighbors from that point. So we are going to choose for this example a total number of 10. So here, the value k for the k nearest neighbors is going to be 10. Again, you can change this value if you want. Now, this is only the configuration for the initialization of the isomap. We are not applying the isomap to this data set yet. So first of all, needs, we need to apply this to the data set. So we are going to define here the graphs isomap, okay, where we are going to basically apply this configuration to the data set. So to apply it, we just type the configuration name, then we write fit 
transform and then on the argument of the fit transform we pass the data set so keep in mind that this data set that we have here originally is a data set where all the relevant measurements values basically have their own range uh, if we consider the 51st elements let's just consider them for now we see for instance that the frontal lobe has this range of values then the the rear width another range the curve is midline another range of values the maximum width another range and the same for the body depth in fact we can also see the minimum and the maximum of each attribute we did describe if you have a data set in pandas and you just type describe you can see the minimum the maximum the mean also the standard deviation and so on so frontal lobe here the minimum is 7.2 the maximum is uh 23.1 rear width what about the rear width well the minimum is 6.5 the maximum is 20.2 the curve is midline the minimum is 14.7 the maximum 47.6 and the same for the maximum width and body that they have the own range right the values so what we need to do to apply this dimensionality reduction uh, technique of the ISO map and obtain better results is to range all of these values all of these attributes to have the same range for instance from 0 to 1 so essentially this method projects the data into a lower dimensional space trying to preserve the distances right the geodesic distances between neighbors so since this method is based on local distances it is very important that all variables have the same range otherwise a variable with large values or very small values also could confuse the model so first of all we need to scale all variables to have the same range let's add a new text window here let's just say scale and inside here we are going to scale all the relevant features keep in mind that since we are only going to apply this technique to hear the relevant features we are only going to scale these features right which is here the data columns uh, for the columns now to do the scaling we need to import here a library with the name of min max scaler from the scikit-learn pre-processing library so let's go here above and from the scikit-learn from sk learn we are going to access the pre-processing model and we are going to import here the min max scaler like so so with this import let's run again now the notebook is up to date and here to scale all of these variables to have the same range let's also here uh, leave this described we are going to clear the output a new code window grabs data head so here we can see the original data set with the first five elements of the original data set right and we can compare when we scale so let's define here a new data set name for the scale variables to have all in the same range for instance let's use the name grabs min max because we are using here the min max scaler from the scikit-learn library initially this is going to be a copy of the original data so grabs data copy right and here we are going to apply this transformation so the new data set the columns that are the relevant features that is the data columns right we are going to to scale so that they they are in the same range only the relevant features so here only the relevant features so here to apply the min max scaler we just type min max min max scaler and this from this method we will apply the fit transform function that we'll receive as the argument the data set that we want to have this range scaling so we are going to access the original data set in this case the grapes data so grabs data and here only the relevant feature so we are only going to access the columns that are the data columns right the relevant measurements so with this we are basically defining that this data set is the copy of the original one and that the relevant measurements will be scaled from 0 to 1. Here you can also specify on the fit transform uh, an argument that basically tells what is going to be the range instead of from 0 to 1 for instance all the columns to, to be in the same range from minus 2 
to 2 or from minus 5 to 5 okay uh, if you don't specify this you have the behavior by default and this is from 0 to 1 okay we are going to leave it like this from 0 to 1 is a good range to have them the only thing to take into account is that it is very very better to have all variables in the same range in this case from 0 to 1 very well so let's run this cell okay and now we can verify with the grabs min max head method for instance with this we can verify and check the first five elements and compare with these five elements so let's run this so as we can see now the grab with identifier zero has a value of the frontal lobe to be 0 0.056 and before we had this value the same for the re width now we have this value 0 0.01 for the first grab and here we had something like 6.7 in fact as well as we did before to check the minimum and the maximum and we saw that they were different here we can do the same thing we can just use the describe method in pandas and now if we can see when we run this the minimum value of the frontal lobe is zero the maximum is one the same for the rear width minimum zero maximum one and the same for the rest of the continuous variables that are the relevant measurements that we have so all in all we can verify that this data set has been ranged all the values now have the same range from zero to one so why is this important well as we've said because we're working with distances with local distances we don't want outliers to confuse the model and once we have ranged these columns these uh, variables we can now pass here on the isomap fit transform the data set but the data set already scaled so as we can see here we can just pass the crabs min max data set and we are going to apply this technique only to the relevant features so the data columns uh, in that sense here we are only going to access these uh, relevant features columns right so with this we apply the isomap technique and we apply it onto this data set onto this variables and what do we obtain from this very important here to, to take into account this is going to return two components okay uh, in essence this is going to return two columns and these columns with their values are going to be stored on this variable and these two columns are the columns that we want to add on this data set so let's add these two new columns that are going to be the components onto this data set so to add let's just say add components to the data set yeah, keep in mind that we are going to add them to the uh, scale data set so here we just type the name of the data set grabs min max and here to ask, uh, to add two new columns we can just pass the name of the columns with a list so here let's just say that the first component is going to be the isomap one and the second column the second component will have the name isomap two right and here to add these columns we just here set them to be precisely this right keep in mind since this returns the two components and we want these two new columns to have the values of the components we can just set them to be equal to the graphs isomap like so so let's run this and once this has already run let's verify that we have indeed let's run here the the same head or let's do it here below if we just type graphs min max head now we should see two new columns that correspond to the two new components of the isomap and this is precisely what we see here we see the first component of the isomap and here the second component because we are using this with two dimensions so this is precisely applying the technique with this we have the two components now the objective of this lesson is to separate these graphs into four classes right so here we also need to visualize it so to visualize it now we will basically visualize these two components and see how they change how the values of the relevant measurements change depending on the class that the given graph is so with this idea we can study that different uh, graphs from different classes will have different values of the relevant measurements you can also interpret these two components as a summary of this 
right basically we take all of this and we reduce this dimensionality such that all this information is now retained with only two columns right this is essentially what we do with any dimensionality reduction technique very well so now let's do the visualization let's create a new figure now to do the visualization we are going to use here the pyplot library from the matplotlib so here we can just type figure and we use the pyplot fig gear method like so and here we can also specify the size of this figure let's specify a size for instance with uh with eight and height weight uh eight also okay this is a sufficient uh, size for this figure so with this we create a new figure so now let's visualize in in a scatter plot these two dimensions right these two components so to do this to represent the scatter plot we are going to use the seaborn that's why we also imported this library so here we just type the seaborn library so we just type s and s then we write scatter plot this is a method from the seaborn library the first argument that we need to specify is the axis uh, x so what is going to be the x axis in here well precisely this the isomap one right so this is going to be the x axis then the y axis is going to be the second component so the isomap two right like so and very very important this third argument what is going to be the hue now the hue is our separation criteria how we are going to separate this scatter plot basically to have different colors so keep in mind that we want to do this separation in this practice depending on their class right we want to separate graphs with their class so here the separation criteria the hue is going to be the class like so right with this we have basically to see different graphs with different classes will have different colors finally the last argument is basically the data set and as we know the data set is going to be the grabs minimax the data set with the scaled values with all the same range yes as we here uh, just did this is the grabs minimax data set right so let's run this also we are going to clear the output below and let's run this cell very well and now as we can see here we have the visualization here we have the plot of the isomap using two components two dimensions in it we can see and we can visualize the separation between the classes between the four classes uh, moreover we can also see that for instance the class blue male is all these points in blue the class uh, blue female is all the the points in orange the orange male the points in green and the orange female class corresponds to the points in red and as we can see here we have groups we have clusters and we can see the separation between all of the graphs depending on their class we can see that here we have for instance let's start with the blue male class all of these points in blue they all are together okay they are grouped this means that they will have similar values for the relevant measurements okay on the other hand the class orange female since their group is very distant from the points in blue they will have different values okay from the blue class but since this orange female class the points in red are also grouped into a cluster this means that they will also share uh, among them okay inside the same class they will have similar values from these measurements so that's why a dimensionality reduction technique is so important because we can extract conclusions between this visualization and justify that graphs that belong to the same class will have similar values on these relevant measurements and graphs that belong to different classes will have different values of these relevant measures we can also see that for instance the class blue male and the class orange male may share some similarity because they are they are uh, close to each other in the same way the class orange or in this case blue female right this orange with the class orange female these points in red also will share some similarity between the measurements because they are close together okay but we, if we take a crab that belongs to the class orange male and another crab that belongs to the class orange female, 
they will mostly not share any similarity of these values in here yeah more things that we can do to finish this lesson well another thing that we can compute here is the reconstruction error for embedding in any dimensionality reduction technique we'll have some error and our goal is to minimize this error to make this error as small as possible so here we are going to print it before plotting this uh, visualization so just print and to print this reconstruction error it is very simple we just access here let's just type here reconstruction error like this and here we can just type the isomap constructor that is the isomap configuration so isomap and then we access here the attribute reconstruction error so this reconstruction error this is in fact a method that returns the reconstruction error with this configuration that is two components and a number of neighbors to be equal to 10 so let's uh, run again this we put a comma here to separate the string with this value and we run and as we can see here the reconstruction error is a very minimalist error that is 0.0095 right this is the error that we have for embedding when we are using two components with two dimensions so in the next lesson we will do the same thing we will apply the same isomap technique but now with three components and we will see also that this error is going to be reduced that is as more components we have and we take the less is the error of embedding very well with this we end this lesson we have seen and plotted the separation between the graphs depending on their class we remind the student that you can download all of the notebook and all of the code that we have on the downloadable documents of this lesson see you in the following lesson where we apply the isomap technique to this data set using three components three dimensions hey everyone in this lesson we will apply the isomap technique using three dimensions on our data set on the previous lesson we applied this technique and visualized the separation of the graphs using two dimensions and in this lesson we'll use here three components of the isomap so given the initial data set we scale the data set so that all the values of the relevant features have the same range this is important since the isomap tries to, to preserve the geodesic distances so we work with local distances so it is very important that we work with the same range all variables have the same range otherwise a variable with large values or with also small values could confuse the model and we will not obtain the very best results out of this so we scale those variables to do this we just apply the min max scaler remember we imported this from the previous lesson right and we use this min max scaler to scale all the variables then we just apply the isomap we also imported the isomap method from the psyche learn library we apply here the isomap we saw that we had two new columns in fact here we can see we have two new columns for the two new components the column one for the component one of the isomap this is the dimension one and then the isomap two which is the component two the dimension two right once we have these two new columns we just visualize it on the separation between classes so now we are going to do the same thing but instead in two dimensions we are going to take three components so we will have three dimensions let's add a new text window here we will have the window for the three dimensional isomap remember also that we need to compare the reconstruction error using two dimensions and using three dimensions okay when we used uh, with two dimensions we have this reconstruction error and we also discussed that as we increment the number of dimensions this reconstruction error tends to decrease right so now when we apply this with three dimensions the reconstruction shall be smaller so here let's start let's set a new code window let's define the isomap configuration so the isomap construction is going to be the method isomap and now the number of components instead of two right we will have three let's just copy the same initialization 
Now the number of components is three because we will have three dimensions. And let's set the number of neighbors also to be 10. Remember that we can choose if we take the k nearest neighbors, in this case the k is 10, or we can also choose a given radius, right, to take all of the neighbors. This was one of these two options, right? One was to take all the points in some fixed radius in the area from this data point, from this instance, and the other to take the k nearest neighbors. You need to choose only one. You need to decide to choose only one, okay? On this lesson, we are going to work with the ISO map with the k nearest neighbors uh, decision. Okay, so here the choice is basically to take the 10 nearest neighbors from this data point. And we will do the same thing for all the data points in the data set, and then we will try to preserve and retain the geodesic distances, right? So this is the configuration. Now we apply the ISOMAP technique with this configuration on the data set. So here let's just apply it. We are going to create a new uh, variable to have these three new components, so ISOMAP. And here is where we apply it. So to apply, we just type the name of the constructor, the name of the configuration, in this case ISOMAP. Then we apply here the method that is called the fit transform. And now this method receives as an argument the data set. However, this data set is the data set range, is the Krabs mean max data set, not the all original data set. Remember that when we scaled, all the variables that were the relevant features have the, the, the same range, which is 0, 1. Keep in mind here the minimum of these variables is 0, the maximum is 1. Minimum 0, maximum 1. And the same for all the relevant features, which are here these continuous variables, right, on the data set. Before, we had not this. We didn't have this before because here the minimum was this value, maximum this value. Minimum this value, maximum this value. So they do not share here the same range. And once we scale them, once we apply the min max scaler, then all of them have the same range. So we are going to here uh, access this data set, the Krabs min max, and only the relevant features, right? The frontal lobe, we read, curve pace midline, maximum width and body depth. So here we just need also the index of the relevant columns. So the data columns. And here we just type Krabs min max the name of the new data set with the scale variables and here data columns like this right so with this we have the uh, process and the application of the isomap technique this is going to return three columns three components of the isomap okay so we can now add three new columns in the same way that we added before only two now we can add three new columns. So we just type the, the data set that we are working now, the range data set, grabs min max, right? And now to add three new columns, it is the same idea as we did before. We do it in a list. Here we type the name of the first column, isomap1. Then the second, isomap2. And then finally, the third component for the dimension three, isomap3. Once we have the names of the new columns, how can we define these columns, the value of these columns? Well, we can just here set them to be equal to this one. Keep in mind that this is going to be the value of the returning of this call. And this equation, as we said, is going to return three columns with the values of these components. So this variable has the information of the first three components that we have chosen. So the three components of the isomap. And we set them to have here these values. So let's run this. Very well. And as we have run this, let's set a new code window. And let's verify that we have now three new columns. So grabs minimax. Let's check the first elements with the head a method in pandas. So as you can see, we find three new columns, okay, of the isomap. Okay, this means that we have applied correctly this isomap technique. So now let's proceed with the visualization. Uh, right, uh, one thing that we need to do is to apply the isomap, and then to do this for this practice, we need to visualize the separation between the grabs depending on their class that they are to. Right, so to do this visualization, we are going to use the pyplot library from my plot lib. And since this is a three dimensional uh, view in a three dimensional plot, it is going to differ a little from the previous one. 
okay so the first thing that we are going to do is to create a new figure okay so here let's define the method of the pipe plot figure this is going to create a new figure we can also specify the size let's just say size 8 8 so width 8 and height 8 like this now this basically creates a figure however this only has two axes for the two-dimensional view but we want now a three-dimensional view so we need to now add the third axis for this so to add a, a new axis we are going to use here the constructor fig for the figure and then there is a method that is called add subplot yes this is going to create a new axis and we can specify here we have two two things to specify the second thing is the projection keep in mind that this is going to be a three-dimensional plot so the projection is 3d and then the first argument is a series of binary numbers now this axis that we are going to add is going to be a one per one grid and is going to return an output of one that's why here we are adding one 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 now here very important to understand these first two ones represent that we are adding an axis that is a line a one times one grid right a line on one dimension and this last one represents that the value z or this third axis can only have one unique value it can be z equal to one z equal to three and so on so the output is also one right that's why here we have these three ones once we have this new axis we can proceed to draw the scatter plot in three dimensions so to do this we just type the pi plot then we write the scatter method like this and now here the first argument specifies the first component basically the x-axis of the scatter plot so the x-axis on this scatter plot is going to be the first component so we can just specify this column we just type the data set so it describes min marks and then we write the name of the column in this case isomap1 here we just write isomap1 this is the x-axis then we specify the y-axis so the y-axis is going to be the isomap2 right so here we just specify isomap2 and then since this is going to be a three-dimensional plot we need to specify that this is the x z s so it is a secondary axis of the axis z it is the third dimensional view and then we just specify that this is going to be the third component so here we write grabs min max isomap 3 right the component 3 in this case also let's change the name of this notebook instead of isomap with two dimensions with three dimensions in this case moreover when we are working with the scatter plot of the pipe plot library there's an argument that is called the depth shade here this is a boolean argument it means that this can be true or false and essentially what this does is that when this is true okay, this means that the points that have higher depth will have more opacity in the scatter plot and the points with low depth will have less opacity we don't want this we want all of the points all of the data plotted in the scatter plot to have the same opacity to have the same transparency but to make this we need to set this to be false this means that all of the data points all of the the markers and all of the instances on this plot will have the same opacity and the same transparency now another important argument on the scatter plot is the color so here we define the color c and here keep in mind that we have a three-dimensional plot and we want ideally that each class has its own color in the same way as we plotted in the two-dimensional view right the class blue male was all the points in blue the class blue female all the points in orange and so on so how can we do exactly the same thing such that each class will have its own color well to do this we will define a dictionary in python or what is called also mapping that for each class blue male here uh, blue female orange male orange female will have its own color so here we are going to define it below, above right let's define this dictionary to be the name colors drops okay for instance and we are defining 
first of all for instance the class blue male okay so this class blue male let's define this class to be the color blue so here we define with two points and then the value of this key and we say it to be b this is because this b okay is a key point for being the color blue in the pi plot scatter plot so whenever you define here uh, b you'll have blue in fact here if you just define the color to be blue, b then all of the data points will be blue yeah, we don't want this we want each class to have its own color so the class blue male will be the color blue we continue defining with the class blue female here we define the class blue female let's just define this to be for instance yellow okay then we uh, keep defining now the class orange male so this class orange male let's just do the same here it was green so here let's define it to be green also this is going to be g for green and then finally the class orange female let's uh, represent it in red as well so here the class orange female we are going to define it to be red so we write an R since this R stands for the color red in the skater plot. So we already have the dictionary, we already have the mapping that given a class, right, given a key of this dictionary, we have its associated key, um, in this case value, right? For each key we have its associated value. We have a mapping where each key has its own value, right? The, the key blue male has the value blue, the key blue female the value uh, yellow and so on. So how can we apply this dictionary and how can we include this dictionary on this uh, data set, right? And such that for each class that we have, we will have its own uh, value, its own color. So to do this, we will access the data set, which is scrubs min max. The column that we are going to separate is going to be the class, right? And inside this class, we are going to apply a lambda function. And this lambda function is going to be given an input x this is going to be the class so given the class we are going to return the value associated to this class so here we return the value of this dictionary so here very important to remember that when you have a dictionary like this okay imagine that you have this dictionary and you define something like this print colors graphs and here you type blue female okay if you write something like this, uh, what is going to be print in here is basically the uh, the character uh, Y here. Because when you access this, you're returning the value of the dictionary. Okay, this is not going to print blue female. This is going to print Y because it is the value associated with this key. The same way if here you try to write orange male and you print this, uh, the value that you'll see on the output when you print is going to be a G. Okay, this character G, because this is the value associated with this key. So essentially, this is precisely what we are doing here. When we say given an argument X, given a value for this class, this is going to be the, the key, given this key X, we are going to return this, which is the value and precisely the color. So with this, the color of the data points on this skater plot is going to depend on the class, okay? Depending on if we are in, with a class or another class, we'll have a color or another color. And with this, all crabs with the same class will have the same color, right? And crabs that belong to different classes will have different colors. So that's how we define the color in a three-dimensional plot, right? Now, the last argument here on the skitter plot is the argument for the size of the markers. And this is precisely how big the markers are going to be shown. Um, a size of 800 is here sufficient. Okay? And with this, we are going to see the skitter plot, which is going to be the, the visualization of this isomap technique applied to this data set. We are going to visualize the separation between the classes in three dimensions right so we are going to erase here the print let's erase this let's run this code cell very well and as we can see here we see the separation between the classes we can also see here the reconstruction error that we have when we use three components of the isomap 
remember from the previous lesson we saw that we had an error that was 0.0095 when we used two components so again let's apply here and let's print this reconstruction error okay so let's do it here below plotting so before plotting let's just print this reconstruction error the same way okay here to print the reconstruction error you can just access the constructor of the isomap and you write a reconstruction error this is a method that returns the reconstruction error for embedding associated with this isomap so we run this again and as we can see here we have the reconstruction error now is in this case 0 0.0076 so 0 0.0076 and this is smaller okay than before so as we discussed on the previous lesson this is because as we take and we take more components the smaller the reconstruction error is going to be right so with this we see this uh, separation between the classes uh, the separation is very very bright to see the, the the data points in blue are the as we can see here the blue male the blue female the ones in yellow and, and so on and we can see that since they are separated in clusters in two groups then the class blue male will have similar values of the relevant features the class uh, blue female will have another and similar values for the uh, relevant features right and graphs that belong to different classes will have different values and this difference is going to be bigger depending on the, the classes we choose for instance a graph that belongs to the class red which is the class orange female we have uh, will have very different values of the relevant features than a class of the blue male which is a data point here in blue because they are very distant to each other and on this plot we can also see in view how each class will have its own color right for instance here if in the color we just type this to be blue we just type it this to be blue like so and we run this then we'll see that all the data points will be blue and we will not be able to see the separation between the classes neither the isomap technique only the structure right so here we will maintain them to be uh, each class its own color to have the visualization of the isomap dimensionality reduction technique now with this we can see this separation which is precisely what this practice is all about right we are applying this dimensionality reduction technique of the isomap to visualize the separation between the classes and see that they will have similar values of the relevant attributes of the relevant features right if one graph and another belong to the same class then they will have similar values of these relevant features so there is also another way of plotting in in three dimensions and it is using the pyplot express library and we'll also uh, visualize it using the pyplot express uh, we'll have the same visualization the same skater plot but with shorter lines so here to visualize it it will be shorter so we'll also see how we can do that so we just need to import here the pyplot library but we are going to import the pyplot express library and it is here the plot lee express so we just import here from the plot lee the express library as px so this library the plot lee library is an interactive open source plotting library that supports many chart types covering a wide range of statistical financial geographic scientific and three-dimensional use cases and here we are importing the model of plotly express so here we are importing here this model which is an easy to use high level interface to plotly it also operates on a variety of types of data and produces easy to style figures we are going to use this model of this library here to visualize the isomap separation so let's run this again so now the notebook is up to date and here let's add a new window also new uh, text window let's just use a heading here plotly plotly express right and in here we are going to add a new code and it is going to be very short we will have the same visualization but using the plotly express first we will create the skater in 3d so let's define this figure of the skater plot we just type the px okay this is the plotly express as we imported here px right so here we type 
px and then we use here the function with the name of skater 3d so skater underscore 3d this is the syntax and with this method we can visualize skater plots in three dimensions so the first argument here is the data set so here the data set is as we know the crops min max which is the data set after the scaling that we have done right since all the relevant features are in the same range so once we have the data set we need to specify the three x's the x y and z so here the x axis is going to be the isomap one right this column here so the x axis is going to be the first component isomap one then the y axis is going to be the isomap two so isomap two and finally the z axis the isomap three right like so so once we have specified the three axes, we only need to specify now at the end the color. And instead of using a dictionary as we did before with the PyPlot Express from Matplotlib, we can easily, instead of using a mapping here, just define the color to be the class. So here the color that we have here, okay, is going to be precisely depending on the column class. So different class will have different colors and instances of the same class will have the same color finally to plot this we just type here fig show so with this we display this skater plot so let's run this very well and as we can see here we can visualize the separation between the classes on a skater plot okay after applying the isomap dimensionality reduction technique on the data set and here we can see it okay precisely the same plot as before but with only two lines of code right and we can also see if we zoom this in that the blue stands for the class blue male the orange for the class blue female the green for the orange male and finally the purple for the class orange female right such that each class has its own color right and we can see here that we have one cluster one group for the blue female these ones in red or in orange right then we have another in green which is for the orange male and so on okay and since they are separated we can see the separation and arrive to the conclusion that here crabs that belong to the same class will have similar values of the relevant features keep in mind that whenever you do a dimensionality reduction technique from a set of columns or a set of features precisely what you want to analyze is this you want to see how the graphs will have these values how are going to be the values of each graph depending on their class right so as we can see if we see one group that is very close which is the group of each class it means that they will have similar values of these features keep in mind that what we are doing is we are taking these features and we are reducing this with only three components such that all the information that we have here with these five columns we have here with only three columns and before on the previous lesson with only two columns we are reducing this and dimensionality retaining the information preserving the information so here we can see one group in red which is the blue female or okay this red here all these red markers they are in on, in one group so they will have very similar values of these features okay and then we see here another group in purple for the orange female and since they're also grouped in a cluster they will also have similar values of the relevant features very well with this we end the lesson on the isomap technique using three dimensions right we saw the separation between the classes in three dimensions using the pyplot library okay from uh, matplotlib and also here the pyplot express as we imported from the Plotly Express. So here we do it with the Plotly Express, and here we did it with the PyPlot from Matplotlib Library. Okay, we see here two ways of plotting this skater plot of the uh, visualization of the dimensionality reduction using the isomap technique in three dimensions. We remind the student that you can download all of this code and all of this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. I hope you have enjoyed the lessons and with this practice, now you're ready prepared to apply the ISOMAP dimensionality reduction technique in Python 
and understand its visualizations. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will introduce the Fisher Discriminant Analysis Technique. The Fisher Discriminant Analysis is a dimensionality reduction technique for visualization. So the idea is that we have a very high dimensionality data set that we're not able to visualize. It is a data set of lots of features, lots of variables and lots of attributes. In this data set, we cannot visualize this high dimensionality data set. So solution is to use the Fisher discriminant analysis to reduce this high dimensionality. And with this, we will be able to visualize this data set and the relation between those attributes. It is a method to find the linear combination of the features in this data set that separates two or more classes. With this combination, we can reduce the dimensionality of the data set and have a lower dimensional space. This technique has a wide range of applications, one can be phase recognition. In computerized phase recognition, each phase is represented by a large number of pixel values, and this technique is primarily used to reduce the number of features. This method is also present in biomedical studies. The main application of fissure discriminant analysis in medicine is the assessment of severity state of a patient and prognosis of disease outcome. The separation of the fissure discriminant analysis can also be found in earth science to separate the alteration zones, such that with information from various zones, this technique can find a pattern within the data and classify it. Together with this, we have many more applications. So this is a very high level description of the Fisher Discriminant Analysis Technique. On the following lessons, we will apply this technique in a real data set. We will have a high dimensionality data set and we will use Fisher Discriminant Analysis to reduce the dimensionality of the data set and also visualize the classes of this data set. We'll see how we can do this using Python. Hey everyone, on the following lesson we will introduce the data set that we will work with in this section. Now this is the CRABS data set, which is precisely the same data set that we have worked using principal component analysis and locally linear embedding. So, if you have already finished these sections and worked with this data set, you can just skip the following lesson and go to the next one. If you haven't done the previous sections and you're not familiar with the Krabs data set, then you can start watching the introduction to the data set lesson. Hey everyone! On this lesson, we will introduce the data set that we will work with in this practice. The name of this data set is Crabs. It is a CSV file. You can download this data set on the downloadable resources of this lesson. So, in essence, it is a data set that has the information of the Crabs. It is taken from a paper published by Campo. Campo was a researcher that studied rock crabs in the 1974, mainly the rock crabs for the genus Leptograpsus. One species, the Leptograpsus variegatus, had split into two new species, previously grouped by color orange and blue. So the preserved specimens lose their color, so it was hoped that the morphological differences would allow the museum material to be classified. So this is a practice about dimensionality reduction, right? We'll apply a technique, a method, to reduce the dimensionality of this data set. So, on this lesson, we will introduce the data set. We will see what are the columns, what are the features of this data set, which information we have. So, then, on the following lessons, we can proceed with the technique.
So the data uh, are available on 50 specimens of its sex and species. So we have a 200 total crabs collected in Fremantle, Western Australia. So each specimen has the measures on, and here we have the attributes. The first one is the frontal lobe width. Then we have the rear width of the crab, the length along the midline of the carapace, the maximum width of the carapace of the crab, and finally the depth body length in millimeters plus the color of the crab, in other words, the species, and also the sex. So now let's create a new notebook in Google Colab to start working. We already explained on the code environment setup section how we could create a new Google Colab notebook. So let's do it. We have just created a new Google Colab notebook. The name of this notebook we have set it to be Introduction to the Dataset. Later we will change and modify this when we start applying the dimensionality reduction technique. So first of all, let's load this data set in the notebook. To do this, we will need to import some libraries in Python. So here, first of all, we are going to add a text window. Let's call it, for instance, import of libraries. We are going to use also a here hashtag notation. When you use a hashtag in a text window, you are representing a heading or a header or a title, okay, depending on the title 1, 2 or 3, depending on the number of hashtags, we are going to put here a title 3. So here we have the import of libraries, right? So we are going to start by importing the pandas library. The pandas library is a software library written for the Python programming language for data manipulation and analysis. It offers data structures and operations for manipulating numerical tables and time series. So we will need to import the pandas because this data frame, this data set grabs CSV, okay, we will need to import this as a pandas data frame, a pandas data set. So we are going to work with pandas. That's why here the first thing that we need to do is to import the pandas library as PD, right? And now, since we also want to load a CSV file, we will need to import the input and output library. So we will be able to import and load files from our computer. So now finally, to be able to load files for the Google Colab notebook, we just here import from the Google Colab. We are going to import files like so. So now we run this cell. With this uh, run, we have all the imports done. And now we can just proceed to load uh, this uh, CSV file. So in our case, you just go to this lesson on the downloadable resources. You go to the Crabs CSV. You download this file. Once you have this file on your computer, here keep in mind that you have a folder in, in this directory of the Google Colab Notebook. So here we just click it. This is the file that we have loaded. For now, we have not loaded anything. We just have the sample data that Google Colab provides to us. So to load this CSV inside this notebook, we will do this in a new code window. And we will do this with the files module upload method. So here we are going to create a new variable. Let's just say uploaded. This is going to be equal to the files upload method. So with this, we are able to load a new CSV or any other file that we want inside or not. So let's run this. We uh, click run. Now, as we can see, this option appears to us. Choose files. We are going to cl click here. And so it is going to open your file explorer in your operating system. So we just browse for the crabs data set and we double click here or just click open. And now, as we can see, we have loaded this crabs csv file we can just go to the files in the notebook and we see here the crabs csv so we are able now to work with this file so now let's do an initial study and initial exploration of this data set before applying any dimensionality reduction technique this we will do this on the following lessons now this is only an introduction to this data set so let's add here new text window and let's name this window the initial study of the data set. So let's load this CSV as a data set, as a pandas data set. So to do this, let's name a variable, let's name it grabs data, for instance, to be the data set of the grabs. And now we are going to use the pandas 
and we are going to use the method read CSV with an underscore between read and CSV. So now we pass as an argument the name of the file, the name of the CSV. As we can see, this scraps CSV, so we pass the name as the string, so this is scraps dart CSV. So now we can run this very well. So with this, we have loaded onto this variable. Now we have the data set for this variable crabs data. We can visualize the first rows of this data set with the head method of panda. So here, if we just write crabs data head, with this, we can visualize the first five rows. So we can have, we have one attribute for the species. Uh, B stands for blue, right? The other option is O, that is orange. We also have an attribute for the sex, a feature for the index, a feature for the frontal lobe, rear width, curve base, midline, right, which is abbreviated with CL. Then we have the CW, which is the maximum width of the curve base, and finally the body length, which is here D depth body length, abbreviated with BD. And so we have this data set, right? We have the initial data set with the columns and their names. However, let's improve the understanding of this data set before applying any dimensionality reduction. Let's rename the name of these columns. Instead of using the abbreviation, let's just use the total name. And also here for the values B, that stands for blue, M, that stands for male, and also here we can use the tail to see the last five columns, uh, rows in this case. Also, instead of O, that stands for orange, and instead of F, that stands for female, we are going to change this to map D values, that is, D total word. Instead of O, we want to see orange. Instead of F, we want to see female. And the same way, if we use here, we see the head. This gives us the first five call, uh, rows. We want male instead of M, and also blue instead of B. So on one side, we want to rename the name of the columns and also change these values of this mapping for the columns, species, and sex. So something we have not mentioned, but here if we just write tail, this will give you the five last elements. Okay, keep in mind that you have a total of 200 elements. In fact, you can use here the shape. If you just run now, this gives you the dimension of this data set. We have 200 instances, 200 rows, and a total of eight columns. These eight columns are, as we can see here, this uh, A that we see, right? From the species to the body depth. So let's start by renaming the columns. So now we are going to rename the columns. To do this, we are going to update this data set such that now the new data set with the new name is going to be updated. We are going to rename the data set that we have now and we are going to rename the columns. So here we are going to only remain a uh, in this case, uh, rename and change the column names. And to do this, it is very simple and easy. We just here type a dictionary with the old value, which is the key, and the new value, which is the value of this uh, dictionary key, right? So here we want to add species. This is going to change this column uh, SP, which is this one, to species. The same thing we can do with the frontal lobe. Right, these two we are not going to change because they are easy to understand both of them. But now the FL we want to change this FL, so FL is going to be changed and renamed to the frontal love. This is going to be the frontal love. Then the RW attribute is going to be changed and renamed to the rear width. This is going to be the rear width, and we can continue doing this for everyone. We change the name of this L to be the curve base midline of CW. To be the maximum width and from the bd we go to the body depth right we are going to also change this and erase the last key and the last bracket let's also post this from this until here in a new line so you can visualize very well now we hope that now it is easy to see everything we just change this older name to be this new name this old name to be this new name and so on so now we are going to run this uh code cell, right? And now we are going to add now a new cell to visualize this change and verify that we have changed correctly the names of the columns. So again, we can just write grabs data head. The change has not uh, affected the name, right? The name is the same. We run this cell. And now as we can see the columns, okay, 
have updated their names. Instead of SP, we have species. Instead of FL, we have from the lob. Instead of RW, we have rear with and so on. Now, the other thing that we wanted to do as well is to change the mapping between B for being blue, M for being male, and in the same way, if we check the last ones, instead of O, we want the orange, and instead of F, we want the female. So now, instead of changing the names of the columns, we want to change the mapping for the values. So the way to do this is the following. We access the columns that we want to change. In this case, first, we want to change the species, right? So here we just type species we want to change uh, instead of b to be blue instead of o to be orange so we are going to update this column to be the grabs data species but now we are mapping and this is important here we are adding a map because we are changing the values not the names of the columns and again here we pass a dictionary as an argument here we have the old value so instead of b we want to have blue instead of all we want to have orange right this is a no and the same thing stands for this uh, feature this column of the sex so here we access this column data with the column sex we are going to update this column to be a mapping so again we access this column and with the map and now instead of m we want to be male right so here we change for male and instead of f we want female so we just change this to be female like so very well so now let's run this code cell once we have run this let's update this uh, grabs data head and verify that now the values are changed so we run this and as we can see we have precisely done that instead of b we have blue instead of m we have male and if we check the last uh, elements in this data set the last instances of the grabs Instead of O, we have orange. Instead of F, we have female. Pretty easy, right? Very well. So once we have introduced to this data set, the objective of this practice is to separate the 200 grabs that we have in this data set into four different classes, four different groups or four different clusters, right? given by their sex and given by their species so we can have one class that is male blue another it is male orange then we have another female blue and another female orange so we have four classes and we will need to do this with a dimensionality reduction technique so let's add here a new text window and now let's paste here the objective so here the goal is to separate this 200 instances of grabs into four classes, right? And this is what we are going to do on the following lesson using the dimension reduction and the dimensionality reduction technique of this section. See you on the following lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will apply the Fisher discriminant analysis technique using two dimensions. So, on the previous lesson, we introduced this data set. We saw that this was a data set with the information of 200 crabs. And so the objective here is to separate these 200 crabs into four classes, right? given their configurations for the sex and the species. So we'll have four groups or four clusters. We will use the Fisher discriminant analysis here. It is a dimensionality reduction technique to visualize this separation between the classes. So here, first of all, let's change the name of this notebook from introduction to the data set to feature discriminant analysis with two dimensions. And here we are going to add a new text window. Let's just use hashtags for the heading and let's name this feature discriminant analysis so this is a new section okay and let's add a window here also for the two dimensions on this lesson we are going to visualize the separation using two dimensions and on the following one using three dimensions so here first of all since the goal is to separate these 200 grams into four classes depending order class right we will now 
create a new attribute which is going to be the class that each grab belongs to right because this operation is going to be depending on their class so we're going to add here new call window and now we're going to add a new column here okay that we have here we're going to add a new column that is going to be the class and this is going to be nothing more than the concatenation with the species and the sex right because these are the two attributes that a class is identified with so here to create a new column we just type the name of the data set so as we can see here the name of this data set is grabs data so here we just type grabs data and now we add the name of the new column we want so we want the new column with the name of class so here we specify the name class we want to create a new column with this name and what is going to be the values of this column well the value is going to be nothing more than the concatenation of these two attributes right the species and the sex so here we are going to access grabs data species concatenated with grabs data sex with this we are getting the value of the species for each row and also concatenating this value with the value of the sex for each row so at the end the column class is going to be the concatenation of these two so now let's run this once we have this cell executed we can now proceed to run again the tail method so now we will see a new column let's check that we see a new column we run again and as we can see we have a new column here on the right which is the class column right here this class is the concatenation with the species so in this case for this grab with identifier 895 the species here is orange the sex as we can see is female so here the class is going to be orange female we can also check with the head okay with the head we can get the first five elements of this data set we have a class uh, column yeah, for instance this grab the first one species blue sex is male so the class is blue male that is right so basically the class is the concatenation of these two with this we already have here the uh, column for the class this is going to this is going to be our separation criteria very well once we have this done we also here need to define the columns where we are going to apply this technique this dimensionality reduction technique of feature discriminant analysis Keep in mind that on the data set, on this data set, the relevant measurements are this frontal lobe width, the rear width, the length along the middle carapace, which is the carapace midline, the maximum width of the carapace, and the depth body length. These are the relevant measurements. These are essentially the only continuous variables, as we can see here, these five features. These are the only continuous variables and these are the ones that we are going to apply the feature discriminant analysis so here we are going to define the relevant columns so let's define a variable with the data columns and this variable is going to represent the columns that we are going to apply this feature discriminant analysis again because these are the only continuous variables there's no sense that we can apply this uh, feature discriminant analysis technique onto these variables that are categorical or binary right so we are going to apply it to these ones so let's just define a list of the columns so the first element is the frontal lobe so we can just copy and paste the second is the read width so we can again copy and paste and so on we do this for all of the relevant features like so we update this again and here we have in the data columns all of the relevant features that we are going to use to apply this dimensionality reduction technique now very important feature discriminant analysis assumes that each input variable has the same variance so we need to standardize our data before using this technique so that it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one for this reason we are going to standardize the data remember that when we do the standardization this will change the data so that all variables have mean zero and standard deviation one 
So first of all, let's verify that this is not happening right now. We can study and analyze this data set. For instance, we are just going to use here this description method. We can just do it in here. Let's just write the name of the data set, grabs data. And then we can use here the method describe. Okay, this is going to provide information about this data set. We can also transpose this table. This is a matrix. We can just transpose so that we have a better visualization. And when we do the transposition, we basically change the rows for the columns. This is merely for presentation. Okay, so as we can see, this frontal lob, okay, what is going to happen? Well, this frontal lob here has a mean of 15.58 and a standard deviation of 3.49. So it is not happening that the mean is zero, neither the standard deviation is one. The same with the rear width, right? The mean is 12.73 and the standard deviation 2.57. Uh, so it is not zero, the mean, it is not one, the standard deviation. So we need to ensure that the mean is zero for all of them and the standard deviation is one for all of them. So with this, they have the same variance. So let's do this. Okay, let's do this now. We are going to add a new code window. And here, let's define a new data set for the update data set. Let's name this data set grabs standardized. So this initially is going to be a copy of our, the original data set. So here we just type grabs data, which is the original data set copy. And now we are going to apply here a scalar or a standardization. So here to standardize our data, we need to use here a method from the scikit-learn library, which is the standard scalar. So we will need to import a new library here. Let's go to the import of libraries. And now we will import from the scikit-learn library. The scikit-learn library is a free software machine learning library for the Python programming language. This library contains a lot of efficient tools for machine learning and statistical modeling, including classification, regression, clustering, and dimensionality reduction. So we will now use this library. We will access the pre-processing model and we will import here the standard scalar. This will allow us to standardize our data. So let's run again this cell. Now the notebook is up to date. Let's go here below. And now this grabs standardized. We are going to apply here the standard scalar method. Now keep in mind that we are only going to standardize the data of the relevant measurements, the ones that we will apply this dimensionality reduction technique. These are the only interested columns, the only interesting features that we have here. So let's use here as an index these columns. Remember that these columns are inside the data columns variable. So here the index, when we write data columns, okay, we are basically accessing these relevant measurements. So this is where we will apply here the standard scaled method from the scikit-learn library. So we can just copy this method. We can paste it or just write standard scalar. And now from this method, we are going to use the function fit transform and here, the first argument of this function is this data set that we need to standardize. So these are the data that we want to standardize. And with this, we have the data set standardized. So here, let's run this cell. And now let's verify that this grab standardized uh, data is now having all the means to be zero and all of the standard deviations to be one. So here, let's add a new code window to compare. First, let's compare the crops data describe. And we are going to transpose this. So here, let's uh, compare both of them. Uh, we don't want the index to appear. So here, let's just access the relevant measurements, data columns. Like so here we have the information and the description of the original data set. So now let's check this new data set that we have just defined. So here we just define grab standardized data columns, describe, and we also transpose, right? So let's run this. And as we can see, 
Now, all of the variables of this data set, all of the relevant measurements from the law we read, all of them have mean zero. Keep in mind that this number minus 7.1 uh, raised to 10 or multiply with 10 raised to minus 17 is basically zero. It's a very, very small value. The same with all of them. Okay, so the means are all zero and the standard deviations, we can see that they are also all one, right? So we have done this with the standard scalar from the scikit-learn library. So once we have now the data standardized, we can now proceed here to apply the Fisher discriminant analysis. Keep in mind that all that we have done until now is basically the pre-processing to apply this method, okay? This is because this Fisher discriminant analysis assumes that each input variable has the same variance. So we need to standardize our data as we have just done in here. So now we can begin to apply here the Fisher discriminant analysis dimensionality reduction technique. So here to use it, we need to first import from the scikit-learn library. So here we go above, we come here and we import from the scikit-learn library, we are going to access the model of discriminant analysis. So here, discriminant analysis. And we are going to import a method and a constructor that is called here the linear discriminant analysis. Now, this here linear discriminant analysis is is equivalent to the Fisher discriminant analysis, but here in Python it is named linear discriminant analysis. Okay, so here whenever we use and we apply the linear discriminant analysis, it is the same as the Fisher discriminant analysis. So now we need to import this library. We run again this cell, so now the notebook is up to date. We come here below, and now the first thing that we will do now here is to define the uh, Fisher discriminant analysis model. So let's just name it FDA model. Okay. Or more precisely, since we are using the, the method linear discriminant analysis, LDA model. So here we need to define our model. We use the method that we have just imported, this linear discriminant analysis from the discriminant analysis model of Scikit-Learn, right? Here we import and we use it, so linear discriminant analysis, like so. And now, as an argument of this, we need to define the number of components. So here, the number of components okay, that we will use, since we want to have a visualization, we'll use here two components. On the following lesson, since we will use three dimensions, we will use here three components. So we have this... Uh, Fisher discriminant analysis model already built. Now we need to fit our data into this model, right? So here we will define a new data set. The name of this is going to be Krabs FDA, okay, which is uh, stands for Krabs Fisher discriminant analysis. And now we need to write here the model. The name of the model is LDA model. And now we are going to use a function with the name of fit transform and this function will allow us to apply this dimensionality reduction technique and this discriminant analysis onto our data so remember we want to apply it onto these relevant measurements these relevant features that we see here and we want to apply it on the uh, crabs standardized data right we can for instance here in this code crabs standardized head let's just visualize the first five elements so we want to apply it onto these five columns for all the values of this data set right remember that these columns okay were defined onto this list data columns so here the data set that we will apply is going to be crabs standardized this one and as an index we will use here the data columns we will only apply it on the data columns, right? So with this, we are specifying the, the data that we will apply, but we want to apply it onto the real values, right? Onto these values that we see here. So we access the values with dart values. We just type here, dart values. With this, we are accessing the values of these features. 
very well and now what is the response variable here what is the separation criteria well this is loaded into the variable y and here remember that we want to use the class column as a separation criteria here our separation criteria is this column in here class right so the y variable is going to be grabs standardized and we write here the class column right this is going to be the response variable and the separation criteria that we need to separate these 200 graphs right we'll separate them onto four classes given by their class depending on their sex and species very well when we run this this code here okay this application is going to return in here two new columns two new columns why so well because here we are using two components so this is going to return the two components of the feature discriminant analysis this will return okay the component one and the component two and these components are precisely what we want to add as new columns onto our data set to visualize them right we want to visualize these components into dimensions so we need to here add these components as columns onto our data set so to do this it is very very simple we just type here the graphs standardized data set graphs standardized and here since we want to add two columns we add these columns as a list where the first element let's just name it fda1 this is the component one of the feature discriminant analysis and the second component the second new column to be fda2 the second component of the feature discriminant analysis and what are going to be the values of these two first columns well precisely these columns in here okay and we store these two new columns into this variable so we just need here to set this variable again remember that this fitting here returns two new columns the name of them is in here so if we want to add two new columns we want to set those values to be these ones right precisely the value of the fitting very well let's run this and now let's verify when we run this uh, code window again that we have two new columns we run this and as we can see we see here two new columns the first column for the first component and the second column for the second component of the feature discriminant analysis right and with this we are now ready to visualize it to visualize this separation so now to visualize this separation we need to create first a, fi a new figure and we need to import here okay the pyplot library from matplotlib yeah. this is let's just write here import from or let's just first import matplotlib pyplot as pot now this library here matplotlib is a plotting library for the python programming language and it is a very important and comprehensive library for creating static animated and interactive visualizations in python so we are importing now from the matplotlib library the model pyplot uh, this model here pyplot is a state-based interface to matplotlib and it provides an implicit way of plotting with this we are able to create a new figure so let's run this again very well and let's write here um, a new visualization so let's just uh, write fig okay and with this we are going to create a new figure with the pyplot so we just type plt figure remember that whenever we want to use pyplot we just need to type here pot as we see here so we type pot we write figure and now as on the arguments of the figure here we can specify the size let's specify a size for instance of width 8 and also height weight okay like this we already created a new figure and now we need to plot here a skater plot okay with this skater plot we will visualize the separation between the classes now to plot here a skater plot, we need to import a new library, which is the Seaborn library. And to do so, we just type import Seaborn, 
as SNS. Now, this library here, the Seaborn library, is a Python data visualization library that provides a high-level interface for drawing attractive and informative statistical graphics. So we will import this library here, okay, that provides a high-level interface for drawing statistical graphics. We are going to use it to plot a scatter plot. So let's run. Now the notebook is up to date. Now remember that a scatter plot shows the relationship between two quantitative variables measured for the same individuals. So here, a scatter plot is nothing more than a graph in which the value of two variables are plotted along two axes. So what are the variables that we are going to plot here? Well, precisely the first component of the Fisher discriminant analysis and the second component of the Fisher discriminant analysis. Why so? Well, because with these two components, we have all the information of these five measurements because we are applying here a dimensionality reduction technique. This means that from all these five variables, okay, this high dimensionality, we can shrink this dimensionality into only two dimensions, retaining all the information of these five. So we now have only two dimensions, but with all the information of these five. And so we can study uh, how these measurements change depending on the class. So let's see how we can do this. First of all, let's access the Seaborn library. We are going to plot a scatter plot. So we just type the method scatter plot from the Seaborn library. And here we need to specify uh, first the x axis. So the x axis is going to be the first component one of this data set the second axis is going to be the first component two you can do this in any order okay you can change the x to be fda2 and the y to be fda1 as you want we are going to use this as an example now very important here the hue what is the hue well here it is mandatory the hue is the separation criteria how the colors are going to change depending on their separation and here our separation criteria is the class it is the class, right? Here, as we can see, the objective is to separate these graphs depending on their class. So here the separation criteria is the class. Here we just type class. Okay, this is our separation criteria. It is a very important argument. And finally, we specify the data. So the data is, as we can see here, graphs standardized. Okay, this is the data set. So now let's run this window and see uh, this scatter plot and this visualization of the separation between the classes. So let's run. Very well. And as we can see, we have, as we've said, four groups. We have four clusters. And as we can see, this means, uh, first of all, that each class has its own color and also that each class will have similar values of the relevant measurements okay while different classes will have different values of the relevant measurements with this we can conclude that a grab and another grab from the same class will share okay similarity of these measures but if you take for instance a grab of this class here orange female in a class from this class which is blue male they will not share at all relevant uh, or in this case similarity between those features okay so the blue male is this blue uh, cluster the blue female this orange cluster the orange male this green cluster and the class orange female this red cluster this red group in here and we can see this separation using two dimensions so visualizing this separation is very important because we can conclude precisely this Okay, we can conclude that if you take a grab from this class in red and another from this class in blue, they will have a different values of the relevant features. But if you take two grabs of the same class, imagine this uh, blue female, which is this orange points here class. So if you take two grabs uh, that belong to the same class, okay, they will most likely share a similarity between those relevant measurements. And with this, we see this visualization.
that is why it is important to reduce this high dimensionality and work with a lower dimensional space because we have only two dimensions and we can now visualize this separation. With this, we finish this lesson. We remind the student that you can download all of this code. Okay, uh, this is the Fisher discriminant analysis with two dimensions. You can also download all of this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will use the Fisher discriminant analysis technique with three dimensions. We will reduce our dimensional space into three dimensions. So therefore, we will need here to use three components, right? So we will continue where we left off. Here, let's change the name of this notebook to be Fisher Discriminant Analysis with three dimensions, right? Let's add here a new text window. Let's clear also here a new text window. Let's name this to be 3D. So here we will use the same method of the linear discriminant analysis, but now with three components. So here let's change the name instead of LDA model, let's just name LDA uh, 3D model. Okay. This is going to be equal to the linear discriminant analysis method. So here linear discriminant analysis. Now the number of components is going to be three, like so. Now here in the same way we need to fit this model into our data so here again let's define a new variable crops feature discriminant analysis in three dimensions and here we use the model name so this is the linear discriminant analysis 3d model remember that here a linear discriminant analysis is the same and equivalent to feature discriminant analysis but here in python they use from scikit-learn this name here right so we are going to use the same way the fit transform method so here we just type fit transform and now we need to to write here the uh, data that we want to apply this model on so this data as we've said before is this one in here okay these five relevant measurements we want to apply this model onto this data so again, we just type here the crops standardized data, standardized. And as an index, we need to write these five columns. So we have a variable for this, which is the data columns. Here we have the information of the five relevant columns and relevant features here. So we just type data columns like this, right? We fit this model onto this uh, data. Now we need to access the values because we need to apply this model onto the real values, right? Onto these values in here that we can see all these values. So we just type values and then we need to indicate on the fit transform also the response variable or the separation criteria in the variable y. So here the response variable or basically the separation criteria is the class, right? This is the separation criteria, this column here, the class. So here we just type the class. So we, we write the data set, which is grab standardized and the column class, right? This is our separation criteria that we are using. Next, remember that this here, this method in here, okay? will return three values they will return three components why well because we are specifying that the number of components is three and remember that on the previous lesson we uh, added two new columns for the component one and the component two now we need to add three new columns right and these three new columns are in here because if this returns three columns with values and we store them in here here we have the three values or the three columns that we want right so then we only need to add here uh, three new columns onto our data set so we just type the name of our data set perhaps standardized and now since we will add a list of columns we specify a list the first element is the first component the second the second component and the third one the third component and what are going to be the values of these three new columns well precisely the values of the three components so we just paste this and we uh we copy this and we paste it in here right 
So we run this and we can verify now, if we run this, that now we will have, if we just type grab standardized head or we just run it in here, okay, we will have uh, three components. So here, let's just write it in a new window, head. So now we will have three new columns instead of only two. And as we can see, we have three new columns, the component one, component two and component three. Fair enough. So now we need to plot a 3D, a three-dimensional visualization. So this is going to be uh, a little different from what we did on the previous lesson where we just use the Seaborn library, right? Here we need to achieve a three-dimensional space, right? It is a three-dimensional plot to visualize this separation between the classes. Now, on this lesson, we will present two methods or two ways to visualize this separation. Basically, two ways of plotting in three dimensions in Python, okay, this uh, visualization. So, first of all, we are going to use the PyPlot library from matplotlib that we already imported on the previous lesson, right, this PyPlot. So, here, let's just say the visualization with PyPlot. Let's add a new text window. And here, let's just type this to be a visualization with pyplot okay like so so now then we can proceed to uh, create a new figure as we don't as we do normally with pyplot so here we just type a new figure and we type pyplot figure method right and here we can also specify the size of this figure let's just specify the same size as before was this size eighth in width and also eight in height right we have this size in here now, with this, what we have yet, if we just uh, run this, we have a figure size that has no axis in it. So now let's define the axis. We want here three axes, right? So here we are going to find the AX to be the axis. And here we access the figure variable. And now we use a method that has the name add subplot. So here we are going to add a subplot. And since we have three dimensions, we specify one, one, one here three axes right in the projection of this is going to be a three-dimensional projection so we specify here 3d this specifies a uh, projection of three dimensions then we just apply here the skater plot okay now keep in mind that uh, before we use a skater plot and now this method is different because be before on the previous lesson using two dimensions we use the seaborne method skater plot now we will not use seaborn we will only work with pyplot and the method is named skater okay like so so this receives three arguments okay uh, the one is the the first one is the x-axis so here the x-axis is going to have the values of the data set graphs standardized and now we access only the first component right here the first component and here let's just run the uh, head here and so the first component is going to be this uh, column here this is the x-axis the first component so fda1 then the y-axis is going to be the second component this column here the feature discriminant analysis component two so we just write two and then finally the z-axis which is a new one is the third one right is the uh, FDA3. This last component here, feature discriminant analysis 3, is the third component, so we access this column, right? Once we have specified the three axis values, X, Y, and Z, the three data, we have here an extra argument with the name of depth shade, so we will specify this now. So this is a Boolean argument, okay? It can take the value true or it can take the value false. Here, if we set this argument to be true, then depending on their depth of their points, we'll have points with more opacity or with less opacity, basically depending on their depth, okay, in respect to the origin. We don't want this. We want all the points, all of the data, to have the same opacity, to have the same transparency. So we are going to set this argument to be false, okay, in this way. All the data points in this skater plot will have the same transparency and the same opacity regardless of their depth. This is the Boolean argument. 
that we also need to set here. And now here we have the C argument, which is the color. This specifies the color. Now, we're visualizing this in three dimensions, right? Before, uh, we use the Seaborn method skater plot that we didn't need to specify the color because basically this method already sets uh, their color depending on their class. So how can we do the same thing using three dimensions? Well, with this function, we, we need to also specify the color. So what we will declare now is a mapping, okay, is a dictionary, a mapping, that given a class, we will have a color. So here we will define this dictionary with the name of color crabs. And this will represent a mapping that given a class, for instance, this class here, let's just say the blue male will have a color. Okay, I imagine yellow. And then another class, let's just write here, for instance, tail. Okay, this other class in here, orange female, will have another color. Imagine the color red. Okay, so let's specify this in here. First, we are going to begin defining the class blue female, for instance. Here, the order is not important. And here, let's specify the blue female to be a color similar like this one. So as we can see, this has the color orange. However, we don't have the orange in the pie plot. So we use yellow that is similar with this orange color for the blue female. So here, to specify the color yellow, we just need to write here the uh, the letter Y, okay? If you specify here Y, like so, this is the color yellow. Then we will continue defining the color for the class blue male. So here the class blue male is the color uh, blue, right? In the in the previous plot in two dimensions. So we do have the color blue in PyPlot. So here we are going to define the blue male class to be the color blue. Okay, and to do this, we just specify here blue male to have the color B. B stands here for blue. Then we continue, okay, with the class orange female. So here the class orange female is the color red. We also do have the color red in PyPlot. That stands for the letter R. So we specify the orange female class to be the color red. So we write orange female to be the color red. And finally, the last one is the orange male. That what we have on the skater plot using two dimensions, the orange male is green, and we specify here the color green in pie plot. Here, pie plot, we just specify the color G that stands for green. Okay. With this, we have the mapping defined, the dictionary defined that basically given a class name, we have this color, basically its value. Okay, these are the keys of the dictionary, name of the classes are the keys and the colors their values so how can we apply now this dictionary onto this uh, column here class that we will use now this dictionary to basically define the colors well to do so here on the color we will need to first uh, start by writing the column name so here the data set is scraps stun dardized and the column that we want to apply this dictionary on is the column class and now here we use a function that is apply, apply. And here we are going to apply a transformation, okay, using a lambda function. So here the lambda function, we specify given a, a value x, this value x is basically the class that each crab belong to, okay. And the value is going to be precisely their color. So we write here the dictionary name, color crabs and their color with the key x now to understand this notation it is first important okay let's write a new code window let's define this in here okay that you understand how dictionary works in python this is a dictionary right this is a mapping here if you write color imagine color crops and you write for instance the key the key blue mail imagine okay if you write this what you'll have in the return value is not blue male instead you will have b basically when you write here the name of the key okay this returns the value you can verify this what is the value b because here the value is b okay do not confuse and think that when you write this you are returning this no a dictionary you return the values not the keys in the same way if you write orange 
email, okay, now we'll have as the return value uh, the letter R, as we can see here, okay? So in the same way, when we write here the return value to be color graphs with this index, this index here is the key, X, basically those keys, so the value that we are going to return at the end are going to be the colors, okay? Because this value here that we return is a color. And to understand this lambda function, a lambda function is basically a function that given an argument x, given a class name, given a key x, we are going to return the associated value for this key x, okay, which is going to be the color. Very well. So we can already close this window. And now the last argument that we have here uh, after the color, okay, in here, is something that is called the size of the markers. So basically how big the, the points are going to be seen. Uh, a common size is 100. This is a sufficient size to visualize the markers. Okay? So with this, we are ready to, to plot this uh, 3D visualization of the separation of the glasses. So let's run this. Very well. And as we can see, okay, here we can visualize the separation between the four classes. Right? The class blue male is in color blue. The class blue female in, color, in, in this color uh, red. The class orange female uh, or in this case, the blue female in color yellow, the orange female in color red, and finally the orange male in color green. And we can also visualize the same separation as we can see here in three dimensions. Basically, this separation represents that graphs that belong to the same class will have similar values of these relevant features. Okay. And class that basically belong to different classes, okay, will most likely uh, have not similar values so they will have different values of these features in here okay again what we are doing is we are taking these five dimensions we are reducing this dimensionality onto only three dimensions so we have a three-dimensional space okay so we reduce these five dimensions into three dimensions retaining the information of these five so we can visualize those uh, separation of these measurements depending on their class, right? With only three dimensions we can visualize, with five we are not able to visualize this. So this is a dimensionality reduction technique and why it is used for. So now we are going to, to do the same thing, but instead of using the PyPlot library, we are going to use now the Plotly Express. This library Plotly Express is uh, shorter to do all this. We'll do the same work, but with shorter lines. It is important to know both of them. So here, let's add a new text window and let's call this uh, visualizing with PyPlot Express or visualization with PyPlot Express, right? So we already did this with PyPlot. Let's do this now with PyPlot Express. In this case, the name is uh, Plotly Express. The name of this library is uh, Plotly Express, not PyPlot Express. And this is a new library that we need to import in here. So now we need to go above, and this new library, Plotly Express, we will import it in here. So to do this, it is very simple. We just type import Plotly period Express as PX. Okay, now this library here, Plotly Express, is an easy to use high level interface to Plotly, which operates on a variety of types of data and produces easy to style figures. Plotly Express provides functions to visualize a variety of types of data. We will use now this library to plot a scatter plot in three dimensions. So we run this notebook. Now the notebook is up to date. Okay, it already, we have already imported this library. And now to plot the same thing here, we just define the figure and we type now uh, PX for the Plotly. Okay, and now we use the method that is called Scatter3D. And this method already knows that it is going to be a, a plot in three dimensions because the method stands for a scatter plot using three dimensions. Now, the first argument is the data set. So the name of the data set is scraps standardized, right? Here. And then we have the three axes. So here, the axis X is going to be the first component. So Fisher discriminant analysis one. The X2, so, so here it is going to be Fisher discriminant analysis 2, and finally the component uh, 
feature discriminant analysis three is going to be the z axis so here the z axis is going to have the data for the column of the feature discriminant analysis component three right once we have specified these uh, three axes now we only need to specify the color and remember that when we did the visualization with pi plot we needed to use here dictionary right the mapping that for each class value uh, key basically for each class name we map this class to a given color right so for each class we have a value for the key which is here the color now we don't need to do that with plotly express we just need to specify here color to be equal to the column class just like that it is very very simple so basically okay with only one line we can define this skater plot in three dimensions where before we needed several lines so finally to show and see this figure we just need to write figure show okay so let's run this all right so here we can visualize this separation between the classes in three dimensions where as we can see this color blue stands for blue female the the red or orange blue female the green orange male and finally this purple orange female so this color okay separation was already in done by definition with this argument we don't need to specify our own mapping okay that's why here this uh, library plotly express is very practical when plotting here the uh, visualization of skater plots in three dimensions here we have the uh, first component of feature discriminant analysis component one this is the component two the y-axis and finally the z-axis is the feature discriminant analysis component three and we can see this separation again remember that this separation between the classes uh, basically means and represent that graphs that belong to the same classes okay if we take two graphs that belong to the same class they will have similar values of these relevant measures but if we take a graph in another from different classes they will have uh, values that are different for this relevant measure so they will not share similarity okay Graphs that belong to the same class will share similarity of these values, but uh, that we take graphs that do not belong to the same class, they will not share similarity of these values. And this is very important to visualize. Okay, it is a conclusion that is key and very important in data analysis. Okay, we can now arrive to the conclusion that the classification of graphs depending on their sex and species makes total sense because their class is very important when calculating and measuring the values of these relevant features that we see okay, as we can see here they are different depending on their class the values of these relevant features are different depending on the class that these graphs belong to very well so with this we have visualized this separation uh, in three dimensions using on one side ply pot and also we use the plotly express library which has a more practical way of doing this with this we finish this lesson we remember that you can download all of this code and all of this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson i hope you have enjoyed the lessons and with this practice and now you are ready prepared to apply the fissure discriminant analysis dimensionality reduction technique Python and understand its visualizations. Hey everyone, on this lesson we will talk about images. Images like tabular data sets can also be transformed for use by dimensionality reduction methods and we can convert them to arrays of numerical values. On this project, we will use dimensionality reduction techniques on image datasets. On the following lesson, we will introduce the dataset. Hey everyone, on this lesson, we will introduce the image dataset that we will work with on this section. The dataset that we will work with is the digits dataset. This dataset correspond to images of handwritten digits. The reason for this is that images have a high dimensionality. 
and they are difficult so to deal with in many machine learning models. For this reason, we will apply dimensionality reduction methods to them. Now, usually the dimensionality of the space that the images are is not too large. In this digits data set, we have 64 pixels. So now, first of all, let's create a new notebook, a new Google Colab notebook. The name of this notebook is Introduction to Image Dataset. Let's create here a new text window. This is going to be the import of libraries. So here, import of libraries. So here, since we are going to work with images, let's first of all import the fundamental library uh, for plotting in Python, which is the matplotlib library so here we are going to import from this library matplotlib we are going to import the model pyplot as plt now here this library matplotlib is a comprehensive library for creating static animated and interactive visualizations in python so we are importing from this library the pyplot library model which is a state-based interface to matplotlib and it provides an implicit way of plotting. So this is the one of the most fundamental imports when working with visualizations in Python. Now with this, we will be able to visualize our plots and our images. So now, let's load onto this notebook the digits data set. So this image data set digits is a data set that is inside of the scikit-learn library. So here we just write from scikit-learn datasets. This library scikit-learn is a free software machine learning library for the Python programming language. It provides simple and efficient tools for data analysis. It also has here a model of datasets. It has a lots of datasets. So we are going to import here the low digits method so here when we import this method low digits we will be able to load the digits data set which is this data set of images that we will work with so let's run this cell very well now the notebook is up to date and now here let's create a new text window and let's call this uh, initial study of the data set So here, first of all, let's load this data set. So to do this, we will load from the method of load digits. So this load digits method here, load digits, will return two values, the value X and the value Y. Very important, this first argument here, X is the data with each row representing one sample and each column representing the features. And the second argument here, Y, is the target the classification target so here on the variable y we have the target samples we can uh, write a name here any name you want you can write here for instance data and here y target if you want okay you can here choose the name we are going to work with x and y and here also that is very important is that we have here an argument which is a boolean argument that is has here the name return x y like this this is a boolean argument that if this argument here is true this is going to return first as a tuple the data and as a second argument here the target if you set this to be false okay like this then what is going to happen is that this is only have is going to only have one returning value let's just call it uh return okay but or return value for instance but you cannot return this as a tuple so you'll have the data and the target in the same object. We don't want this. We want to split them. Why? Right? We want to split them onto a tuple. We want the variable X to have the data samples and the Y to have the target samples. So here we need to specify this to be true. Like so. Very well. So let's run this window. Now that we have this information, we can visualize the images by resizing them to a square matrix. To do this, Let's first create the figure. So remember that we can create a figure very easily with the pyplot library. For those who don't know, you just need to type here pyplot and then you just write figure. Okay, with this, you create a new figure. 
Now you can also specify the size of this figure. Let's specify a size of width 8 and height 8. This is a sufficient size to visualize this. Once we have created this figure, we can show the images. To show an image using the PyPlot library, we use a method that is called the imshow method. So here we just type imshow. So what is the image that we want to show here? Well, first of all, let's calculate how many images we actually have on this digits data set, right? So here, if we just type X, which is this data samples, and we type shape, we will have here the dimensionality of this data. So this is a data set that has a thousand 797 samples in 64 features basically 64 column for each sample for each row right this is the visualization so we really have lots of features uh, 64 and also lots of samples right we have a thousand 797 now if we just type the y shape okay what is going to have here well we'll have here the same number of samples remember that the, re the response variable has the same number of samples however we only have one column okay because this is our target variable so let's initially for instance try to plot here and show the first image so we type now x0 this is the first image of these uh, data samples right this is x and now as we've said we need to resize them to a square matrix so since the figure size is 8 by 8 let's resize them and into 8 by 8 to do this we need to write here the reshape method okay 8 8 like this now finally on this im show method we have here an extra argument which is the c map this is the color map instance or the registered color map name used to map scalar data to colors so for this example and this initial visualization let's just use the color map of grace okay this is a common color map when plotting images very well so with this we are ready to visualize this let's run all right so here we can see the first image on this data set okay this is the the first image of this digit remember that this digit is a handwritten digit each image of this data set is a handwritten Im image that is a handwritten digit right we can also check here the second image again let's run Cool, we have here the number one. Seems like the number one. Let's write here now two. Fair, so this seems to be also a handwritten two. Okay, again, you can have any digit here, but it seems that each index corresponds to a digit. Let's write three. Very, very good. We have three. We can also try with four. Okay, and so on. So here, let's have the first one, which is zero for now. And now let's try visualizing for instance the six first digits all in the same figure so to do this we can easily do this with matplotlib using the pyplot library so now we just here type a new figure and also we also we will define the axis okay and now instead of writing just figure we will write here the pyplot method of subplots here the first argument is the number of rows so here the number of rows is equal to two and then we have the number of columns let's specify three columns so we'll have uh, two times three is six we will have six figures okay uh, and we will have for each row three elements so three figures basically three plots for each row we want all of the images all of the plots to have to share the same axis so here the argument of share x is going to be equal to true so we will share the x uh, coordinate and also we will share the y coordinate so this is going to be true as well finally let's specify the size of this figure so now since we will have three images per row let's specify a size of width 12 so the width is 12 and the height is 8 very well we can run this and now we'll see uh, six uh, spaces for six plots okay as we can see we have here six axes different and six figures so how can we plot these images well we can first to plot for instance the first one which is here the index zero okay for the digit zero we just here type the axis vector so here axis this is a vector of size uh, six right so now we will access the 
row zero and column zero so here this first element in here and now inside here we will show inside this axis we are going to show the x zero that we have here so we just type in the same way x zero and we reshape this onto a square matrix so we write reshape eight eight and let's just use here the same color map so here we are going to use this same color map to be grays let's run this we run and as we can see on this first figure we see this uh first image for right we see here the digit zero so we do the same thing uh, with the rest okay now keep in mind that for instance this second one will be indexed uh with row zero the first row and column one so we will have this digit in here we want this to be the one so we run here we have the one we do the same we paste we paste now this is the column two so it is this index of the columns remember that indices in python start with zero then we have here the row one right we have here the row one with column zero so this is this space in here and we want this to be three this we want to be the uh, two then we write the same axis one one right axis one two finally and here we just type the same thing we type im show to be the fourth and then im show to be the fifth and now as we run so let's run this we can see here the six five uh first images of this data set right the digits from zero to the digit five so we can also establish here a tight layout that is to adjust the padding between and around the plots we just need to type here my plot tight layout okay so now when we run we will have all the padding and this tight layout that we see here and the figures show quite bigger right you can also here change the index of each of these images you can listen here for instance type 20 here 13 okay here uh 256 here for instance uh 923 here 471 and here uh, 50 for instance now when we run this or for instance when we have something like this with these indices okay here doesn't matter the index really uh which of them are so when we run this what is going to happen well we will see here okay another images with another digits that basically here this image with the digit 5 is the element 201 in the data set right this other image it is the element 374 this other image that is the number 3 handwritten here is the element 259 and so on so we have here only digits we don't have numbers like uh, 58 or 804 we have digits okay these will range from 0 to 9 and we want to classify those digits such that and with this information okay we can guess the response variable keep in mind here that the response variable if you just write y this is nothing more than the indices and basically these values in here okay so we want to guess the response variable basically which digit it is with the information of this data right it is a classification so again remember that the shapes and we will leave this in here okay code let's just write here the shapes so x shape comma y shape we have here that x is a the data right with this 1797 samples with 64 features and this is the response variable basically representing uh which is the real number that this uh image is right so you can see that for instance for the first digit okay x zero so on this digit x zero we have the digit zero here if you just type x zero this element inside the data set has 64 features basically information about the zero and then we have here an extra feature which is the y feature okay that is not inside the data but it is basically representing zero okay in fact if you just type here y zero 
what is going to be the value of 0. If you type uh, y1, you'll see 1, y2, you'll see 2. This is because for each index i of the data on the response variable y, we have the real value okay, that is inside this image. The real digit that this image is representing. Someone that sees this, okay, sees that this is a zero because this is something that we already know. Humans know that this is the format of the index zero. However, a machine learning model does not know this. So the machine learning model, we use the information of these 64 attributes of this image here. And with this information, we need to guess the real value of this uh image which is the real digit and this digit is stored on this variable y for each index that we see here we have the real digit that this image is showing on the data so the objective of this project is to separate this 1797 images into 10 different classes depending on their digit so since we have the digits from 0 to 9 we will have 10 classes and to do this we will apply a dimensionality reduction technique with this we will reduce our dimensional space keep in mind that we have a high dimensionality space we have a total of 64 features okay this is these are lots of dimensions that we cannot visualize them so we will apply a dimensionality reduction technique to reduce this dimensionality space to a lower dimensionality space and visualize this separation between the classes. Very well, with this we end this introduction to the image dataset lesson. We remind the student that you can download all of this code and all of this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Hey everyone! On this lesson, we're going to apply the locally linear embedding dimensionality reduction technique to visualize the separation between the digits depending on their class, which is the real number that this digit represents. So, on previous lessons, we introduced this data set where we have 1797 images. And the objective of this practice is to separate this number of images into 10 different classes depending on the real digit that this image is representing. On this lesson, the dimensionality reduction technique that we are going to use is the locally linear embedding. So we are going to reduce the high dimensionality that we have. Remember that we saw that we have a total of 64 features 64 columns right and we have your very high dimensionality so we are going to reduce this high dimensionality into a dimensional space that we can visualize and also remember that the x is the data that we have basically for each row of this table we have your 64 attributes for this row for that image right and here we have on the y the y is the response variable the real number that this digit is representing right so essentially in here we are visualizing the first digit which is here zero and now if we just type on the code y we are going to see if we access the index zero that the digit that this image is representing is the number zero now here if we visualize imagine the digit let's just say the index 21 let's see which digit this is representing let's first see the image so it seems that this is the number one let's now verify this if we now access the digit basically the index 21 right of this total of keep in mind that we have a thousand seven hundred ninety seven rows we have lots of rows so if we access now the row with index 21 let's see okay this is the real number one this value here is representing one if we check now the uh, 300 45 for instance let's see we can gather well this seems like the three let's verify three four five the response variable tells us this is three right so here the the objective is to separate this data set of images into 10 classes and then visualize this separation so that remember that here we have handwritten digits so maybe we have an image which is this one that represents the value 3, and then we have here the image 
with index 3 that also represents the value 3 but it is a different 3 as we can see this 3 is not the same as this other 3 here right but the real number that they are representing is the same it is the number 3 but it is the same as one person writes the number 3 and then comes another person into the room writes another 3 the number is the same however the handwritten digits right how these people write are different so very important here to notice let's just keep in mind that we are going to start with a zero just to visualize like we had before and now we are going to first apply the locally linear embedding so that we can reduce this high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space now here the idea why do we do this why do we make this visualization well we aim to do this visualization find out if different handwritten digits that represent the same number have similar values of these 64 columns so essentially if we have for instance a value zero okay of a, p a person and then another instance of this data set another image okay that also represents the value zero but we have a different handwritten way or shape that if we take this first zero of this person and the other zero of the other person they have similar values of these 64 features but if you take for instance a person that writes a handwritten digits that represent the value 9 and then another that represents the value 1 then we need to verify that we have different values for these 64 columns right so maybe we can have a little similar this is what we need to find that's why we do this visualization that we're not able to visualize when we have this high dimensionality okay so now first of all let's change the name of this notebook we can just here uh, write locally linear embedding also let's add a new text section in here let's just name this to be locally linear embedding okay so now the first thing that we need to do here is to import the library that we're going to use to use the locally linear embedding so now we go here to the import of libraries notebook we are going to import from the scikit learn library we are going to access the manifold model we are going to import the method locally linear embedding remember that the scikit learn is a free software machine learning library for the python programming language we are now accessing this model the model manifold which is a model to non-linear dimensionality reduction in our case we are going to use locally linear embedding so now let's update this notebook we run again this window once the notebook is up to date we come here below we start by defining our model so here let's use the method that we have just imported locally linear embedding now the first argument in here is the number of components that we want to achieve keep in mind that here components and dimensions are synonyms right initially we want to have a visualization in two dimensions so we can specify the number of components here we just type n components equal to two so this is going to be a locally linear embedding model that we are going to reduce from 64 columns to only two columns in here only two components only two dimensions right so we are going to have here a two-dimensional plot now we apply this model to our data set so here we can just define the two co new columns that we are going to have so here let's just use the notation x l l e or locally linear embedding so we, we are going to have in this variable the two new columns that we have on the data frame here we just type this name of the model and we're going to use the method fit transform the first argument of this fit transform is the data and the second is the response variable so here the response variable we specify as y equal and then the name of our response variable keep in mind that our name is the same y we copy we paste okay you can also use another name okay what is mandatory is that you define the response variable as this way y equal to something and here in our case it is the same the same name y okay so as we said this is going to return the two new columns okay so this we're going to say returns two new columns essentially the two dimensions that we are going to study and visualize very well so now let's define a data frame for these two new columns okay so we can create a new data frame in pandas as just typing pd data frame like this 
Now the first column name, let's just specify this is going to be the component locally linear embedding one. So we can just use this notation. We're going to define now this pandas data frame as a hash or as a mapping, a dictionary. Here we are going to have the first column. So remember in Python, we access the first column or any index with zero. So this we just type xlle zero, right? And then we define the second column to be here lle2 so locally linear embedding column 2 the second component and also here very important we want this column to have the value of all of the rows okay of the first column of this data set okay so here we also need to select all of the rows remember to select all of the rows we just use here two points now what is going to be the value of this column well precisely or column one which is here the, the the second index of the column and also all of the rows like this okay now are we done well we can have this as a data however we want to visualize this data and to visualize this data to be able to see it we need to have also an extra column to see the separation between the classes so here essentially the class column is going to be a column that we're going to add as well what is going to be the value of this class well precisely the value y okay so that for each row okay for each row that we have on this data frame we're also going to have a column class that is going to tell us what is the real value right that this image this identifier is representing and this is also going to allow us to visualize different classes with different colors which will make a lot easier to visualize so now we can close this dictionary so now let's create a new figure with pyplot we can just here type pyplot figure let's specify the size of the figure to be 18 width and 18 height and now to visualize this in two dimensions the separation of this data we are going to plot a scatter plot however here to use a scatter plot we will need to import the seaborn library this library will allow us to represent this scatter plot in python so we can just type here import seaborn as sns seaborn is a python data visualization library it provides a high level interface for drawing informative statistical graphics we are going to import it to use here the scatter plot so let's update this notebook once the notebook is up to date we come here below and we can just use the scatter plot function now scatter plot here on this scatter plot the arguments are very important first we specify the horizontal axis so this x-axis is going to be the first component let's just name now the component lle1 so lle1 the first column of the data set then we specify the vertical axis this is going to be the component 2 of this locally linear embedding column 2 you know here the most important thing of this function we have something called the hue this hue argument okay is how we are going to see the colors differently depending on their values and here the criteria that we want to follow is given elements of the same class we want them to have the same color and given elements of different classes we want them to have different colors so here the hue is going to be precisely the class this is the separation criteria right here the hue is the separation criteria that in this case it is the class of the image then we have the data set so the data set is going to be equal to data okay here we specify the data now, here you can have any name if we specify data set we just appear data set however this argument always starts like this data equal and then the name of your data set Okay, we are going to use here data equal to data. We can also define here the format of the palette. So here the palette, let's just specify the tab 10. This is a common palette in Seaborn. However, this last argument is optional, okay? You don't need to use this. We are going to use it for this style. Okay, now very important. On the definition of the model, after the number of components, we have here an argument that is called the number of neighbors in the locally linear embedding locally linear embedding first finds the k nearest neighbors of the points of the data then it approximates each data vector as a weighted linear combination 
of its sky nearest neighbors. So finally we compute the ways that best reconstruct the vectors from its neighbors and we so produce the low dimensional space. So here we need to specify how many neighbors we are going to use. Let's use for this example a value of 15. This is sufficient combination. Okay, so now we're ready to run this window. So let's run. Very well. As we can see here precisely, we have a graph. Here we see the plot, the scatter plot of all of these data points, all of these images, all of these instances. Each point that you see here is an image. And depending if this image represents a number or another, we see this image in a color or in another. For instance, all the images that represent the zero are here. As we can see, they are very, very, very distant and far from the others. So the separation here is the maximum, right? We can pretty much say that if we take a handwritten digit in that represents the value zero of a person, and then we take another handwritten digit that also represents zero for another person, we can pretty much say for sure okay using this visualization we are demonstrating that both of these images will have similar values for these 64 attributes right so essentially this is what we are doing we are taking all of these values we are making linear combinations of them we are reducing these 64 attributes in only two attributes in only two components okay so here we can see that all of the images that represent the value zero have similar okay values of the features and have different from the rest now if we study for instance the number two also this is something that happens all of them are similar okay that are different from the rest and then as we begin here to to arrive well on the number one we also see some separation but as we begin to arrive on the class three the class nine the class as we can see seven the class five the class six we can see here that there is separation however there is also some similarity okay this basically because many of the handwritten digits for instance of the three and of the nine we see begin to see we have this round shape in here of the nine and the three okay they're similar also in the number four with the number for instance five okay we have here this shape as we can see essentially that's why we have here that some of them overlap in the scatter plot but the most important thing is that there is separation okay each class has its own cluster okay and the zero is the most obvious one because it is very distant from the others okay so the idea is that each class has its own cluster and also depending on the distance of these clusters then these classes are going to be very very similar okay if they're very close on the values of the 64 features all very very different okay very very assimilate and different if they are very distant okay this happens with the class zero the class zero is very very distant from the rest okay also the class two can we see here also is a bit distant from the rest we have here this cluster so two is going to have different values of the 64 features of, um, of the rest and also zero will have very different values then as we begin here to see on on these rest of values they can share some similarity on the 64 features however the main point is that we can visualize this separation and each class has its own cluster very well so as we have applied the locally linear embedding in using two dimensions using two components we can also visualize this, the same idea, but now using three components. So here we can just add a text section. Let's name this to be two dimensions. And now let's add a new one here below to be in three dimensions. So here we just type three dimensions. Okay. Now here, this is pretty much similar in the initial part. We just defined the model. However, here, what is going to be the number of components well if we want to visualize this in three dimensions the number of components is going to be three now the number of neighbors let's just leave this to be the same so we can have here the same structure and shape of this visualization with a one extra component with one extra column then we define the columns okay in the same way like here 
However, now this is going to return three columns, right? This is going to return here three new columns, right? After we apply the fit transform. Then we define the data set, okay, as before. So we just copy this initialization and we also add a new column for the locally linear embedding number three. So here we can also add the column LLE3 for the locally linear embedding component number three. So it is the third column. We are going to select here the data that we have just defined and all of the rows with the index two, like this. Now, finally, to plot the scatter plot using three dimensions, this is going to be different from before. Before, we were using PyPlot to plot a new figure and Seaborn to use the scatter plot. Here, to plot the scatter plot using three dimensions, we will need to import a new library, which is the Plotly Express. So we come here to the import of libraries and now we add the import and we import plotly and the model express as px like this the plotly library is a very complete python library for visualization that includes over 40 unique chart types covering a wide range of financial statistical geographic scientific and three-dimensional use cases and so plotly express is a void in part of the plotly library and it is recommended to create most of the common figures in our case the scatter plot so we run we update this window once the notebook is up to date we come here and we can just start by typing the figure is equal to the library of plotly express and now we type here scatter underscore 3d this is the name of our function okay the first argument here is the data set so in our case just here the variable data right where we have the information then we specify the x-axis, okay? Now the x-axis is this one. We specify the x-axis, the first component. Then the y-axis is the second component. And finally, this third axis, the z-axis, is the third component, the third column in here. Now, in the same way that before we had the separation criteria, which was the hue, that represented the separation of the classes, now we also have an argument for the separation criteria. However, the name of this is not hue. Instead, it is color. So we just type here color equal to the class. This is a separation criteria. Depending on the class, we are going to have a color for this data point or another. Okay, so we're ready. Let's run this window. Okay, and also before running, the last thing we need to do is to display and show this figure. Okay, if you don't type here figure show, you're just going to create this figure, but it is not going to be displayed. If you want to show it, you just use the method show. So you run. And now as we run, here we can see this separation of these classes in three dimensions. Right? As we can see here on this scatter plot, on the right we have the color bar. Okay, this color bar represents the values of the class and their color. So for instance, the color yellow is the class 9. Okay. This color blue is the class 0, this color 4 is the class pink, the color 2 is the class purple, and we have here for each class a different color. You can also here see the, the name of the class, okay, as you just here keep the pointing over these points, right? For instance, here, if we want to use this here, we can see that this is the class 6, and essentially here in three dimensions we can see, okay, pretty much the same separation criteria, okay? If we look for the zero, let's look for the zero because before what we had, well, before we had this, the zero was very, very, very far from the others, right? The cluster of the class zero. So now as we see here, if we look for the zero, this also happens. The zero, okay, is the class that is the most distant from the other. So essentially, it is the cluster that if we take... Uh, zero a handwritten zero from a person and another handwritten zero from another one they will have for sure since we are proving this by this visualization they will have very very similar values from the 64 attributes okay of these handwritten images the 64 attributes of the two images are going to be very 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 similar however if we take for instance a value of the class zero so we take an image a handwritten digit of a person that belongs basically to the class zero so this handwritten digit is representing the number zero and then we take another one for instance this handwritten digit 
that represents the clan 7. As we can see, these two clusters are very distant, so the 64 features of these images are not going to be similar. In fact, they are going to be very, very different. Okay, and as we begin to see here inside, each class has its own cluster and some of them overlap so that we have some similarity. But the most important thing here is to understand the visualization. This visualization tells us, in the same way that we did here before using two dimensions, that if we take an image of a handwritten image, right, a handwritten digit that represents the number zero, Okay, and another one of the same class, they will have similar values of the 64 attributes, of the 64 features. But if we take one from here in another handwritten image of another class that represents, for instance, the class 2, represents the real number 2, both of these are going to be different, okay, from one another. Okay, these will have uh, some set of values of the 64 features that are going to be different, very different from these ones. If this is the most important thing to understand on this dimensionality reduction visualizations. Very well, with this we end this locally linear embedding lesson. We remind the student that you can download all of this notebook and all of this code on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Hey everyone, in this lesson we are going to use principal component analysis to visualize the separation between the digits depending on their class which is the real number that this handwritten digit represent on previous lesson we introduced this data set it is a data set with 1797 images each of these handwritten images has as we can see 64 features 64 attributes right here we can see the first of them Right, index 0, the identifier 0 on this data, and we can see that this is the handwritten digit that is representing 0. Right here, if we just type y0, we can see that this digit is representing the value 0. If we now type here the value, for instance, 500, let's see. Let's find out. Well, this is a digit we now not sure what is this digit it may be two or three so we can verify this we just go to the response variable and we check here the index 500 so now let's run as we can see this is the number eight okay a person has written this digit it is a handwritten digit that is representing the value eight so we have on one side the data right with the 64 features the 64 columns for this handwritten digit and also we have the y variable which is a response variable that for each digit for each image this variable tells us what is the real number that this digit represents so our objective here is to separate all of this set of images into 10 classes depending on the real number that this handwritten digit is representing so when we do this visualization of the separation of the classes we will be able to see the clusters the groups okay and gather if we take a class of one cluster and then we take the other cluster class if they're very far from each other it means that images of that classes will have different values one another right and if we see a cluster that is very very close okay or one class then it means that if we take two images for the same class they will have very similar values of these 64 features so let's start doing this and we will also interpret these visualizations right also we are going to explain how to understand these visualizations so we're going to apply principal component analysis first of all let's change the name of this notebook to principal component analysis also let's add a new text section in here let's name this section to be principal component analysis very well now to be able to use pca here principal component analysis we will need to import this method okay this model from the scikit-learn library so we will be able to use here principal component analysis so now we just go to the import of libraries window. We just type import and we are going to import from the scikit-learn and the decomposition model. And here we are going to import the PCA. So 
from this model of this library we are going to import the method pca like so very well now let's run this window to update the notebook once the notebook is up to date we can now start using pca we are going to visualize this separation of the classes okay of all of these images on this data set in two different ways one using two dimensions and the other using three dimensions right such that the idea is that we're going to take all of these 64 columns all of these 64 attributes and we're going to reduce them we're going to reduce this high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space that we can visualize right humans can visualize in a computer in one dimension two dimensions or three dimensions we are going to visualize this using three dimensions and two dimensions which is what we do using dimensionality reduction so we are going to take all of the 64 columns we're going to reduce into only two columns for two dimensions and then reducing them to only three columns for visualizing in three dimensions this separation so here let's add a new text section let's name this section to be two dimensions the first thing to do in here is to define the pca model so let's just name here my pca model this is going to be equal to the pca method that we have just imported so here we just use the pca method and now from this constructor we are going to use the function okay of this object which is the function fit and here we are going to provide the data not the response variable very important here we are providing all of the images with their attributes we are not providing the solution basically where they belong to right so this is the fitting of the principal component analysis we are going to now apply the dimensionality production transformation so here we just can define the x pca this is going to be the two new columns that we are going to add okay and that we are going to have on our data and so essentially now we use my method of the pca my model and here we use the function transform and here we also provide the data so essentially here we are applying the fitting here we are doing the dimensionality reduction and so this returns two columns okay in here these returns two columns which are the two components that we are going to visualize either okay, component one and the component two so in python we start from index zero so we will have component zero component one okay once we have this information which is basically the two columns that we have from these 64 columns we have applied dimensionality reduction and now we have these two now let's define a new data set that we will visualize now let's just create a new data frame in pandas we can just type pandas data frame like this here on this data frame we are going to define the two uh, columns for the components so here we are going to define this like, uh, like a dictionary essentially like a hash like a map where we will provide the keys which are going to be the name of the columns and then the values which are going to be here the content of this column so essentially the first column let's name pca1 for the component one of principal component analysis and then here we provide the value so if here we have the two columns we just need to copy this paste in here and we want to select the first column so we just set this to be zero also we want to select all of the rows of this column so we can just type here two points with a comma keep in mind that when you use two points you're selecting all of the rows okay because this is a matrix right this is not a a two vector this is a matrix that this matrix has here two columns okay and how many rows well the same as we have on the data set okay a thousand seven hundred ninety seven we have this for all of the instances we have applied dimensionality reduction to all of these images that's why we select all of the rows we continue then defining the principal component too so here we just copy this we can paste it then we change this to be the column two and here the index one like this so now are we done well we are not done yet what we need is to have the column of the real solution that each instance okay of this data belong to so essentially we need also a class column keep in mind that on this class column we are not applying dimensionality reduction we only apply dimensionality reduction to the data to the features that we have 
So here we have the response variable as a response column. That for each row of this data frame, it will tell us which is the real digit that this image is representing, right? What is the real number that this image is representing? Okay, with this, we have the data set defined. So now we can visualize this. To visualize this two-dimensional plot, we just first create a new figure with my plot figure. If this we write, then also we can specify the size of this figure. Let's specify 8 in width and also 8 in height. And so to visualize now the separation between the glances, we are going to plot a scatter plot. And to be able to do this, we will need to use here the scatter plot from the Seaborn library. So you need to make sure that we here import the Seaborn library. So we just type import Seaborn as SNS. Seaborn is a Python data visualization that provides a high level interface for plotting. So we are going to import Seaborn to use here the scatter plot. So we can now go below and now we just type here SNS, then the name of the function, which is a scatter plot. And now here, very important, this is going to be a two dimensional plot, two dimensional scatter plot. So here we need to provide first the horizontal axis. Let's just set this to be the principal component one. Then the vertical axis, let's set this to be the principal component two. And then we have here the most important argument on this function which is the argument hue okay this argument here is our separation criteria how all of the data points that are the images will be in different color depending on their value and here the value that we want is the class we want for instance an image that belongs to the class 7 and an image to be that belongs to the class 4 we want them to have different color and we want all of the images that belong to the class 6 for instance to have the same color for them so here the hue is going to be the class. Then we have the argument for the data set. So we just specify as data equal. And then the name of the data set is the same. We just copy paste. And finally, we can also define a palette here. And a common palette that we use is the palette of tab 10. This is a very good palette that maps values to color. So here we just type tab 10. Okay, with this, we are ready to visualize this separation. So now let's run this window. Very well. What can we see here? Well, we can see a plot that we have that each of these images have a color depending on their class. So here we can see that all of these images belong to the class 0. They are handwritten digits that are representing the real number 0. Then we have here this other cluster, this pink cluster. This is for the number 6. All of these images represent the number 6. Then we have the 2, which is in green. Then we have the three, which is in red. So essentially, what we want to say and we want to find out is, do we have separation between the classes? And if so, does the separation is the same for all of the classes? And as we can see here, the most distant and far away class from the others, okay, is this group in here, the group zero, okay, this cluster right so essentially what we say about this cluster is if we take an image for instance this one of the class zero in another one imagine this one that belong to the same class then these two images will have very similar values on these 64 features we know for sure that this is going to happen because we are reducing this 64 dimensional space to only two dimensions and we can see they're really close if they're very close, they will have very similar values for that features. The same for the class 4, uh, or in this case, and the class 6 also, both of them. The class 4, we have here this purple cluster, the class 6, also this purple cluster, right? So then we have here, for instance, the value 5, which is more separated, okay, it's not a compact cluster. This is the most uncompact cluster. And then we have here the class 1, which is also... Uh, very grouped data points cluster okay so here essentially for instance if we consider now this example if we take an image of the class zero which is a very compact cluster imagine this one and an image from the class four which is also a very compact cluster they are distant from another right so they will have different values on these 64 features how different well depending on their distance right for instance if we take an image of the class zero in an image of the class 6, okay, the odds are going to be that they are going to be mo much more similar 
than taking one of the clan zero in another of the clans four okay if we take one of the clan six in another for the clan zero although they are distant okay we have here the clan six which is pink and the clan zero which is blue although they are distant these 64 features will not be so 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 unsimilar they are going to be a bit similar because they are close okay but if you consider the class one okay here or the class three and the class zero depending on the data point depending that on the hand written you pick you are going to have similarity or another that's what this is telling us this is very important to understand how to interpret this visualization images are formed into groups into clusters okay that represent how similar they will have these 64 features because we are reducing these 64 dimensional space to only two dimensions now we are going to do the same thing in three dimensions so now let's add a new text section let's name this section to be 3d so now how can we visualize the separation between the classes but now instead of using only two components principal component one and principal component two we want to use three three components well initially to define the model is the same we just here define the my pca we fit so we just copy and we paste it in here and also before very important to here note we said that we are going to return two columns because we are going to visualize only two but essentially this transform method is going to return more than two columns because we are not specifying how many components we want to use there is an optional here if we just type n components equal to two then this is going to be true we are only going to return two columns but if we don't specify this how many columns is going to return well this is going to compute it like this returns the number of components the number of columns to be the minimum between the number of samples that is 8797 samples that we have in total so the minimum of this and the, with the minimum with the number of features how many features we have 64 so what is going to be the minimum between this value and this value well the minimum is 64 so this is going to return 64 components but we are only visualizing the first two right this is essential and also here if we just type in a code window and we type here the length let's just use here the length of this tuple this is going to be a tuple so we just copy this to visualize how is going to be the length of this we just type the length this is going to return how many rows we have which is 8797 and if we want to gather how many columns we can just here use for instance the length of this row this is going to show us how many columns we have for each row so as we can see the length is 64 so we have 64 components by this computation so this returns 64 columns and so now the same we can say in here on the three-dimensional plot this is going to return 64 columns however we are only going to use the first three so now we define our data we just copy this and now we also add a new column in here okay there's the same but we add also a new column which is the principal component three so we can copy this we can paste it in here and now the index is two right we gather here the third column we're also going to have the separation of the classes so we need to have a response information here the response variable of the class and so now how can we now plot this three-dimensional view well to plot the scatter plot using three dimensions we'll need to import a new library which is the library plotly express so we just go to the import of libraries window and here we just type to import import plotly express so import plotly express as px the plotly library is a python python library and it is an interactive and open source plotting library that supports over 40 unix chart types covering a wide range of geographic scientific and three-dimensional use cases we are importing from the express model which is the initial model of plotly to here use the scatter plot using three dimensions so let's update this notebook we come here below and now let's create a new figure let's this and let's set this figure to be the plotly scatter plot in three dimensions so we just type plotly express scatter underscore 3d now here the first argument is the data okay in our case this data here that we want to visualize 
then we need to specify the three components, the three axes. So the first is PCA1, the horizontal axis, then the vertical axis is going to be PCA2. So we can just copy this and paste it. And finally, we can specify also the Z axis, which is here the PCA3. So we copy, we paste. Now, very important, the same way that we had before the separation of the glasses to be the hue, now to set the visualization that different glasses to have different colors, we just, instead of hue, the name of this is now color. But it is the same idea, it is our separation criteria for the color. Very well, with this we are done. The last thing, we just need to display this figure. If we just type this, we create the figure, but we don't display it. So, to display, we just type fix show, like this. Now let's run this window. Okay, so here we can see this visualization on the separation between the classes, right? We can see that they are also formed in groups into clusters in here. And also very important to know that we have here on the right a color bar, as we can see. Okay, that basically we can map colors from 0, 1, 2, 3. So depending on a given color, we will have a given class. Right? For instance, the yellow is for the 9 and the blue is for the 0. So now here we can see, for instance, that here we have a cluster of the class 4, okay? This means if we have this compact cluster, if we take an image, an image, from this class and another one from the same class, they will have very similar values on the 64 features on the dataset. The same happens with this class 2, with this class 7, right? And so on, okay? The class 9, we can see that has some overlap. For instance, if we take now an image of the class 7 and an image of the class 2, since they are very distant to another, okay, it means that if we take an image, a handwritten digit that represents the number 2, and another image, a handwritten Im uh, image and digit that represent the class 7, they will have very different values on the 64 features. They will not share any similarity. And this is the interpretation that you need to understand. Okay, very important to know how to interpret these visualizations using two dimensions and also three dimensions. The distance between the data points represent how different these 64 features are, since we are now reducing the 64 to only three columns, to only three components, right? So we have these 64 dimensions to only three dimensions. Okay, and this information of the distance provides us how close or how similar the values of these 64 features are. Very well, with this we end this lesson on the principal component analysis. We remind the student that you can check and visualize all of this notebook and also download it on the downloadable documents of this lesson. Hey everyone! On this lesson, we will apply the Fisher Discriminant Analysis Dimensionality Reduction Technique to visualize the separation between the digits depending on their class, which is the number that this digit represents. So, on the previous lesson, we introduced this data set, right? It is a data set with 1,797 images of handwritten digits and the objective of this practice is to separate this number of images into 10 classes depending on the digit that this image represents. So basically we have here a total of 10 classes from 0 to 9, right? We will do this on this lesson with the Fisher Discriminant Analysis Dimensionality Reduction Technique. So we will reduce this high dimensionality that we have, keep in mind that we saw that we had a total of 64 features, so we have a very high dimensional space, and we will reduce this high dimensionality to a lower dimensional space that we can visualize. So we'll do this with the feature discriminant analysis. So here, first of all, let's change the name of this notebook to feature discriminant analysis. You know, here, let's add a text window just in here for this new section so let's add here title 2 so let's add a header of two hashtags and let's just write here the feature discriminant analysis right so we will do this and we will apply this dimensionality reduction technique 
uh, for two dimensions and three dimensions so we will reduce these 64 features to only two components only two features and also with only three components with only three features okay so essentially remember the, the dimensionality reduction technique we take all of these columns and we reduce this dimensional space to a lower dimensional space for instance two retaining all the information right so the objective here is to retain all the information that the 64 columns have so when we have two columns only or basically only three columns and we have reduced this dimensional space we are able to visualize right and visualize this separation so let's start with two dimensions so let's add a text window here for uh, two dimensions you know here the first thing that we need to do is to import the library of the scikit-learn to apply feature discriminant analysis so here we just type from the library scikit-learn and we are going to access the discriminant analysis model we will import the feature discriminant analysis that is in python called the linear discriminant analysis okay this linear discriminant analysis is the same as the feature discriminant analysis in fact they are equivalent in python this is the name of it so we run this very well so here let's start doing this let's first define the model we can just type the model to be the linear discriminant analysis method that we just imported and here we need to specify the number of components so since this is going to be a two dimensional space we want to have two components so here we just type number of components equal to two and so now let's apply this model that we just built okay to our data so to our set of images right so let's do here the fitting now uh, remember that this set of data of images is the x and the y has the response variable okay this represents the response variable which is the answer okay basically which is the real digit or the real number that this given digit or this given image is representing so now to fit this model to our data set we just here type for instance x lda and here we just type the model the name of the model is lda and we are going to apply here the fit transform method where the first element the first argument is the data so the set of images with the features is the the variable x and then we need to specify the the response variable so what is the response variable well here the response variable has the name of y as well okay so keep in mind this y is the argument name okay the argument name and this second y is the value of this argument the value of this argument is this y in here if the name of this y was y data imagine then here you need to specify at the right y data okay we work with the same name so we just here change for y and also this uh, variable y data we again have y here so with this we are fitting this model so now we can define our data set that we are interested in to visualize this separation and now to have here this data set we need to import the pandas library to work with data frames so we'll go now to the import of libraries and here we are going to import the pandas library as pd now this library here pandas is a software library written for the python programming language for data manipulation and analysis once we have this written we need to also uh, run again this window now the notebook is up to date and here we just need to do the do and write the method of the pandas library this method is called data frame with this we are building a new data frame so this data frame will have a total of three columns the first two columns are going to be the components basically this variable remember that this method returns two columns two components and the third one is going to be the response variable basically the column y that we have this y in here so let's specify this data frame as an input on a dictionary so here first of all we will have the first component the first uh, column which is going to be the first component of the feature discriminant analysis let's just call it fda1 and we are going to select all the rows of the column zero of this data so here we just select 
all of the rows. Remember in Python, when you write uh, two points, this represents all of them. So all of the rows of the column zero. Next, here, the second column that we are going to add onto this data frame in Pandas is the column Fisher Discriminant Analysis Component 2. And we are going to select all the rows of the column one. And finally, this last one uh, is going to be the response variable. Let's name this final column to be the class. This is going to be the response uh, variable Y. With this, we define the data. And also here, the name of this method in pandas is not data frame with a lowercase on F, but instead a uppercase in the F, right? So with this, we're ready to start plotting this visualization and this separation between the classes using two dimensions. So to do this, we will need to import two things, uh, one for the general plotting and the other for the skater plot. So here, first of all, we will need to import from the matplotlib library the pyplot method or basically the pyplot model so here we are going to import from the matplotlib library the model pyplot as plt so this uh, library here matplotlib is a comprehensive plotting library for the python programming language and this model here pyplot is a state-based interface to matplotlib we will also need to import here the seaborn library so we just type import seaborn as sns is a python data visualization library based on matplotlib and it provides a high level interface for drawing informative statistical graphics so let's run again this cell now the notebook is up to date and here we are now ready to plot First of all, let's create a new figure with the pyplot figure method. So here the method is pyplot figure. And we can also specify the size of this figure. Let's, uh, for instance, choose a size of width 8 and also height. And now we are going to represent the skater plot with the library of Seaborn. So here we just type skater plot. Skater plots are used to plot data points in the attempt to show the relationship between variables if we have two axes we have a two-dimensional plot so we show the relationship between two columns between two components if we have three axes we have three components and we show this relationship between these three columns these three components so initially we are using two components so here we need to specify the x-axis so here the x-axis is going to be first column Fisher discriminant analysis component one, right? So here we just type FDA one. The Y is going to be the uh, component two. So here the second column. Now then, in a very important argument now, the hue. What is the separation criteria? Well, we want to separate those points, those data points, depending on their class, right? So here the separation criteria is going to be their class which is precisely the values of the response variable, right? The digit that they are representing, the real number that they represent. Finally, we specify the data. So here the, the data name is this one. So it is also data. So we just copy this and we paste. And here at the end, we can also specify the palette. That is the method for choosing the colors to use in each different class each different digit and number so here we will choose a palette which is the tab 10 okay it provides sufficient saturated colors easy to visualize all right with this we are ready to now plot this separation and this visualization of the separation between the classes on this two-dimensional space so let's run this very well as we can see we can now easily see the separation between the classes how many classes we have well we have a total of 10 classes right for each different digit that we see here so in essence we have reduced our dimensional space from 64 uh, dimensions with only two dimensions now retaining the most of the information so we can see here that we if we take a value for instance from this class in here four and we take another of this class here three okay they will have different values of these features in here 
their values of these 64 attributes will be different because as we can see they are very distant to each other the same happens with the number zero and the number four or the number zero and the number six and so on we can also see that some digits some numbers do share similarity okay some similarity of these 64 features if we take for instance a image that is representing here the class 2 the digit 2 okay and we analyze uh, the values of the features of the 64 attributes and we take another of the class 3 this red point here okay they will most likely share and have some similarity on these 64 features this is because they are close to each other right with this we can see this using two dimensions right this dimensionality reduction let's now use three components and so now plot a, a three-dimensional plot so here let's set the text window with the name of three dimensions so now let's start by defining our model now the model we define it in the same way as before but now we are going to use three components right we'll have here a three-dimensional plot we will now reduce all these 64 features that we see here to only three components to only three columns we will now apply the fitting so here to apply the fitting we do it in the same way as before however now this variable here will have uh, the information of three columns here we will see three columns okay instead of only two this is because before we were using two components and now we are using three components therefore when defining the data we write here pandas data frame we will specify now the name of three columns. So here, initially, we'll define this as a dictionary. Initially, the first component is feature discriminant analysis component one. The value of this column is going to be precisely here. This uh, value of all the rows in the column zero. Then we will specify the second column that will have the values of all the rows for the column one of here, this XLDA model. The same we do it on the last one, which is the component three. We'll take the values of all the rows for the column two from this returning value of this fitting in here. Finally, we specify the class column as before. Okay, so here the class is going to be the response variable Y. In fact, something we did not do before okay we can do it now we can for instance uh, show here the first elements of this data here if we just type data head we can see the first five elements of this pandas data frame so if we run we can see here this is the first column for uh, the fisher discriminant analysis component one this is the second the fisher discriminant analysis component two and this is the class okay which is the real digit the real value that this image is representing we can also see since we have lots of instances we have a thousand seven hundred and ninety seven let's see for instance the first hundred instances and samples of this data and we can see here the first five as we can see represent these digits then the uh, number 95 represent the digit six the 96 the digit eight and as we can see in the middle we have something like these three dots if you don't want this to show and you want to see all of them you can establish a option in the pandas so here we just type the pandas library then we use the set option method and here the option that we are going to choose is to display max rows and we are going to set this to be for instance 500 okay so now when we run this again we see all of the hundred uh, first elements that we are visualizing in here right the uh, zero is representing the class of the digit zero and so on then the 10 as we can see it is a cycle process okay this is a cycle and also it is a sequential ordering of the images right we keep representing the classes zero one to nine again zero one to nine oh here we find that this is different okay for instance the 30 is 0, but the 31 is representing the digit 9. So it appears that it is not sick at the end and nothing really cycle at the end. Okay, so we begin having a cycle behavior, but at the end, this data set is not cycle. We can have here 
the identifier any one and we can have any ordering of the uh, digits again remember this class here is nothing more than the response variable y okay remember this is the y this is representing the real digit that this image represent okay with the 64 features the same here okay this image at 12 okay we have this image this is the identifier and this class 2 is representing that basically it is telling us that this image with identifier 12 is representing this digit if we take this image with identifier 62 this class 3 basically is saying that this image 62 is representing this digit with the 64 features but here we reduced to only two features so we can visualize it right so for now let's clear this output and here uh, when we define this data set now this new data set let's run this and now let's do the same thing let's just type data head for instance the first 50 ones we type and we press enter and as we can see what happens well now the data set has three columns this is because we have three components we are reducing the 64 features of this image the total of 64 features to only three columns to only three features okay and the idea is the same we take this image uh 35 okay and this class 5 basically is saying that this image with the 64 features is representing the number five and here we only have three columns that represent the number five this is because we are applying a dimensionality reduction we are reducing from 64 dimensions to have only three dimensions now very well now to plot this visualization of the separation of the classes using three dimensions we will use here a new library so we'll need to import a new library and this is the plotly express library so here we just type import plotly express as px plotly is a very complete library in python supporting lots of chart types covering a wide range of statistical financial geographic scientific and three-dimensional use cases we are going to import the expert model the plotly express is an easy to use high level interface to plotly which operates on a variety of types of data and produces easy to style figures we are going to import it to represent this three-dimensional scatter plot so let's run this and we update the notebook now the notebook is up to date we come here below and now let's create a new figure using the plotly express right so here the figure we use the px which is the plotly express and we just type here scatter 3d this will create a three-dimensional scatter plot so here the order of the arguments change in respect to the scatter plot in the seaborn library first here we specify the data set so here we just type data okay this is the data set that we will work with this one then we specify the x-axis so here the x-axis is the first component of the Fisher discriminant analysis so we just type Fisher discriminant analysis component one the y is going to be the Fisher discriminant analysis component two right and then finally the axis z is going to have here the third component of the Fisher discriminant analysis and now here the final argument of this method is the color so how can we specify the color well the color is going to depend on their class that they belong to so here the separation criteria is the class so we want different data points that belong to different classes to have different colors and those that belong to the same class to have the same color so here the color is the class fair enough now to share and to show this figure we just type here pick show with this we are going to show the figure that we just initialized so let's run this window now all right so now we see here this visualization of the separation between the classes basically we can here visualize the separation of the images depending on the class that they belong to right we have here a total of 10 classes that represents these 10 different digits that represent numbers and we can also see here on the right the different colors of these different classes 
So we have here a discrete classification. Here, this blue, this very intense blue, is the value 0, the class 0. Then this here, intense purple, D class 1, and so on. Finally, the yellow data points uh, are for D class 9, right? All these images of the GDIG that represent the class 9. So in fact, in the Plotly Express, apart from visualizing, you can also see here that if you move the marker to a given data point in the scatter plot you can see the class that it belongs to so this yellow uh, correspond to the class 9 these values in here correspond to the class 6 as we can see right this very intense yellow is the class 7 here on the bottom and this in middle yellow is for the class 8 now why is this visualization important well, this visualization is very, very important because we can see that here, depending on the information of these 64 features, we will have one class or another. Okay, this basically means that if we take an image that belongs to the class 7 and an image that belongs to the class 2, they will have different values of these 64 attributes, of these 64 features. That is why it's important to see this visualization and to visualize this separation of the digit images depending on their class. Okay, and we do this now reducing this 64 dimensional space to only three dimensions. So we can visualize it, right? With three dimensions, we can visualize. And as we can see, these 64 features classify the cluster or the group or the class that the given digit image will belong to right this here this digit images is for the class 7 okay these will they will have similar values all of them will have similar values of the 64 features then if we here move on the top we see the class 1 okay this is another group another cluster so since this is another class if we take a data point a digit image in here of this class one and another one that belongs to the same class they also will share similarity of these 64 features but if we take a digit image a data point here that belongs to the class seven in another of the class four these 64 attributes will be different depending on this image and on this image since they belong to different classes and also the distance is important there will be classes that will be a bit similar this means that the 64 features will be a bit similar okay two classes that are very close together okay for instance the class here eight and the class one okay they're close uh, a bit close but if you take lot distance classes that are very very in a very high distance then they will not share any similarity at all but here the most important conclusion is that if we take images basically digit images of the same class they will have similar values of these 64 features and we are visualizing this now with three dimensions with this we finish this lesson we remind the student that you can download all of this code and all of this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson I hope you have enjoyed the lessons and with this practice now you are already prepared to apply the Fisher discriminant analysis dimensionality reduction technique on Python and understand its visualizations. Hey everyone, on this lesson we are going to apply the isomap technique to visualize the separation between the digits depending on their class which is the real number that this handwritten digit represents so on this data set of handwritten digits we have a total number of 1797 images and each of these images each of these handwritten images okay we have 64 attributes 64 dimensions right for each image for each instance this is a very high dimensionality we are going to reduce this high dimensionality into two dimensions and also three dimensions using the isomap technique and this will be very useful since this will allow us to visualize the separation between the digits also remember that on the x variable we have the data and on the y variable we have the response variable right the real class the real 
number that this handwritten digit is representing. We already studied these notions previously on this section. So now let's start with the isomap. We create here a new section for the isomap technique. And very important, if you don't remember completely what the x variable represents and also what the y variable represents, we highly recommend the student to watch again the introduction to the image data set lesson. Okay, there we studied all of this data set and we explained in detail the meanings of all of these images, right? Essentially, each image is a handwritten digit and the y variable is the real number that this image is representing. Okay, however, there in that lesson, we provide much and many more details. So we are going to use the isomap technique in through two dimensions and also three dimensions. We also studied the isomap technique on previous sections. This is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction method based on the spectral theory, which tries to preserve the geodesic distances in the lower dimension, right? So in this lower dimensional space, we're going to preserve these distances. Initially, we create a neighborhood network, okay, this neighborhood graph, and after that, we use this graph distance to the approximate geodesic distance between all of the pair of points, in our case, all of the pair of instances of images. Each point, okay, each point is an instance of this data set, so each point is this handwritten image. How many points we have? Well, we have the number of points as the total instances, which is this one, right, 1797. So, as we have just discussed, we are going to work with two dimensions and three dimensions. So, here let's start with two dimensions. We create a new text section. Let's name this to be 2D. And now, to use the isomap technique, we'll need to import here the, the method of the isomap. This is a method that we can import from the scikit-learn library, precisely the money fold model. And here we just import isomap, right? With this, we are going to be able to build a new isomap model. So now we run again this window. Once the notebook is up to date, we come here below. Now we are ready here to start defining our isomap model. So first of all, let's define our isomap model. Let's just name this variable to be the isomap. Okay. This isomap is going to be equal to the method that we have just imported. So with this constructor, we can create a new isomap model. The first argument is the number of components that we want to have here. Now, since we are going to use two dimensions, since we are going to reduce, on this case, 64 dimensions, right, the 64 columns, to only two columns, to only two dimensions, here the number of components is equal to two. So this first argument, number of components, is equal to two. Then, since this isomap technique starts by creating a neighborhood network, here we can specify the number of neighbors for each instance, for each point, in our case, for each handwritten digit, right? For each instance of our data set. So here let's use, for instance, the number of neighbors to be 10. Okay, this is a sufficient number of neighbors to do our computation. Now, after defining this model, okay, we need to now compute these two components, these two new columns that we will have on our knowledge after this computation, after this isomap technique. So now if we take this variable, this model, and we apply a fit transform, and here we give this data, okay, or data, which is the variable x, this is going to return two columns. These two columns are going to be here, the two columns that we are going to use to our dimensional visualization. So it is going to be the two axes of our visualization, right? So let's make this fit transform here to return these columns, let's just name these columns to be the x iso for isomap. So we will have the first component, right, the component one, and then the second, the component two. Okay, so we will have two dimensions. Now, once we have these two columns, these two attributes, okay, that we are going to use to visualize, then we can define our new data. The data that we are going to plot here to visualize the separation between the handwritten digits. What do we need on this data? Well, we need the two components, the two columns, and we also need the real value that each instance belongs to, right? The real class, the real number that each instance is representing. So here, let's create a new data frame. We can create it with the pandas data frame method. We are going to define the columns as a dictionary. The first name of this column is going to be ISO1. This is going to be the, the first column of this data, okay? 
of this new data frame. Now, what is going to be the value? Well, the value is this variable, and we want to access the column zero, which is the first one, and all of the rows, so like this. Uh, okay. In fact, if we comment this for a moment, and we just run what we have now, you can verify that in here, in a new code window, if we just type x isomap and we use the shape, okay, this is going to return that we have the same number of instances on our data set, 1797, but now we only have two columns, the two columns that we will use for this visualization. So that's why this is visualization in dimensionality reduction technique. The reason isomap is a dimensionality reduction technique is because from these 64 columns that we had, okay, these 64 dimensions, we are reducing now to only two dimensions, okay? So here we access the first element uh, we, of, for this column for index 0. Keep in mind that in Python, the, the indices start from 0. So we select all of the rows, all of these rows, and only the column with index 0, okay? Then the second column is going to be the isomap component 2. And the same thing, the value is going to be this variable. We select all of the rows, but now the index 1. Now, finally, we also need to have here a column to specify the real class that each instance belongs to. So let's create a new column. Let's name this column to be class. And the value of this class is going to be precisely the target variable. Remember that the tar target variable, the real class that each instance belongs to, is this variable y in here. Okay, so we can just define here the class to be y, like this. And also very important, as we can see, Python is not recognizing this construction of pandas because pandas is not a predefined uh, library we need to import. So here it is very simple. We just type import pandas as pd, like this. We run this window again. Once we have updated this notebook, we come here and now there is no any warning since this uh, library was already imported, right? So as we can see now, we can close this dictionary. We can also close the pandas data frame construction. And also we remove this closing curly bracket. We put it in here, right? This is the last column that we add. And with this, we create this data frame. Very well, with this, we have the data frame already constructed. Now we can visualize this. To visualize, first of all, let's create a new figure. We can create a new figure with the pyplot figure method. Let's specify our figure size here to be also 18 width and 18 height. And now we are going to plot a scatter plot to visualize this separation between all of the instances. This scatter plot will help us and will allow us to visualize the separation between the instances. Since each instance is going to be placed depending on the value of the component 1 and component 2. So here to define this scatter plot and to display it, we need to import the Seaborn library. We just type here import Seaborn as S and S. Seaborn is a Python data visualization library based on matplotlib. Now we run this import of libraries window. Okay, now we come here below and now we can display the scatter plot. To do the scatter plot, we just type here Seaborn. Okay, so we type SNS and then we use here the method scatter plot. The first argument of this scatter plot is the first component, the x axis. So here let's define the x axis to be this first component, the isomap component one. Then we define the y-axis, the vertical axis. Let's define this vertical axis to be the isomap component 2. So we copy this, we paste it in here. And finally, there's a very, very important argument here that we always discuss in the lessons. That is the hue argument. This hue argument will allow us to separate the instances and also separate the colors of each value, each of these images, depending on the real class that they belong to. So what is our separation criteria? Well, our separation criteria is the class, right? Because we want to visualize the digits depending on the class that they belong to. So that a image that belongs to a given class, okay, will have a color. And if we take another image that belongs to a different class, it will have a different color. And if we take two images that belong to the same class, both of them will have the same color. Very important is here argument on our visualization. Now there is an argument here on the scatterplot that is the data frame that we are going to use. We just type here data and then we equal to the name of our data frame. The name of our data frame is also data, but if our data frame was this one, data 13, we also here will need to use data 13. Okay, for now we just have the same name. And finally, 
there's an optional argument that we can also find the palette of this scatter plot. The palette is basically how we are going to map the values of each class to colors, okay? So that we can have different colors on the mapping. A common mapping on the scatter plots are the top 10 of Seaborg. This will map values of the classes for very attractive colors, so we will have a better visualization. Very well, and with this we are done. We can now run this code window and visualize the separation between these instances. So let's run. Fantastic. Here we can see, okay, the separation between all of the instances. Here we can visualize the separation between all of these digits, okay? For instance, here we have this cluster, this group that belongs to the class 4. This is all of the images, okay, that will represent and they are truly representing the value 4, okay? They are the handwritten digits by humans that represent the value 4. So as we can see, 4, okay, is a cluster that is very, very grouped and very distant from other classes, okay? What does this mean? Well, the distance between a class and another basically represents the similarity of the two components and also the similarity of the 64 components, the 64 columns, because we are doing this dimensionality reduction to conclude just this. For instance, let's just take an example so you can understand very easily. If we take a handwritten image, for instance, this image in here, this data point in here that belongs to the class 4, okay? If we take this digit and we take this other digit that belongs to the class 3, as we can see, their distance is very, 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 very distant, okay? They're very far away. So what does this mean? Well, if they are very far away, it means that they will have very different values on these 64 attributes. These 64 attributes are going to be very, very different. However, if we take an image, a handwritten image that belongs to the class 4, for instance, this one, in another that also belongs to the class 4, since they are very close together, they will have very similar values on these 64 features. And this idea is true for all of the rest of the classes, okay? You can apply the same thing for each data point that we can see in here. So essentially, the distance between the points represent how distant and how different the 64 columns, the 64 attributes are. Very well, now let's do the same thing in three dimensions, okay? So here we can add a new text section. Uh, let's name this section to be 3D now. And now let's visualize this separation using three components, right? Using th now three dimensions. So initially, we just defined the isomer model as before. However, now the number of components is not two, okay, is three. So now the number of components is three on this isomap constructor. The number of neighbors, we can use the same. Okay, we can use here 10 neighbors. And then here we define this x isomap components which are going to be the columns and as before this returned two columns so this okay let's comment this returns two columns now this is going to return okay how many columns well three because we have three components so now when we apply isomap with transform this is going to return three components right we can verify this if we just run this code window with the feed transform with the x data we run and now in a new code window for instance we just check the shape of this object we can see that now we have three columns we have the same number of instances as before however we have three columns this is because we are now reducing okay this total number of attributes 64 okay to only three components to only three attributes so now it is also dimensionality reduction technique in three dimensions three dimensions is now our dimensional space very well after defining these three columns we can also define the data okay the new data frame it is the same idea we can copy this however now we are going to have a new column on this data frame that is going to be the third component right so here we can add a new column isomap3 and now the value is going to be the isomap components we're going to select all of the rows but now the index 2 in this way we are going to select the third component right now if we want to visualize a scatter plot in three dimensions okay instead of using seaborn we need to use the plotly express library so in here we just import plotly express as px 
Dolly, Python library is an interactive open source plotting library that supports over 40 unique chart types, covering a wide range of statistical, geographic, scientific, and three dimensional use cases. Dolly Express provides functions to visualize a variety of types of data. We are going to import this model to use a scatter plot and visualize a scatter plot in three dimensions. So let's run this window. Once the notebook is up to date, we come here below and now. Let's create a new figure with Plotly Express. To do this, we just type px for Plotly Express and then we type here the function scatter underscore 3D. This function will plot a scatter plot in three dimensions. The first argument is the data frame that we will use, in our case, data. The second argument is the horizontal axis, so the first component. Then we specify the y axis, this is the ISO2 component. And finally, this third axis, the z-axis, this is the isomap column 3, right, the third component. And finally, very, very important as well. In the same way, we had before a separation criteria for two dimensions, which was the hue, that different classes have different colors. We also have here separation criteria. Here, the name of this argument is just color, okay? So here, the color is going to be the class, so that the same class points or the same class instances will have the same color, different class instances will have different colors. Finally, to show this figure, we just type here the figure object and we use the function show, like this. With this, we are ready to plot this. So now let's run this visualization. And now, as we can see here below, here we can visualize the separation between all of these images, all of these handwritten images. We also have on the right a color bar that basically indicates Right, the color here is 0 to 9, so basically we have the class 0 is this color blue, the class 9 this color yellow. Also, if you put the, this mouse pointer into a given data point, you also can check the class. So this is the class 0, class 6, class 4, right? And now as we can see, okay, we have here this separation between the classes using three dimensions. And the interpretation of this is the same as we did on the two-dimensional plot. The idea is that the distances between the data points, the distance between the instances, represent the similarity of these 64 attributes. So here, if two data points are very, very distant, okay, if we take, for instance, this image, this handwritten digit that belongs to the class 0, it represents the number 0, and then we take this other data point, this other instance, okay, this other handwritten image, that represents the class 4, so it is representing the number 4. As we can see, their distance is very, very far. So they will have very different values, okay, on these 64 features, on these 64 attributes. Now, for instance, if we take here two elements that belong to this class 7, as we can see, we can here take two data points that are very close together, for instance, this handwritten digit and this handwritten digit, okay, these two data points, these two instances, since they are very close together, this is telling us that they will have very similar values on these 64 attributes. The values of their features are going to be very, very similar. So as we conclude the interpretation of this three, and on this three-dimensional visualization is the same as we have here two dimensions, right? The distance between the points represents how similar they are. If they are very far away, they will going to be very, very different. They, they will be not similar, right? They will have very different values on their 64 features. But if we take two points, okay, that are, that are very close together, they can be from different classes or not, depending, okay? For instance, if we take this point, okay, class 5 and this other point, class 6, since they are very close together, this also is saying us that they will have very similar values on the 64 features. So if we take two instances that are very, very close together, it means that they will have very similar value on these 64 attributes, right? Their values for these features are going to be very similar. Very well, with this we end this lesson on the isomap technique to reduce the dimensionality of this data set and also visualize the separation between the digits depending on the class that they belong to. We remind the student that you can download all of this code, okay, and all of this notebook on the downloadable documents of this lesson.